<laughs> I'll the take journey a is right. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take a little uh, short rest and I'm coming back to you. Uh, Karen, you are now hosting the event. Thank oh you. my gosh, we're live. Atanas, thank you. And, you know, I, 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 I was dreaming about AI all night. I don't know why. <laughs> oh. I kept hearing the presentations because I had it on. So <laughs> I'm and hoping you, that it's smarter now. <laughs> you have really, really nice uh, T-shirt and really nice uh, studio. So take a, uh, have a fun, yeah? Yes, thank you very much. We're here. Uh, I'm here with Orson Weems, and we're at the beautiful podcastvideos.com studio in Rogers, Arkansas. And thank you to the folks who set us up with this lovely, lovely place to uh, to be. That's right. Wonderful. Good to see you all, AI, on Pi Day. Yes. And we have some exciting, exciting presentations that are continuing today. Uh, and our very first one, I believe, is Data Contracts Are Good for AI by Jean-Georges. Is that correct? It is. It is. It's it all is. right. <laughs> that, that's, 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 guys, that's the best introduction. I'm kind of jealous when I'm seeing the, the, the environment you're in. Okay, so. <laughs> well, come on over. But, but, but I also have a nice T-shirt. See? Oh, I've got a nice T-shirt. Okay. So, All right. Well, yeah. let's, let's, let's get well, started. I think next Pi Day, I think you need to come here, Jean Georges. Hey, why not? Why why not? Okay. I need a good excuse to come to Arkansas. I've never been, okay? I've only heard the bad rumors. So <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll show you a great time. <laughs> okay. So let's 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 try to be a little less um, um, fun and a little bit more serious and talk about uh, data contracts. And I'm going to do that uh, as quickly as possible. So for people who don't know me, um, my name is uh, Jean-Georges Perrin. I often go by JGP. I am absolutely not blaming my parents for the name they gave me, which is absolutely untranslatable or unpronounceable outside of France. Um, as my day activity, I'm the chief uh, innovation officer for a company called ABA Data. Um, I'm also a lifetime IBM champion. I'm a PayPal champion. And recently, I've been awarded to be a data mesh learning MVP. So uh, I write a lot of books. Uh, this is my latest uh, little book there. Oops, a little I that um, it's about data contracts. But there's a lot of uh, a lot of other books I'm, I'm writing. So let's let's enough ads enough about me let's let's dive in so you all heard about data pipelines right the thing is data pipelines are everywhere um i worked in a company where they had almost like ninety thousand data pipelines i um i'm working with another company where they have something like thirty five thousand data pipelines they are everywhere there are it's they are nasty okay the thing is they are they are just everywhere but basically the idea of a data pipeline is you take data from a producer you apply some transformation you eventually do a little qa and then you go to the document you would do some documentation to go to the to the consumer right so what happens is is real life and i have i have a i have i have a 21 year old uh son who, who graduated from his master recently and um he called me the other day and said, hey, uh, dad, my, my customers are, are not very happy about the work I did. They, they needed some data and the data uh, which usually flows, well, this time did not flow. Okay, so um, so they, they couldn't do their work and they were upset about me. And because the root cause was that the upstream system was not available. And that's where I told him, well, if you had data contracts in place, then you could have saved this point, okay? And and tell directly your consumers that, well, it's not your fault. So that's that's a little thing that, that we happen to, uh, to discuss and have fun with it. And it's actually almost a real story. So what, what is a data contract? Um, so for me, a data contract is really a link. It is a link between data producer and I think I need to change this slide there a little bit. It's really about one data producer to one to many data consumers. And it creates this link not only 
as an agreement between the two pe- the, the two the two um the two group of people there but also between um your data modeling and uh your logical types and your physical types and uh and it's also about describing the meta metadata so it's not a typo here it's really when you look at what it's really about describing the behavior of the metadata the behavior of your data itself okay so it's not about just metadata which is column names and and table names and so on it's also about data quality service levels and and what and and, and what not so okay good but what problem does it solve right if are you creating a problem to create a solution uh i think data contracts are really trying to solve um are, are, are really going to try to solve a lot of uh, a, a lot of issues we have with data so one one for example is to make sure that your documentation is pertinent and relevant and stays that way okay so that's that's something which is really important is about making sure that your, your documentation is actually something that um evolves over time and that's uh working well the um, another another an, an, another i would say favorite topic of mine is it enables product thinking and specifically data product thinking because in a lot of times when you're thinking about those pipelines i just described it's a project okay you do you're building your pipeline is a project managed by a central data team and then you de- it, it's delivered and if it's if it's failing it's going to be just a mess but you've got to wait for the central data team to be able to extend it and so bec- becoming a new project if you're thinking as a as a product in a product thinking you're thinking about a first version and its following iteration and data contracts can really help you with with, with that part um i i like this quote from my friend of mine okay so and it kind of relates to all my friends in the us and myself as well is we it's tax return season here uh and really the idea is um nobody nobody likes to lose them okay well the only thing in the us you usually get some money back but the thing is nobody besides that is it's a painful time but so besides this painful time when you do and when you do that you've got the reward at the end your cash uh but here when you compare that to data contracts basically the the outcome is to do to have this really this foundation of a uh, data ownership culture and 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 a, and a sustainable one so i uh, i think that what martin was saying is pretty pertinent but the thing is also you find many different kinds of data contracts um i've seen people doing data contracts on paper I've seen people using Word. I've seen digital signatures. I've seen um, freeform Excel, uh, kind of formatted Excel. Basically, data contracts are whatever. You know, it's almost making thing me make making me think of uh, you go to this shack and you have this uh, or this barbecue joint and you've got this table, this this paper cloth, and you just start writing something, and that's your data contract. Okay, we need to go past this imagery, and that's why um, I went to the Linux um, Foundation and specifically the Linux Foundation AI on Data, and we created a project called Beetle. And Beetle uh, first piece of delivery, first uh, first artifact is ODCS. So it's the open data contract standard and this is um this this is now making sure that we have an open standard for defining data contract so why of course to avoid this profusion of format but also once you've agreed on a standard you can start um it it, it multiplies okay so it, it boosts innovation it simplifies integration between the different the different element of your architecture so there's a lot of there's a lot of, of benefits there the next question you could ask me is well the thing is yeah i i hear you well but this is also something like a, oh you you just put it as from the top of your head or whatever 
Well, the thing is, pull it from the, from my ad, but the thing is really here, what happens is that there's a lot of companies that are actually using it. And, be, and it be, beyond those companies, there's also categories of, uh, of companies. For example, we, well, you've heard about uh, Martin from Lidl, okay? So Lidl is a major European uh, supermarket chain. Um, you have a major peer-to-peer -peer payment leader. Uh, if you look at my LinkedIn, you probably guess where who this is. In the US, there's also a major cable company, um, major other major retailers, and okay, I need to change that. But Wayfair, I've never asked them if they if 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 I could use them, but as a name, but they're 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 there. Um, and but that's kind of the users, okay? So, uh, but there's not only big companies; it's also smaller companies you've never heard of. And there's also on, on the counterpart, there's um, there are uh, startups and established software companies that are building basically software vendors that are building tools and solutions around data contracts. One being the company I'm the CIO of, and in the middle you have a uh, service providers. Okay, so so you start to have this full ecosystem around this very open standard okay when you look at how it's governed as well it's um under the linux foundation we have a technical steering committee i, I am the chair of the steering committee but i have people from um, all over the world that are that have joined you've heard from peter today peter fluke You've you've heard from uh, Andrew Jones also, who are part of the TSC. Uh, Bart, which we just listened to, um, was part of the, com the committee, but it was too technical. So now Dieter, uh, his CTO, is part of the committee. Okay, so so you see that we have all this variety of users, and that's just for a, a few of them that I'm that I'm mentioning. Um, but it's so the governance is open. We even share our recordings um, online. So let's go back a little bit on history. Um, I'm 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 not a big history, you know, buff or fan or whatever. But I think that we we need to understand where it comes from and why it's not just you know just not a fad and it's going to be uh, to be pretty powerful as it goes through. I think the origin of the data contracts come at least to the '90s with case tools. So. Um, I'm not seeing anyone on camera here, but I know that some of you are not that young. And, and because of that, you know that in the 90s, there was this magic about case tools that would be able to generate applications. But what, what, what were they using as their source? It was really case tool, database and the schemas. Um, in, the 20, in the 2000s, there was all this static and dynamic framework um, that, that, that were involved on my first startup actually was involved there. And and in 2010s, um, I think we reached a little bit of the dark ages of, of data in some way, where we really try to gather as much, you know, as much data as we could. And, but we lost the idea of what it's for. So now we're in the 2020s and really data products for me are um, an, important, an, an important opportunity and an important way up for uh, using our data. And basically, data products uses data contract. And we needed a standard. And I just wanted to share with you that our standard, and I updated this slide this morning because it keeps growing. Um, we've got a number of stars. Okay, I hear billigans, that is, you know, it's not only about stars, uh, but it's also about the number of contributors. So you can see that when we started the, 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 the data contract at PayPal, we we still have as a PayPal still has a lot of it's same standard. It's just the evolution of it. Lots of stars, but only five contributors. So since we are ODCS since November, we uh, lost a little bit of uh, we we don't have a lot. Well, it's additional okay, it's additional stars, but we also have a lot more contributors. Okay, so you see that it's widening the base, it's solidifying the base, and it's not just about the, the number of stars. So let's put it to work, right? And and what um, 
let's remember eight. Okay. Uh, so first, before before uh, looking at what's inside the data contract, let's look at where it stands in, in, in it's in enterprise ecosystem. So the data contract is in the middle layer, you can see here. On the top part, you've got all our con uh, contributors, okay? So people you're familiar to deal with, the data engineers, data scientists, um, data product owner, and or just, you know, just owners if you don't have a data product owner, and automation tools. Um, it's great to be able to leverage automation tools that is going to create and validate and make sure that your data contract is uh, exploited correctly and built correctly. On the consuming side, you've got two families. You've got all this in purple down there and on the left, um, all this uh, enterprise level tools and tooling that are um, that are um, really bringing this to the enterprise level. And on the right side, on the green side here, you've got all these applications uh, like monitoring, observability, that are more targeted towards a direct exploitation of that. So what do you think uh, there is in the data contract? Well, basically there is these eight sections, right? This eight was not picked randomly. First, you've got what I would say is demographics. So it's really like name, domain, version numbers, et cetera. Then you've got the data set on schemas. Okay, so basically, really the, the schema of your data. Um, your data quality is linked to the schema as well. Then you've got pricing. Um, so you know, in larger organization, you want to be able to 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 uh, to trace in a way um, uh, the, the, where the financial consume the, the the financial cost of of some of that. So you want to be able to do that. So that's part of the contract. Stakeholders is really, I've got an example after, but it's really about building the history of people that basically touched your contract. Okay, and and uh, um, I, I I don't I'm not a big fan of the term tribal knowledge. Uh, these days I don't know if it's even politically correct, but uh, please forgive me if it is not. But the idea is to keep this knowledge across the enterprise as it goes there okay it's not about it, it's not something against it it's about documenting this tribal knowledge to make sure that it stays there and it doesn't go away rules are how we identify security okay so it's not super detailed security so it's not it's not we're not replacing any security artifacts but it's about documenting security when you're looking for data the next step <clears throat> first in most companies it's pretty difficult then the next step is to, oh, I found the data, but how do I access to that? Usually in companies, it's role-based, and the idea is to be able to document those roles there. And then you've got something which is really important to my art, which is service levels. So service levels on data are things like um, um, in a batch process, when is it delivered? Okay, am I, am I getting my batch data at 9 a.m. as I was told? or is it documented in a contract? Uh, when is my data contract going to expire, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've got custom properties that facilitate the integration with all the tools and custom things in, in, in companies. So the way you are also actually building uh, a data contract is using a language called YAML. Um, yeah, if you're, if you're not familiar with YAML, it's something which uh, the industry has been adopting for quite a few years now. It's what, for example, Kubernetes, or uh, if you listen to Bill or your uh, OpenShift uses extensively for configuration. The big benefit of YAML is that it's really human readable and it's of course computer readable and it's language agnostic. So you've got a Java parser, a Python parser, or JavaScript or whatever. Um, that could actually consume it really, really easily. You've got you've got uh, tools in many languages that can do that, and that's what it looks like. <clears throat> so here, a uh, very basic, basic example. You can see that you have a table uh, which uh, is called very originally TBL, and you can see columns, and you see a lot of description and a lot of data information, additional information. The column here is. TXN ref date, which is a transaction reference date. If you're there, you see the different types and you see even simple values. All that 
completely normalized. If you drill down a little bit, uh, you can see that a, a column can have this logical type and this physical type. This is to be able to, ver to have very precise matching. And um, the, also the block called authoritative definitions, which you will find at several part of the, of the contract. The idea with the authoritative definition is to, although the data contract is your source of truth for metadata, it's also um, being able to link to other artifacts. Okay, let's say you have a Colibra instance in your organization. If you've got a Colibra instance, you've got all your business definitions there. So you're not going to recopy the business definition of your columns or tables or data sets. In, in, in the data contract, you can just reference them, okay? And because you reference them and because you know your users that are using your data contract, when there's a change at the, at the enterprise level of a definition, you can warn your user as well. Same thing with, with, with implementation here. You can say, oh, this column is a, is a result of a transformation. Here is in this repo, I have the reference implementation. What it means also is that you can um, uh, you can more easily guard uh, and increase your data governance. Uh, a third example um, is what I was talking about the the, the, the the lineage in terms of people that worked on your uh, on your project. Here you've got simply two DPOs, so two data product owners. First one was C is to it, and, the, and the, la the last one was J. Wayne. And you see that at some point, uh, Clint was replaced because it was, it, was, it was playing it dirty. Okay, so, so you can see that the evolution in that. And the roles can be data product owners, they could be engineering leads, they could be uh, data, as they could be uh, data architects, whatever you want to capture. Some organization have a technical owner and a business owner. So you define what, what you want there. It's completely, uh, it's completely open, but you've got this trustability. You know who has been working at what time. And if you need to go back to this person, you actually know who it was. Um, and just my, my, last, my last example, I, I, kind of, I kind of met many, but uh, time flies. The idea is that you can have information like, SLAs, okay, and you can have informations like general availability and of support, uh, end of life. So this is kind of purely informational uh, data, part of your life cycle, uh, going back to you know product enabling, and or you can have information like business information, like the retention period, which in this uh, in this example is three years, okay, but it can vary depending on the country and the business domain. So. We talked about AI, okay, and uh, so um, so let's 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 tackle why it's good for AI. Um, if you're if you remember, some kids uh, when they're toddlers, they, when they start to ask questions, they've got why, 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 and I think it's a really good habit we, which we should keep in mind. Okay, so why are data contracts good? Well, my first why is my data is not great, and I can increase. Maybe I can make it better. And why? Because my data quality is not great. And why? Because my data governance processes are not good. Why? I want results quickly. Why do you want results quickly? Because I want to be able to experiment with AI on real data, for example. Okay. So let's jump to this fifth uh, why and say, I want to do AI. All right. So I had to put a robot because I love robots. And, and I think this is a cool robot. But um, what, what I'd like to go back is um, the, the AI ladder, which was inspired by, um, by um, Rob Thomas, a friend of mine at IBM. And you see these four steps where you've got to collect data, organize data, analyze data, and infusing. So basically collect, organize, and analyze, that's pretty easy. You get, everybody gets it. Um, but when you go to infuse it, and when you reuse your data, when you've built your model, for example, and you put it back into your applications, when when I see that, some things that I it always makes me think of um, of of, a, of this video of one of my favorite video games there. And what what's the link with with data contracts is that at every step of the way, 
you can have data contracts and you can have um and you can and, and you and you see the values there where you can at the gate you need but it doesn't mean that you're starting to have a gated process it means that you have you just have um you, you just have uh the, the right level of gates okay so one thing I, I I also love data contracts for is that it's part of this incremental value we are going to build together, right? So you start first with data contracts. Yes, you get data, you you get data, you get better documentation, you get be better data quality of service. Okay, so uh, I coined that, and it starts to spread a little bit. But the idea of combining data quality and SLAs. And you've got better, faster discoverability, which is a, a real pain in a lot of companies. Then you, you move to create data products and you've got a new set of benefits. And then you eventually you go to a data mesh and we're going to talk data mesh a little later, hopefully with, with Jamac. Uh, but you, you can see that another set of benefits you, you bring. So this brings us to, to my conclusion. So first of all, first of all if, if you want to find a book about all of that, just by mind. All right, so they're cool, um, but jokes apart, uh, they're all available in Amazon. Uh, the data mesh has been translated in, I think, nine different languages. One of our translators, Martin, is on the call, um, and it, it was a really fun project. One, one, one thing I just wanted to say with those books is that half of the profits are going to two charities. One is uh, Girls Who Talk, Who Could, and uh, Black Girls Could. So... You, you're doing a good action uh, when you're doing that. You're not only feeding myself. And you learn something, and it's fun to talk with kids about it. The next thing is keep iterating. Okay, iterate me, baby. Okay, so if you want to increase the value, you've got to think in an iterative way. You're in product in, in product mode. You're not in project mode anymore. Another, another takeaway, uh, another set of takeaways is data contracts re are not required um, do not require data mesh. It's the opposite way around. Okay, you want to create a data mesh, for example, you will need data data contracts uh, to enable your data products, and then <clears throat> you can build your mesh. Okay, and of course, there's an open data contract standard, and it's really when I say okay, it's open, it's like like a, a uh, uh, it's it's like it's a little bit of a silly sentence, but the thing is, it's really we are a group of people we're listening and we're making it uh we're making it better and my call to action is get a coach okay? uh, i'm not like i'm not that nice looking but i can definitely help you with with all of that so having said that i know uh we started a little late so uh, i got an excuse for not letting uh, many questions come in but feel free to uh to uh to link to connect with me on linkedin um, and our, I'm happy to discuss data contract, data product, and data mesh, and modern data engineering all the time. So, back to you, Arkansas. John George. Now, I want to know how much Orson paid you to put his coach in your slide. No, it's not my coach. I just know who that coach. Oh, was. you know that, who that coach that is. Yeah, that's, okay. That's my okay, point. I thought that was yeah. Orson's coach. Orson's coach was from Notre Dame. Well, He's a college Arkansas. football guy. Yeah. Thank you, John George. Excellent presentation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And now we are on to the next one here in just one minute. Uh, we are ready to uh, hear Carl Oscar Bronstrom. Uh, and he is from Stockholm, Sweden, coming to us today. And his presentation is called Bring Order to Chaos. Carl, uh, Carl Oscar, are you ready? I am ready. Awesome. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's all yours. So, thank you very much. So as always, let's try to get technology working. Yes, that's the first step. <laughs> yeah. That's ambitious. <laughs> so my first question to you guys, can you see my screen sharing? Yes. Very good. So that's a bit pretentious, bring order to chaos. But uh, I've been listening a bit here in the in the afternoon because in in Europe we're going towards the the night, and it has been a lot of discussions about data contracts. Very interesting. Uh, thank you, Jean Georges, 
uh, which is uh, possible to pronounce in French, but maybe not in other languages. So what I'm going to talk about is automated intelligent information assessment and classification. Um, my name is Carl Oscar. I'm uh, actually a lawyer, but has been working, well, you know, we always have to rise that. It was 15 years, 20 years, and now it's close to 25 years in the tech business. Uh, would focus on, on compliance processes and achieving compliance without breaking the back of the companies who are supposed to, to achieve that. And we have a very strong uh, focus, and that is uh, on the invisible challenge of information control. So in a company, pretty much 20% of the data is structured. So this is the traceable data. This is what's stored in databases, uh, often connected to business systems. Um, we have a good idea of what data we have and what we use it for uh, down to a tables level. Um, this data, since we know what it's used for and we, we know uh, what format it has and so on, we can actually uh, manually self-assess and, and keep it on, under control. However, when it comes to the unstructured data, we don't really know what it contains of. This is estimated to consist of over 80% of the company's data. And since the, the, the headline, we're talking about data and AI, we know that the unstructured data, it's, it's very difficult to deal with. But we need to keep control also over that kind of information. Um, this is, information is, of course, everything else. This is our uh, files. This is our emails. But this is also the free text fields in our CRM system or HR system. And this information is very easy to copy to share and share. It's often duplicated in many different places. And, and one thing that is very important to keep in mind is that it's very often human communication. It's humans that have produced this information and it's humans that have consumed this information. So it's, it's human communication and we are pretty good in communicating uh, in many different ways. So what does the unstructured data look like? Well, uh, I like this image uh, because after 30, 40 years of digitization and saving everything because it might be good to have someday, our unstructured data, our file stores, and well, many people's email inboxes actually looks like this. Uh, there are, are important documents and uh, less important things that are really mashed up and we are calling it unstructured just because it's really unstructured. We don't really know uh, where it is and, and what it is. And uh, this is the, the current situation. And if we're going to uh, achieve control over this, just to, to have some, some comparisons, uh, if we would take one terabyte of data, uh, unstructured data, uh, that's the equivalent of approximately 2 million documents. And we would print them and put them on a, on a, a big pile. Well, first of all, our uh, HP would be very glad for us printing all of them, but it would actually reach 200 meters. And as a reference, uh, the Statue of Liberty is, is 100 meters tall. So that's a lot of information. That's a lot of documents that we have actually accumulated in only that one terabyte of data. And the reality is that most organizations don't have one terabyte of data. They have 100 terabyte or 1,000, in some cases, 10,000 terabyte of unstructured data. And, and just taking one of these terabytes and going through them, if we would even find someone who was willing to, to perform that kind of work, we can expect if they are really, really good at their work, that it will take 20 to 30 man years to go through this pile of information. And we need control today, which means that we can't sit and wait for 20 years. And we can't really can't sit and wait for 200 years or 2000 years. So this is upon us not, or right now. But... Uh, unstructured data is, is also a ticking bomb somehow. Uh, we have, as of today, uh, estimated a yearly growth of 55% uh, of the unstructured data, which means that the amount of unstructured data is actually doubling every second year. In 10 years, it's ex expected to be 65 times more. Uh, and these estimates, uh, they come from Gartner, and they are, are actually before we got access to generative AI. So generative AI makes uh, this numbers uh, uh, shrink. Uh, this will be much, much higher since we from one simple prompt can actually generate 40,000, 50,000 words. So, uh, and generative AI, of course, is imitating human communication. What we are also seeing is that of these 
uh, documents and things we have stored, 50 to 70% of it is actually never used. And when we're talking about never used, it means that the, the date something was saved and the date when it was last accessed by a user is actually the exactly same uh, time. It's the same timestamp. Um, so during the years, we're accumulating a lot of unstructured data that doesn't serve any purpose at all, but is adding to our costs and, and also to risk for compliance uh, issues. Uh, we heard some numbers from Microsoft uh, looking at their cloud storage. So there is limitations in the file system. So we only have one last access date um, uh, and not more data points, but Microsoft have actually uh, studied this and they concluded on, on the Azure platform and on OneDrive that 97% of all the files were only accessed one time or less since they were created, which means that it's a huge amount of unstructured data that is pretty much never used within our data storages. And uh, this is, of course, creating a lot of problem. The amount of data is all the time uh, increasing, but at the same time, Moore's law for data storage is actually broken which means that 2023 was the first time ever that the storage of uh, one terabyte of data, the cost for storing it was actually going up. Um, and at the same time, all the other costs connected to data management, such as uh, backups and protection and redundancy and black fiber to get the redundancy to work and so on, is also increasing all the time. So there is... Uh, there is a ticking bomb within the unstructured data, but it's not really the biggest reason why we should act now. We have other things happening. So we have regulations. We have in Europe, we have GDPR. I think most of you are starting being aware of, of our very hard uh, privacy regulations. But in the US, we have the NIST 800-53 that is also demanding uh, information classification and control also of all the unstructured data assets that we have in a in our organizations. We also have, of course, the, the sustainability uh, point of this. Storing data uh, contributes to the global CO2 emissions. And of course, it's not sustainable uh, to increase the amount of data at the same time as cost per uh, unit, which in this case, uh, case is, for instance, terabyte, is also increasing, which means that uh, more and more of the IT spendings is actually going towards uh, data management and not doing uh, good things for the business, which is of course not sustainable either uh, from a company point of view. And we of course have uh, security. Um, we have zero trust that is coming very strongly and I assume that most of the audience are, are familiar with it. Uh, zero trust is actually talking about both uh, units and, and access to information in order to limit it to, to both protect, but also to mitigate consequences of of attacks when they happen and not if they happen. And the only way to achieve that is to have a very granular insight within uh, towards the information assets. So we need to get in control of these assets. We need to know where they are. We need to know what is sensitive and what is worth protecting and what is not worth protecting. And as we also heard, of course, when it comes to, to access, we do have general access problems when it comes to, to information. And that is uh, normally that we have uh, access to much more information than we actually need to perform our work. So there is uh, compelling reasons to act right now, but doing this manually, of course, is not possible. So that is our raison d'etre, our reason to exist. Uh, so what we have done is that we have created a solution. So this is a package solution that is delivered on uh, images, which means they can be deployed in an environment within a, an hour or so. Uh, with the ability to, to read all data and all new data and change data. We're still talking about unstructured data. In order to achieve this, we, we have incorporated uh, IBM Watson Explorer. So that is the, the crawling agent that we are working. So we're using uh, Watson Explorer's abilities to extract the text layers from all this uh, accumulated historical old data and everything that is changed or produced uh, as we go along. We are then pushing that through our own, own uh, AI engine, which uh, is using descriptive AI to find the sensitive information, to assess this information and to classify it according to the existing classify uh, rules. 
And talking about GDPR, it's very, very well described in Article 30, uh, how it should be classified in ISO 27001. We have a whole chapter and also in the NIST standards, uh, it's very well described what do we have to classify and what information are we actually looking for. This means that what we're doing with AI is that we're generating metadata. So we are pretty much creating records of our information assets, uh, information about our information. And when we have that, we start having things under order and control, which means that we can start deriving insights. We can see statuses, we can see changes, uh, trends, and exposures. And while doing so, we can also start taking actions. And these actions can, of course, be manual, but they can also be uh, automatic using uh, tools that is already present, uh, like, for instance, Microsoft PowerShell, uh, in order to reduce the amount of data, to move things that are sensitive, uh, to protect things that needs more protection, and also uh, develop our processes. As I mentioned, uh, so unstructured data to a large extent is uh, human communication, which means that if you find clusters within specific uh, business processes where we have a lot of, of unstructured data, we can uh, draw the conclusion that we do have a problem with that process, which makes people talk a lot to each other uh, back and forth. And when they're doing that, it means that something is actually malfunctioning. What we also have incorporated is a workflow engine for a continuous uh, improvement uh, layer which means that we can always at any time uh, control the output from the AI and the automatic classification of the AI. In this workflow engine, we have also incorporated a, a contextual knowledge database, which means that we can give education to the person performing the quality control. And we are using that uh, input, that human input, for continuous fine tuning of the models, which means that we continuously go from a very high level of accuracy to surpassing human capacity in assessing information. So we had, a, as you know, when we're measuring accuracy, it's a theoretical measurement, but we had actually one of our customers who had a team of people who were supposed to classify 300 documents and use the AI to do the same thing. And the AI actually surpassed the humans with 140%. And that's of course not because the AI is smarter than humans. It's because we don't get fatigued at page 17. Well, we do, but the AI doesn't get fatigued at uh, page 17 like uh, humans have a tendency to do. So showing this image, it's also important that what we can apply this uh, engine for is pretty much any classification schema that we want to achieve. So we're working a lot of regulations and all unstructured data, but we also have other projects where we're working with specific use cases. Uh, for instance, in Finland, we're using uh, our platform in order to uh, interpret and codify uh, medical journal notes in order to achieve proactive healthcare. So we can uh, get things before they become a problem and have uh, actions taken before someone actually gets sick by uh, codifying the, the medical uh, journal notes that we get from, from the doctors. So when we're talking about AI, it's very important Everyone today is talking about generative AI, and I think generative AI is really, really cool. But we, we have to keep in mind what generative AI is. We are focusing on descriptive AI, which means that it's based on, on, on training in order to, to identify complex entities and classifying from multiple dimensions. This means that the descriptive AI is focusing on complete accuracy in the assessment. This also means that we're working with a 100% dense model we're never skipping anything, not even a small comma in a, a specific text layer or document that we are reading. And that is because from a human communication point of view, the sense of a, of a sentence totally changes with a comma or not a comma. While, of course, generative AI generates, it's focused and trained on generating output from input. It's targeted at human understandable text. And that also means that it will miss uh, some or many data points from the source that it's reading. Uh, sometimes we could call generative AI as generalizing AI. It's, it's skimming things over. And that is, of course, not possible if you're going to be compliant with all these regulations that are coming. And uh, some go as far to say that, that descriptive AI is actually needed in order to control generative AI. So this is something uh, from the classification guidelines uh, 
produced by NIST in the, in the US, uh, they are saying this because if you don't know what you're feeding into the generative AI, you have a huge risk of things going out from the AI to be wrong. But even if you have control on what you're feeding into the generative AI, you still have to control what's going out because of hallucination and, and other phenomena that we have with, with generative AI. So in order for, for anyone in the US pretty much, uh, if you're a public entity or if you're delivering to, to the public sector, uh, you need to control your, your information before you launch any generative AI project. And this is also something we have seen uh, with Microsoft's Copilot, which is fantastic technology. Uh, at least in, in Sweden, uh, the beta testing, none of the, the organizations who were running the beta test actually have turned into production because of the problem of the information that generative AI and Copilot get access to. And this is, of course, very simple to, to, to solve. It's just everything that is confidential is classified as confidential, and you tell Copilot that you're not allowed to read the confidential data. But of course, the problem is that organizations don't have their confidential data classified as confidential, which means that, that Copilot will get access to much more information than you really wanted to get access to. And please note, I'm not talking about data breaches. I'm talking about just the, the, the tenant running uh, Copilot when it starts reading the file server from uh, 12 years ago. It might contain a lot of things that we don't want uh, a Copilot to, to generate information from. So we are in order to achieve this, we're working with uh, deep transfer learning. And I don't think in this audience that we have to go into the, dis the differences with deep transfer learning. But what we can see is that we're achieving very high accuracy uh, when using this technology. Um, so we are, of course, working with large language models and pre-training. Uh, sometimes they are general, and sometimes we're using customer-specific large language models for a specific classification need. And we are then fine-tuning this through supervised training uh, and pre-prepared training data that we normally get from the customer when we have a, a organization-specific um, classification schema that we should uh, work with. And of course, if we're working with GDPR, that is the same for everyone. We already have 98, 99% uh, accuracy in the, the, the models that we can deliver with the solution. So by doing this, we get a 98% accuracy when we are, are launching the, the AI in production. And through the workflow, we are continuously increasing that number going up towards 99 and uh, in some cases, 99.9% .9 accuracy for the, the automatic classification. So what does it look like? Well, this is actually a real life example. So uh, to the left side, we have a Word document, um, a, a CV, someone applied for a job. And to the right side, we have our workflow engine where the text layer from this Word file is actually presented after it has been processed by the AI. So you see a lot of colors and some of them are pretty simple like direct personal data as it's called in the GDPR, which is name and addresses and so on, which can be easily found by uh, uh, the AI, but of course, also with regular expressions. But we have some things that are a bit more tricky, and that is uh, birth date. So birth date under European law is a uh, personal data uh, because it's the year I was born and the date. Uh, but the only thing that differs a birth date from any other date is how it contextually shows up in the in the text layer, because that's how we understand that it's a. Uh, uh, a birth date. We, as humans, understand that it's a birth date and not any other kind of date. And we also see an example of something that is even more uh, tricky, which is uh, information that by itself doesn't constitute personal data, but when put together contextually, actually uh, becomes uh, personal data under the GDPR. So in this example, it's profession. That's not personal data by itself. It's a company. It's not uh, personal data by itself, and it's a year which once again, a year is not by itself personal data, but when put together contextually, uh, this combination actually makes us human uh, understand who this person is and it's possible to identify them. So this is what we train the, the, the AI to achieve is to understand the contextual meaning of uh, words, of uh, phrasings, of sentences, of paragraphs, or sometimes of whole documents in order to have a correct classification. And to the right side, we see the, the digital smart form uh, 
where we actually collect automatically generate uh, all the, the necessary metadata demanded by Article 30 in, in the GDPR. And this is, of course, information about if it contains personal data, what process it is, what the purpose is, a legal basis, and so on. So while running this and while running uh, descriptive AI, it also means that we get uh, a very fast processing. So it's possible to achieve 10 terabytes per month or up to 100 terabytes per month. And when we're doing that, we are simultaneously creating the automatic records. So the automatic records is, of course, the metadata that we need in order to, to both prove and to actually be in control of the specific uh, information asset. So for GDPR, that is, as I mentioned, it's personal data, but it's also category of personal data and the category of the registered. It's the business process, it's the purpose, it's the legal basis. And it's, of course, the retention schedule, because under GDPR, we are supposed to uh, redact personal data when we are no longer in use of it. And as you can understand, for the unstructured data, doing that manually is a, a very, very heavy burden for most organizations. Looking at the US NIST 853, uh, there are also uh, metadata demands in order to be in control of the information. So it's type purpose, owner process. Is this a legal obligation? What's the financial value, business value, sensitivity? Does it contain personal data? And all those together creates the classification, which means is this confidential? Is it restricted? Is it internal? Or is this actually public information? So for any classification schema we are do, uh, working with, we are creating this metadata layer to be used for existing technology, future technology, whatever you want to do in order to access uh, order and, and control over your information assets. So what's the point of all this? Well, first, there are some, some clear measurements when it comes to re return on investments. So as I mentioned, the, the cost for data management is pretty much exploding. And for all of you working with AI, you know that looking at, at data sets and so on, the unstructured data, normally we don't touch it because we don't really know what to do with it. Uh, I heard mentioning the, the problems with poor data quality, and, and that is always a, a, a theme when we're talking about that. But through data offloading, we can actually start making, saving a lot of money. Uh, and this is for data management, which means it's both storage, but it's also protection, it's backups, and it's, as I mentioned, the redundancy uh, that is directly connected to, uh, to the amount of data. Uh, we have compliance and the GDPR, 4% per breach of a group revenue turnover can be a lot of money. We have the sustainability aspect with um, the CO2 emissions. And we have, of course, an efficiency uh, part of this. Uh, if we have 70% of all the unstructured data that is never used, we know how many times we've been sitting looking for information. We don't find it. We ask our, our uh, colleagues and then we do the same thing all over again. So this kind of double work is actually something that, that drives a lot of costs. Improvements, I think I mentioned them. Uh, we get actionable insights, we get a reduced attack surface, we get a, a possibility to actually implement a zero trust model. Uh, we can start revalidating our accesses and actually go towards the holy grail of access management, which is content-based and not location-based. So if you have the right to read the content of a file, that's when you should get access to it, and not because it, someone saved it in, in the file server. And then, of course, uh, avoid the, the exponential growth, enhance existing technologies such as uh, data loss prevention solutions, policy enforcement, and, of course, it enables new technology. We can control what goes into to our AI efforts uh, for generative AI, uh, which makes it possible to actually start using that technology. So how do we deliver? Well, we can run this in cloud. We are ready for, for both Azure and AWS if you want to run it towards your, your unstructured data there. But it can also run on-premises, uh, which might be a very good idea if you're running towards data that are potentially sensitive or, or confidential. And it can also be, be delivered hosted from our partners. So my last slide, guys, if you're more interested, reach out. You can reach out to me uh, directly. Uh, you have my email address there or hook up with me on LinkedIn and we can continue discussing. Uh, we are using Arrow as our distributor. So if you have an interest, no matter where you are in the world as a partner, 
uh, reach out to Arrow and they can tell you more about our solution and put you in contact with the relevant persons. We are also, if you are an end customer and say oh, this would be interesting, we are working very closely with CGI, uh, where we're one of their uh, partners in the, their Unicorn Academy. Uh, so if you want to uh, see how a project can work towards your data, just reach out to CGI, to Arrow, or directly to me, and we make that work. So that left us four minutes for questions. Do you have any questions, guys? I'm looking in the chat. I don't see any questions right now. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Carl Oscar? Any any next steps you think we should take? Well, it, it's a question of urgency and what's what's happening on the 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 regulatory market when it comes to information control. We heard about data contracts before. Uh, there is a lot of regulations coming that are focusing on information and not data. So uh, we should. Stop talking so much about data and we should start talking about information because that's what actually has value for us uh, as enterprises and organizations. But it's also what the regulatory uh, bodies are focusing on. They don't really care about data anymore. They're caring, they're caring about information. And, and I know for US, US customers know this from the CMMC coming from the Department of Defense, for instance. Uh, it's information that is of importance, and that's what we have to keep in control. Excellent tip. Uh, one last call for questions, if anyone has any. And if not, then we will uh, be preparing for the next speaker. Thank you very much, Carl Oscar. It was a really fascinating presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening in. Thank you. And I'd like to give a shout out to Leticia Caro uh, in Tish Talks Tech is in our audience. Uh, Tish. Hi, Tish. Hi, Tish. Uh, if you don't know Tish, uh, you should. Uh, Tish does the famous Tish Talks Tech podcast. And if you uh, Google her, uh, you will find the, a wealth of podcasts that she has done, including us. That's right. Final baby. That's right. I'm Karen Kilroy and this is Orson Weems and we're uh, we're live at podcastvideos.com for AIDA users group AI on Pi Day. It is pie. And here's our pie. It's our foul baby pie. <laughs> foul baby pie, Kim. And we'll be line. this for lunch. We'll be checking the progress of the pie throughout the day. <laughs> um, our next speaker is is uh, from Ontario, Canada. And he has the distinction of writing a book with our own Jean-Georges Perrin. Uh, implementing Data Mesh is, I believe it's not out yet in, on O'Reilly, but it is available on an early release. Uh, I put the uh, link in the chat just now. And so with that, um, uh, Eric, are you, uh, you ready to start a couple minutes early? Absolutely, Karen. Thank you so much and welcome. Welcome. Fantastic. So you know what? Don't, I'm gonna don't, do don't 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 give Eric more time. He will use it. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> Eric probably needs more time. John George, you, you should know better. Writer. I have. John George, you should know better. I have the mic now. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I, I'll, I, we're going to start at one o'clock sharp, but I'll just do a quick intro for those that, uh, and then we'll get right into it uh, on time. Uh, as, as Karen mentioned, I'm writing a book with Jean-Georges Perrin, implementing data mesh. Um, uh, I've been in the industry, uh, technology industry, 35 years, almost all of the financial services. I was doing AI when it was just called machine learning. Uh, and since then, I uh, focused uh, a fair amount more on data mesh and generative AI, which, as you can imagine, work quite well together. I've done Gen AI uh, implementations at several clients in the retail, financial services, and climate industries. So, um, you know, uh, probably just real quickly explain what you, you folks obviously know about Gen AI. So, I'm not going to tell you too much that you don't know about that specific topic, but I will uh, try and explain uh, what are some of the obstacles on the on the road. What are the speed bumps that you need to think about as you deploy? Uh, and introduce Gen AI into your organization. So uh, that's why the, the the topic is called Lessons Learned on a Generative AI Journey. 
So I'll talk about uh, probably seven lessons. I'll humbly offer those. I'm sure there are many more, but these are the ones that stood out for me. And I'm hoping that uh, as you listen to my talk, uh, you will avoid the speed bumps uh, and the obstacles that I had on on my Gen AI, my client's Gen AI, Gen AI journey. And uh, you'll be able to do a lot faster and better than I can than I did. Um, anyway, let me uh, share my screen, and then we'll get started. There we go. Okay. Sorry, just a few quick technical challenges. There always are. Always are. Well, while you're doing that, I'm going to give my book a plug. Go for it. <laughs> go for it. Blockchain Tethered AI. Uh, I wrote this, and this is actually how I met Jean Georges. Was he was well? I didn't meet him this way. He he. I did work with him this way, though. He was my technical reviewer on on blockchain tethered AI. And did that get get it, Eric? Are you ready? Uh, I am. Hopefully, okay. people can see my screen. Okay, yeah, great. We can. we can. Yes. You can. Okay, fantastic. Yes. So we are ready to go. So uh, I told you a little bit about myself. Let's get right down to it. there. There, there's uh, the book plug, uh, but I won't spend too much time. So. So again, seven <clears throat> lessons learned uh, along the Gen AI journey. And as I mentioned, we've done this a few times. And, and our hope is that as, as you go through your journey, one or two of these hopefully will help you. Uh, so let's start real quickly. And, and I'm going to hopefully finish before, uh, before, before the time deadline here. And we have at least five or 10 minutes to have, have questions if necessary. Um, I think everybody's heard the 80-20 rule. And everybody probably knows uh, that in today's data world, our highest paid resources, the data scientists, the data analysts, they spend 80% of their time preparing the data and probably 20% driving insights. Now, one can debate whether it's 80-20, but the vast majority of time is spent uh, preparing and wrangling data. And, and that's a big problem because for obvious reasons, they're, they're the, some of the most expensive resources out there. And uh, quite frankly, they're being paid to deliver insights as opposed to, you know, massage data. Um, what we're finding is and Gen AI can absolutely reverse that, uh, that number. We've seen, uh, and again, you can debate whether it's 20 to, or 30%, but we've seen now the, the, the vast majority of time that data scientists spend move in, you know into the actual analyzing and delivering insights what that really means is this gen ai and the capabilities and you've heard things uh, uh code generation co-pilot uh and all those type of things are the obvious ones where if you're if you're doing um jupyter notebooks or python notebooks if you're doing uh any type of programming co-pilot and, and and even you know asking chat gpt to humbly offer some Python code to do some, some work that you're trying to do. Uh, that's a supercharger, that supercharges your productivity. We've seen it in my clients. I do it when I do my own work, uh, my projects, um, but uh, I can find the productivity uh, dramatically rising. And I'm spending less time on Stack Overflow. I'm spending less time on, uh, on the internet trying to find stuff. And I actually have, uh, whether it's ChatGPT or something else, I can actually deliver the code, the the machine, the the Gen AI code that I actually need to do some of this work. Now, the interesting thing about it is, it's not just the code generation that we see, but even some of the analytics, some of the the models have come a significant way since the first you know GPT three point five generation, um, and it's quite commonplace to actually do some of the analytics, offering things like spreadsheets or CSV files or stuff like that. Uh, into a, a generative AI model and actually ask for some insights. That is a huge deal. And it is very, very early stages. Yeah, there's still some challenges as, as you go about doing that. But 
the, 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 the future is very, very clear in that the productivity opportunity for our data scientists, our data analysts is changing and it is increasing and the tools are at our disposal. And as I said, this is early stage. We're going to see it get even better. And the capabilities of the model, as we know, are, are getting uh, are improving uh, in, a, in a very fast fashion. Um, the capabilities and tools available to our data scientists, data analysts are uh, are there and they're going to even get even better. So first rule, 80-20 is now 2080. And we can actually apply some of the, the, the very expensive resources we have to, to uh, things that are actually going to deliver much more value. Second lesson learned, uh, open AI uh, still leads today. Um, and I, I emphasize today uh, because uh, I think things are getting actually the the the, the models are actually quite uh, competitive these days, um, and I think there's different avenues of of uh, offering uh, value in models. Sometimes having smaller smaller models and being able to deploy them on a different footprint is actually of significant value. Uh, in addition to what we traditionally see, which is the bigger models offering better insights, um, a, OpenAI still leads the way. However, uh, the competition is nipping at AI, OpenAI's heels. And what that really means for you, the audience, is that uh, you have a lot of options that are available to you. It used to be that one game in town, OpenAI. Uh, now there's a bunch of really great opportunities. As an example, uh, token limits. Um, we've seen those uh, increase. Uh, well, they're relatively small at the start. You could barely put, put anything as context into uh, to go with your prompt. Um, but now you have, ver uh, you know, I'm not going to say unlimited, but a very, very significant uh, room to, to add guidance for your, your uh, prompts, your large language models. Um, and we see that actually only increasing. So models are going to get better. Uh, that's obvious. Token limits are going to increase. But I think some of the value drivers around where the improvements are going to be, smaller models being uh, in, in different footprints where they get deployed, is actually another area. OpenAI leads today for, for, for in many cases, but the, the competition is, is it's quite open right now, and it's really quite cool to see. Next one. <clears throat> uh, local models, um, still challenging. Uh, I think everybody uh, tries some of the stuff on, on their laptop, perhaps, uh, or on their uh, cloud instance, whatever the case may be. Um, and, and we find that the smaller models are relatively easy to get running. Uh, they, they offer the basic capability. Sometimes the response time isn't all that great. Sometimes the hallucinations are, are not what you'd like. But the small, small models are, are relatively easy to, to get working. <laughs> It's when you start to get some of the, the larger models, some of the newer models, um, that's actually very, very difficult uh, to, uh, to, to actually get running well. Um, sometimes you have uh, some pretty significant uh, uh, computing requirements, higher end GPUs, large VRAM uh, requirements, et cetera. But even things like uh, documentation <laughs> are, are not necessarily where they need to be. That being said, uh, for those that are bold enough to try it, and they can overcome some of these, these obstacles, uh, there, there's some significant opportunities to do some learnings and, and even some significant opportunities to, to do some innovative deployments. But um, local models, again, uh, still challenging and not for the faint of heart. You really need to think through whether this is something that uh, you're in a position to, to do, or do you go with uh, the canned models that are available from uh, Anthropic or OpenAI or IBM Watson or whatever the case may be. Next lesson learned, uh, fine tuning. I think everybody's heard a lot about this, but you, you get your baseline model, uh, wherever you may go get it, and you, you tune, if you will, uh, uh, or train uh, the top layer of the model. And what ends up happening is, is you can customize that model for your particular data. The challenge that you have is is while it definitely offers some great opportunities, uh, you need to be really cognizant of the fact that data leakage is still a big deal. So if you're fine tuning your models, that's the first challenge. The second one is, is it still takes a lot of time to actually continue to keep that model up to date. Um, but if you consider data leakage for a moment, if you're, if you're running your models and you're fine tuning them, they're only going to be used inside the enterprise, you're probably okay. Okay. But that data that you use to actually train the model 
enterprise data, probably quite sensitive, definitely proprietary, not something that you want to have exposed broadly. Um, the moment you uh, expose the model in, in any way, shape, or fashion to the public, data leakage is a very practical, real concern. Uh, the data that it was trained on will sometimes expose itself. Models get imprinted with certain information and can actually discern certain things that you may not actually want to discern to the public. So fine tuning, just to wrap that one up, fine tuning is a great opportunity, uh, but you really need to be careful in how you apply it and, and where you actually apply it. Um, next set, um, prompt engineering. I think everybody knows what that is. Uh, it is still an art. Uh, there is definitely no, uh, I'd like to think that there's going to be more science, if you will, uh, involved in this. Uh, I don't see that. I think there's, uh, I think we, what we end up doing with some of the, the engineers that we work with, um, uh, the, the, there's a huge amount of time. Sorry, I should take a step back. It's easy to get basic results. It's very hard to get good results. And, and it's even more difficult to get the results that you need uh, where you actually expose capability to the public. Um, prompt engineering is hard work today. Uh, if you want to get results that you feel comfortable exposing to the public, uh, we found there's 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 very few people that know how to do this well. There's a lot of people that know how to do basic stuff. There's not a lot of people who know how to. And that while the documentation on the internet uh, and the guides and tutorials uh, are out there, um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to make this, to move this a little bit more from an art to a science. So prompt engineering, hugely important, still an art. Uh, there's still a lot of opportunity for, for growth in this area. The next one, <clears throat> um, data cleanliness uh, matters, uh, and it matters a lot. For probably the the most obvious reasons, anybody who's been in data for a little while uh, knows that garbage in gives you garbage out. Uh, this maxim still stands. Um, generative AI, uh, you know, uh, needs to be trained on clean data. Otherwise, you're going to get unexpected results. So, Gen AI, like data before us, um, if you train it on garbage data. When I say garbage, let's be more specific. It may be, uh, you may have um, unknown biases in it. Uh, you may have data quality issues. Um, you may be uh, exposing private information that you shouldn't. Um, that's the, the poor quality data in the garbage in will, in Gen AI, deliver garbage results. Worse than hallucinations, <laughs> you'll get wrong answers. You'll get answers that are biased uh, in an unexpected way. So. The, the lesson learned here is, is being able to apply data quality practices uh, is more important than ever. You cannot do Gen AI unless you do data quality. Uh, and I know there's a few folks on the audience, uh, JGP, for example, uh, will echo this. Things like data contracts are absolutely one of the many tools out there, but probably the best tool to actually apply data quality in a very declarative way. That is the type of capability that now we now need to introduce to the gen generative AI landscape so that we can get to the point where we can have the confidence necessary in our data to, to be able to uh, expose it to the audience that uh, we want to have it. <clears throat> There's a few techniques that, and I'll talk about uh, RAG in more detail in a second, um, but there's a few techniques that uh, allow you to be more successful. Um, so as I mentioned, data contracts, data quality. Um, but as you look at your, your, your uh, retrieve log meta generation, which is typically used a fair amount inside the enterprise. So obviously models come with some fair capability. They've been trained on the vast knowledge, if you will, in the internet. Um, but when you, when you try and apply your enterprise data into the AI landscape, the Gen AI landscape, most folks opt for uh, retrieve augmented generation solutions. The, 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 the challenge here is um, the enterprise data uh, is suspect to all of the challenges that, that I mentioned before. 
So just as we've seen uh, the hallucinations from uh, OpenAI, for example, uh, some of the biases that we've seen in some of the, the Gen AI models uh, quite recently, in fact, from some very, very large, uh, very large uh, vendors, uh, that applies to your enterprise too. So what that really means for you is as you think about your, your RAG solutions, which is, again, the predominant pattern that we see in the enterprise, uh, you need to figure out um, not only how to clean, how to, how to do the basic data cleaning, but how do you actually discern the biases that you may have in your data? That's a really tricky question because if you're if you're doing loan origination and you serve a particular audience or a particular geographic region, uh, and you've trained your data on that, and then you want to apply it to a new geographic region, a new audience your data will likely have a bias. <laughs> and that bias may poison the results. And actually, from a regulatory perspective, especially in financial services, could get you into a lot of trouble. Um, so uh, again, uh, data cleanliness is, is a huge priority to reduce the noise and improve, uh, improve the outcomes for, for generative AI. Now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about RAG, and in fact, just as a quick plug, uh, I will be talking about knowledge graph-powered RAG. Uh, I think I have the honor of being the very last presenter on Pi Day today at 7.30. Uh, so I'll be talking about this in a, <laughs> a fair amount of detail. Um, but but here, here's here's the deal with, with RAG. As I mentioned, uh, retriever log augmented generation is probably the go-to approach for um, uh, providing the information for your large language models, the context, if you will. Uh, here's the challenge. Um, the stuff that you see in the tutorials, um, it's not that they don't work. I, I probably should rephrase that a bit there, but it's not that they don't work. It's that they're, they're toys. They're trivial. <laughs> um, simple RAG will give you simple answers, but it doesn't scale. Uh, it has the challenges um, that we've mentioned. They're, they're even worse than data data cleanliness issues. If you have a simple rag and you you know you 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 go to town with that and you add a fair amount of content uh, into your rag solution, your vector database is kind of the core piece of the puzzle in a rag solution. What you're going to find is your your vector database again in the simple rag. You have one vector database. This, this, in the simple rag solution, your vector database. Um, for lack of a better word, gets overloaded. And the similarity results that you count on to populate the context for your L, your prompt, your LLM query um, will be populated with, uh, you know, poor data, worst case, irrelevant data, and you're obviously going to get poor results. What we find <laughs> is, is folks are evolving to, uh, to, to augment RAG and do some very cool but different things. So, so we see, we found that, uh, in, in, you know, I'll give you the typical evolution of, of what we see at our clients. We start with a simple RAG <clears throat> proof of concept. Then very quickly, we find that we demonstrate the, the, the problems that you have with that simple solution, and we introduce additional vector databases around particular topics. And then what we offer is, is in a next proof of concept that gives you the ability to select the vector database that you want to work with and do the similarity search and then issue your queries. And you can actually see a significant improvement. And then what we do is we actually uh, offer the capability to do some orchestration. So, so simple, simple orchestration saying try this vector database if the similarities don't, don't hit a clip level, try the next one, the next one. So what you do is you start to orchestrate the, the interactions and the similarity searches across a variety of different um, a variety of different vector databases. And what we find state of the art today, and again, we're going to talk, I'll be talking about this at 730 today, uh, is using knowledge graph uh, capability to actually uh, power your RAG solution. And I won't go into a lot of detail because I, I will go into a lot of detail at 730 today. But if I were to be very simple, is, is in the previous solution, the previous step, we said there's going to be a fair amount of uh, vector databases uh, within your, your, um, your uh, landscape. What we do with, with uh, knowledge graphs <coughs> is we actually uh, use the knowledge graph to, to determine which vector database to do the sim similarity search. And the knowledge graph, obviously, is a, semantic, a much more semantic representation of the knowledge that you're looking for. And by applying knowledge graphs, you actually can deliver 
uh, superior results. And when I say superior, I mean truly superior results. Much, much better than than obviously simple rag, but but better than just about any of the the options out there. Probably because it is more semantically aligned to to uh, where your enterprise is at and the data that you actually use, um, both for training but also for uh, for your rag solution. So that <clears throat> I promised that we'd have a few minutes for questions. So I will just uh, humbly say thank you for giving me this opportunity to present. And uh, I'll see if there's any questions that folks have. I have a question, Eric. Sure. Um, what do you think um, is the biggest uh, challenge that someone needs to plan for if they're considering bringing an LLM into their office? Uh, probably. I'll, I'm going to actually go go through a few of these. First off, number one, uh, because it because it transcends the, the the different implementation options, it's the middle option that that's, that's on the screen. It's the data cleanliness. Um, if you're going to do Gen AI, um, and, and you're going to do, I mean, here, here's the risk that you run is Gen AI is, is not just a CDO or a CIO or a CTO agenda. It's a CEO and a board level agenda. What that really means is you really don't have an option of getting it, getting it wrong. <laughs> you have to get it right the first time. And time and time again, we've seen in, you know, in all of our experiences before, garbage data in delivers garbage results out. If you have the level of visibility that folks are going to have around Gen AI, like I said, in some organizations, this is a board level discussion, a CEO level discussion. If you're going to have that visibility, you have to get it right. Data cleanliness, job one. Data contracts, data quality tools, great expectations, and there's a variety of other ones that we use. Uh, these are tools that are readily available to folks, and you'd be remiss not to actually apply those and find a way to um, not only improve the quality of your data, but also to understand the biases, the uh, the unexpected biases that you may actually have in your data. Uh, and that, those are kind of that's the very first few steps that you probably want to think about as you do go down your generative AI journey. <laughs> Karen, do we I have think more questions? Thank you, Eric. Do we have more questions for Eric? Um, okay. Uh, well, uh, you know, Eric, what what's the biggest mistake you've seen somebody make? I know that's kind of the inverse of what do you need to do to get uh, ready, but like, have you actually seen somebody flub this up? I I can I can I can be ha happy to say that I haven't seen any of my clients flub this up. Um, I mean, I, I think there's there's a bunch of things out there. I won't mention any names, but I think they've been in the headlines in the last few weeks uh, where um, despite best efforts um, to avoid biases, uh, biases do pop up in strange places, uh, in unexpected places. Um, and in some cases, and I think we probably all know the recent headlines, um, this is despite best efforts by a leading, a leading organization. Um, uh, so, so I guess while I, I think I can be very happy to say that my clients haven't flubbed up, the opportunities are there to very easily flub up. <laughs> and it, it can happen despite the best intentions, um, uh, d despite the best capabilities and some of the best skills you may be able to apply to it. You just really need to think through uh, what you're trying to do uh, and actually almost be a devil's advocate to find out how you can actually probe where, where, where folks may not have probed before. Interesting. Um, so uh, we've got a few minutes left. Um, uh, does anyone have a question? If you do, jump in. Uh, and if not, I would like to hear about your book. Sure. <laughs> the book is uh, called Implementing Data Mesh. I have wonderful esteemed uh, luminary Jean-Georges Perrin is my uh, my co-author uh, we I think it's kind of it's a fantastic opportunity to work with somebody as talented as JGP uh, 
we definitely have some some ideas that overlap. We definitely have some ideas where we challenge each other. Uh, but the book is going to be out. Uh, we're aiming for uh, the Christmas season, if you will. So, so September, October timeframe, it'll be published uh, in a bookstore online or physically near you. Uh, there's a bunch of cool things that are going to be in it. Um, so so we, we, we follow in the, the footsteps. We stand on the shoulders of Zamak Dagani uh, of Data Mesh fame. She set these wonderful principles out for us, um, but she left this wonderful gap uh, around uh, how do you actually implement these principles? Uh, so, so we're actually, that, that's what JGP and myself are actually going to do in this book is we're going to explain how you can apply those principles to uh, accelerate your Gen AI journey. We're going to be talking about things wow. like architecture. We're going to talk about what, what is a data product, what's actually inside it, and how do you make it, uh, you know, what makes it tick and how do you make it sing. And we're going to talk uh, about the, the, um, the operating model or the organizational aspects too. And then it, we cap it off with a, a nice handy dandy roadmap that uh, you can use as a cookie cutter for, uh, for building your data mesh. So, so, Karen, thank you very much for the plug. Uh, and sure. JGP, I'm, I'm sure you uh, must be talking on mute I've never known him. <laughs> it, so he must be talking it. or laughing on mute or something at this point. <laughs> so, Eric, one bit, one last question. This is really important. What animal do you think you're going to get on your cover? Oh, we we already know. We already you know. know. <laughs> you already know. Here, oh yeah, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. Okay. There and it is. And the backstory to this is oh, when you're an O'Reilly oh, author, you get an animal on your cover. Wow. That's impressive. What kind of spider is that? I I actually don't know. JGP, they, they I think they told us, uh, but I don't recall off the top. So uh, Very um, cool. and I, I'm not sure if there's actually a linkage between the animal that you get and, and your topic. Um, but I, I can kind of, you know, push comes to shove. I can draw some kind of connection, but uh, but it's it's a cool it's a That's it's cool to actually get my get our animal age, JGP. <laughs> Yeah, mesh and web. And that's really cool. Well, thank you, Eric. That was just fascinating. And we're here. I'm here now with uh, Orson Weems. Right. We're at podcastvideos.com in Northwest Arkansas, a state-of-the-art brand new studio. And thank you to the folks at Podcast Videos. That's right. Our friends here. And uh, I want to shout out to our social media expert that's helping us reach a lot of folks around the, the globe during this AI on Pi Day, ARS Media. Mr. Alvin Singh with us working. Yeah. Thank you, Alvin. Right on, Alvin. So, He's helping us, believe me. So, you know, <laughs> so we already showed him the pie, but, you know, with everything that's going on, we like to, it's in the South, so what we like to do is show a little love to some of our, our people here that we're going to have some good background music here. We're going to put in a little background music. So, so this is Love More Records artist, Peter Coco. So Love More Records. All of this is happening in Northwest Arkansas on Pi Day for us. And we're glad to have them here. And have you all here joining us. So who's our next speaker, Karen? Our next speaker is, is another person who uh, is well, known to be seen with John George Perrin. JGP. Again. Yes, Kim Thies. Thank you, Kim. Okay. And Thank Kim's you. topic, Kim is coming to us from Richmond, Washington, and her topic is getting data ROI right. And boy, that ROI, that's important. Yeah. Uh, tech and business collide. So um, I would really like to uh, hand this over to Kim right now, if you're ready. Awesome. I think I'm ready. Let's see if I yeah. get the right screen here for you guys. Can you see the full display? Yes, we can. Thanks, Kim. Okay. Welcome. Great, let's rock and roll. So thank you for, so much for having me. Um, yes, unfortunately, or fortunately, depends on the day. I do work closely with George Perrin and have for a number of years. So um, thank you, JG, for encouraging me to participate and share some of my ideas around getting ROI right in the data space. So um, a little bit of background about me and who I am. Um, I've been in the data industry for, well, well over a decade. I've been in technology even longer, and I've kind of split my time between two major focuses. I've been a consultant, so I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different 
regulated industries, uh, non-regulated as well. I've worked with nonprofits, a lot of interesting work. Um, and then I've also been in-house with a number of, of different companies. So I've worked in a pharmaceutical space um, where I was leading greenfield um, implementations of technology as, as things were moving to the cloud, not to date myself. And then um, recently I had been at PayPal and, and JG joined me there where I had spent some time working on data mesh. And we had one of the first implementations or we actually had the first one at PayPal, but one of the first ones globally too that, that was successfully implemented. So I've learned a little bit along the way. And what I'd like to talk about today is not necessarily the technology, but how you get to the funding for the technology. And I think it's an important conversation that we all lean into. Um, the reason it really matters right now is the money is dropping again. 28% um, of the work that we are putting out there as technologists is not getting funded for AI or ML. Um, we saw this big uptake in 2021 where there were tons of projects. We got the buzz, right? Everything started to focus on, on uh, oh yeah, sure, it's AI, it's ML. Go ahead and do it, even if I don't understand what you're saying. Um, our business partners, though, on the other side, are starting to get to the point where they're realizing, hey, we're sinking a lot of money into data, into, into these different models, and we aren't seeing returns, and we're not seeing them quickly, and the street is pressing us for them. So we have to turn this around more quickly. Um, so that's what I'm here to talk about a little bit today is, you know, we're complaining that, that funding is hard to get, but I think we have an onus to actually be more transparent about the work we're doing. And I'd like to propose a way that we can have these conversations a little bit easier. So I'm going to introduce to you today the AI ROI translator. And so this is a fun little um, conversation that JG and um, uh, another co-founder of Obia Data, Todd and I were having the other day, and I decided to have a little fun and play with it. Um, what we find is that we speak a different language than our business partners. Our business partners speak a different language than us, but we're all trying to go for the same thing, right? Which is ROI for our business. So they might say something like this, you know, let's use some AI to enhance customer stuff. It's going to be capitalized, blah, blah, blah. What we hear is money. Like we care about the money. That's what we care about. Tell us about the money. On the other end of the spectrum, um, what they may be looking for, what they may be hearing from us is like, we're talking about prototypes. We're talking about LLM models. We're using different things about, oh, we're going to do it here. We're going to do a modern data architecture, which we think is business language. I mean, how much more can we dumb it down? But the truth of the matter is this is what they're hearing. It sounds like good to them and they're not interested. And so what we should do is spend a little bit of time translating. And so I want to go back to the, the very basic equation for ROI. So Econ 101, let's go back to college. And some of us are still in college. I saw, I saw our intern on earlier. But um, the standard equation for return on investment is the current value of investment minus the cost of investment divided by the cost of investment times 100. And then you get this score. You get a percentage, right? I actually think that it's time for a new equation. Our world is changing um, thanks to everything that's happened, not only with AI, but even before AI, you know, as we just started to automate software, um, the speed has really changed for how quickly we can reach a, we can get an ROI. And a lot of times because we are in the data space, that has been measured in years and, and only looking foundational. Um, versus the immediate impacts. And so as a result, we often don't talk about these not only immediate returns, but the foundational returns. And I think there's an opportunity to bring these together and create a new AI ROI uh, formula, which would include both the immediate and the foundational returns. So how do we do that? Um, in order to do that, we really need to talk about two major components, and that's strategy and benefits when we're thinking about our AI initiatives. And I'm just going to asterisk this of, as this is my view of the world. <laughs> it's an evolving view. It's something that has just been developed over the last few weeks that I've been playing with. But I've been applying it to a lot of the, last, the cases that I've looked at as a consultant over the last few years, and I find this again and again where there were opportunities in business cases that either I missed or you know, others have missed, that if we had looked at this as strategy plus benefits, 
we probably would have come out better. The other thing that I want to call out too is that the cost of investment includes visible and hidden costs. And for a long time, we've been guilty of really hiding the hidden costs. But it's time to actually talk about those because the hidden costs can actually be an advantage for us. So we're gonna dive into that today. So let's start out with strategy. So what the business might say around strategy or words that you're familiar with, you know, growth, profitability, strategic objective alignment, OKRs, talent and culture, all of those types of things are strategic, but they don't really mean much to us at the project level. However, from the technology side of things, we might be coming in and talking about model training or how the data quality is really going to make this big difference for them and you know what modern data infrastructure evolution is going to be. But how does that actually tie to the objectives that they're putting forth? Um, you know, a lot of times I, I can't tell you the number of business cases I've seen where we've focused on uh, skills and talent such as, hey, we've got new engineers that we want to bring on and it's going to bring new talent, but we don't actually explain what that new talent is going to give the business over time. So I developed a few little tips that you can think about as you're working through the next pitch you have um, for the next uh, AI model, uh, ML, even a big project that you have with technology. So one is think about your goals and objectives. What is the business strategy and what's the financial growth models that they're looking at? So if we were to take a, you know, a Fortune 500 firm, they're pretty good about putting their major, you know, um, we used to call them blue chips or, you know, their, the major rocks to move up every year. These are the top three things that we're going to focus on. We're going to invest in. Make sure your business case aligns to this. And if you, you know, for example, if you're building out a model um, for the first time and you're just looking for the data to use, you know, the technology that you want to bring to your organization, but you're not sure which data sets to use, take a look at those business goals and choose a problem to solve that's going to align with that higher level purpose. Um, when we think about business value, we need to be better about articulating what the business value is for what we do. Is it going to be a competitive advantage in terms of IP that we're developing? Um, is it going to be a pain reduction for the business? If so, let's articulate it not just in operating cost, but also in the ways that it's going to help to automate and create a foundation for the future. And another might be, you know, IP. Uh, we already talked about IP, sorry. Um, skills and talent. So skills and talent, uh, coming back to this, I mentioned how I've seen tons and tons of business cases where it's like, we need, you know, these consultants or this type of engineer. And it doesn't say why. Um, we really need to start focusing on skills and talent in the changing workforce. And this is actually a conversation that is happening in a lot of boardrooms at this point. We're moving people from one role to another. And a lot of the more ethical companies are looking at ways of leveraging AI to not only reduce operating expense by reducing the footprint of people, but to upskill people, to give them new opportunities to do things. Um, we all probably on this call have heard that uh, the, the it's almost infamous now that 80% of a data scientist's time is just spent cleansing and uh, putting together data into to dashboard views, right? Versus going and finding the insights and advising the business um, from a scientific standpoint. There's this great opportunity to address that in these conversations, and that's one area that we've been missing. Um, we can talk about the global talent that's evolving, right? Who can we bring in that we may not have brought in before that will actually bring a greater value to the business? So we're replacing X roles that were very manual, perhaps, with Y roles that are going to give us a strategic advantage. And then also share examples of success. So examples of success can be, um, you know, hey, uh, maybe we haven't done it in this company before, but a like regulated company did this. So um, having worked in the pharmaceutical space for quite a bit, you know, one of the, the, the big three <laughs> um, put together a very large model um, to be able to predict the behaviors of um, behavior health um, outcomes. That behavioral health outcomes work actually ended up getting published and it became a great opportunity for other people in the pharmaceutical business to have these conversations with the board. This is the way we can use patient data in a regulated way 
to actually have a positive impact on the customers that we serve. So find examples that fit your industry, your project, but they also show business value if you don't have something internally that you can go ahead and uh, uh, leverage off the bat. So let's take a, a little bit of a turn and talk about benefits for a little bit. So, you know, the business side, uh, you can guess what, what um, they're saying, you know, time savings, accurate projections, we can improve decision making, we can automate X, Y, and Z. Um, but what they're really going to hear is something like this. I'm hoping it works. <laughs> <laughs> if you've never seen Charlie Brown's teacher, <laughs> if you've never seen Charlie Brown's teacher, that's all the kids here, right? Wah, 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 wah. So when we're saying things that we think make a lot of sense, things like data is a product or um, no offense, Jamak, if you're watching this, but federated computational governance, it means absolutely nothing to the business. And all they hear is Charlie Brown's teacher. So um, some tips for ways that we can begin to address that. One is to articulate customer impact. So one of the things, and, and JG is wonderful about this, this is one of the reasons I love working with him, is thinking about your personas. A lot of times in the work we're doing, our personas may be external to us, maybe it's a customer, but also think about the personas that are internal to your organization as well. The data engineers, the data analysts that are working with the data, um, the, the folks that are working on, on new models. How are you going to identify them? And what is the benefit that they're going to gain? And in return, what is the larger benefit to the business? Another area is to focus in, in data literacy. And you know what? We do a terrible job at literacy. We speak a lot of jargon. And uh, it's hard for us to understand. I sat in on a, a presentation by Women in Analytics, and it was, it was talking about data as a product and all the different definitions that can be out there. We are still figuring out what we're saying ourselves. So how can we expect the business to understand the benefits and advantages if we, aren't, if we don't take the time to really invest in that literacy? So, um, you know, I do believe that a data-driven culture does have to start at the top. But in order to start at the top, we've got to be better as storytellers. We have to make sense um, of, of the things that we're saying. And, you know, one of the things we really need to spend a lot of time on is nixing the jargon and lingo until we have very clear definitions and we can help our business partners um, really understand and articulate the benefits to what we're saying. Making full use of time savings. So, you know, time savings can be measured in a number of different ways and we have a tendency just to quantify and not qualify those time savings. So, you know, I, I touched a little bit earlier on ethical workforce evolution, right? We have the opportunity to save time, which allows people to do other work that's more meaningful. That's one way we can talk about time savings. And when we're doing that, when we're having that conversation, let's make sure and articulate exactly what they could be doing. What is the opportunity loss that we have right now? How much is it costing us by not evolving our workforce? Um, another thing that you may want to look at is recouping time as a value. Um, it, so that time that is spent, let's say that 80% of time that we like to, to throw away for, for data science activities, if we have that 80% of time back, what, sort, what does our workforce look like? And how much time do we spend instead working on new ideas, new insights, new ways of understanding our customers or finding profits versus what we've done in the past? Finally, I come back once again to share examples. So, um, you know, being a storyteller is really important in what we do. It's really easy to get up and, and have conversations with our peers and, and, and talk in our jargon, our lingo. It's easy, you know, for us, I should say, <laughs> to have those conversations, but it's not as easy for the business to truly understand how this is meaningful to them. And, you know, I'll tell you a story. It can even come down to a story as simple as Brunswick stew. So I had this, uh, 
I had this leader at one point in my life who I was trying to explain, you know, the value of thinking about data as products and, and, and individual domains and where we were versus where we needed to go. And one of the illustrations I used was Brunswick stew. So what is Brunswick stew? For those of you that are international, it's an American thing where it's like you literally take everything, you throw it in a pot, including squirrels or whatever else you can find. So, um, you know, that was kind of the way I was using to ex illustrate to him, hey, we have Brunswick stew right now, but in the future, we could have a buffet of well-organized ingredients where we know exactly what's going in to our dashboards, to our, you know, analytic tools. So let's help get there. So that's just an example of, of um, you know, storytelling and, and how we can get our points across. So the last part of the equation that I want to talk about is cost. And, you know, we, we talk about cost quite a bit um, from, the, from the obvious, from the visible cost standpoint. But a lot of times we don't talk about hidden costs. And we do this on both sides of the house. So on the business side, we're talking more like, you know, CapEx, CapEx and OpEx. And, and believe it or not, this is one area that I find there's a lot of opportunity in when creating business cases. We can stop and provide capital, um, you know, a CapEx, OpEx table to show how our projects can break down. And we might actually help our business partners think of new and different ways that they can use funding that they may already have access to. Um, Sorry. On the um, on the other side of, of it, we often just say, hey, we have project costs and this is, you know, what our teams are doing. We just lump it all as project costs and, you know, maybe it includes something like development costs and infrastructure, but it also should include maintenance and growth costs and data acquisitions and change management. And some of you might be saying, whoa, we don't want to tell the business all that up front. We'll never get approved for anything. The thing is, if we begin to illustrate out, okay, over time, our maintenance is going to be this, but by implementing this foundational piece, it reduces to this. Let's look a little bit further out in terms of how we think about our costing. And also, you know, the, the change management discussion, if we don't start having it at the project funding level, we're never going to make it happen. Uh, Data-driven cultures will still only exist in more of the startup companies, um, versus those that are already underway. So a few tips here, uh, you know, corporate accounting. Uh, if you don't know much about accounting, spend a little time getting to know accountant, either internally or externally to your organization, and talk in terms of balance sheets, not P&Ls. And by that, I mean, think of the longer term benefit in terms of what you're building and investing in that can be foundational to the company over time so that the accounting team can make the appropriate considerations there. Um, use hidden costs to your advantage as we were talking about. You know, think about ways that you can articulate, hey, this is one step towards, you know, maybe it's a legacy retirement or maybe it's something that you can do that doesn't impact any of the systems, right? But is going to give you better quality data and um, a better understanding through observability that you've never had before. Think about these things that um, are hidden costs that the business is already paying for that you're going to help alleviate. Um, think in terms of full cycle. So, uh, make your MVP foundational. And one of the things I like to do with all of the clients that I've worked with is say, okay, what's that pressing problem that you need to solve right now? And how, um, how are you going to go about it? And what is meaningful to the business? So you can build any model under the sun, right? You can use IMDB data. I see that a lot. Um, but it's not meaningful to the business, right? So what is the problem you can solve for? Maybe it's a problem in profitability or in customer experience. And then uh, finally, thinking about the full um, life cycle, think about ongoing model changes and how you're going to need to address those. So you're going to, you know, whatever you're doing is step one of probably many different things. So be transparent about that up front so that you can say, hey, this is a foundational cost now and it's a little bit higher. But the next step is even bigger corporate goal, right? And we'll already have this foundation in place. So the subsequent projects are going to get smaller and faster over time. And then finally, um, be sure to include those change management costs and opportunities. This is the number one reason we're seeing data mesh and data fabric um, implementations fail is the lack of change management. We think it's just a matter of going in and putting architecture in 
Um, but there's a lot that needs to take place. Everything from how we're thinking about delivering the projects as a data team and using agile methodologies when some data teams may not have been exposed to that yet, to how business executives are using and talking about data. This is a major change in a cultural shift and we need to plan accordingly for it to be able to be successful. So coming back full circle, um, the AI ROI equation, it's a work in progress, you guys. So feel free to laugh at me if you want, but this is kind of where my thought structure is going right now. And what I'm testing out is that the returns of, on foundation need to include strategy and benefits. They need to be both in terms of the immediate outcomes that we have and the foundational pieces that we're building for the future. And so we actually have a bigger investment opportunity um, for the business than we've been articulating in the past. We've done a bad job of, of being able to tell the business how much further we can go with our technology. Um, I've included in here a really brief uh, cheat sheet of some of the things I've learned along the way. So feel free to use it, feel free to add to it, and I welcome any questions, feedback, um, or anything else. So thank you for the time. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, I have a question, and then we'll take it to the audience. Um, my first question is, is Talking about money is always such a touchy subject when you're when you're going in to talk to a new customer. It's almost like, you know, everybody just loves each other and we're not talking about anybody actually working for a living yet. What's what's what do you do to kind of get a feel for what ballpark their budget might be in? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a great one. And there's all kinds of, of tricks you can do it. It it almost comes almost more to a, like a sales tactic, right? To figure out. What are your motivations and where does the funding come from? I think it depends on the organization, to be honest. In some organizations, um, you know, it's very clear where the priorities are and what the funding pots are and who to go to. In other organizations, like a certain financial technology company that I worked for in the past, it's just, a, a, you know, a sea of craziness. And you don't know who's going to approve what, and it can happen at any level. So the number one thing to do, I think, is one, be sure of what you want to do. And then two, shop your idea around. Um, or if it's, you know, if you're working with a client who already has an idea, get in and understand the business, the players, and, and who will really benefit the most um, from the technology that's that's going to be delivered. And, and think not only in terms of engineers and analysts, but also in terms of business outcomes. I think you're on mute, Karen. Hey, thank you. It would seem even just having the conversation about ROI would help lead things in the right direction that there is going to be an investment yeah. uh, made that there's going to be a return on and it's uh, not just a free uh, training. Um, okay. Are there more questions from the, from the audience? This is a really important topic, you know, because if, if you're not uh, charging, then that means you're a volunteer. <laughs> so I would, you know, uh, follow up with Kim and, and get some tips on, on showing your customers ROI. Any questions? Okay. Um, I thought it was uh, I thought it was very interesting uh, that you mentioned the uh, corporate accounting side of it. I think that's like we miss that a lot on the data side of of speaking that common language and having that same playbook in hand. Uh, what brought you to um, specifically point that out in bold it? Yeah, um, it actually comes from experience of a lot of failed opportunities on my part. So a lot of times data initiatives can be looked at just as operating expense. And that's the first place that every corporation is trying to cut, right? Operating expenses because they're ongoing. Um, when I started putting project plans together and, and looking for ways to capitalize, what I found is a lot of our technology is actually capitalizable. It can be IP, it can be strategic investments, but we just didn't know how to say it, right? And so that's that's kind of where it came from. The, the world of hard knocks is where it came from. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's a great point. And I think just having a, a very basic rundown of, of corporate finance is really important for talking to people with that about that sort of value proposition. Uh, again, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you. What other questions do we uh, have for Kim? We have a suggestion that uh, Tish invites you on her show. Uh, Tish Talks Tech, our celebrity that's in our midst. <laughs> um, if you haven't seen Tish, Talk, Tish Talks Tech, say that five times fast. Uh, <laughs> but you should. You should definitely tune into Tish. Um, Orson, did you have any questions or anything? No, I just want to ask him. Well, I heard her mention that she had been with one of the big three pharmaceutical companies. How do you see what you just presented to us? How would that help hinder or, or work with some of those companies like that? Because since yeah. they are affecting so many sectors, what do you, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. What I find with the larger companies is business cases tend to get pulled together from a lot of different things, right? So let's say that we're working on just a, an AI initiative. We have an exciting new idea. A lot of times it's going to get lumped into a bigger strategy or a bigger idea. Um, and some of those have like year or multi-year spans before you can show a return on investment. So one of the things that has been really successful for myself and others in the consulting realm is to very quickly, like I was saying, determine something that can show immediate value to the business so you can break out from those bigger projects that are going to drag on and on and on. So um, it, it's just a tip or a trick. It doesn't always work, right? But uh, I think that's one of the ways that we can really begin to make a difference. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Anything else? Thank you. We have a lot of comments. And we have a comment from Tish. Uh, uh, she said she would love to have you <laughs> on her show. So there's a follow-up point for you. For you both. Uh, we also have another question. Uh, Kim, what do you think about Agile and specific Agile in data? Yeah, um, I, I think we have a ways to go. We've got a ways to go. So one, I think we're getting there and everyone has their own version of Agile, right? And, and sometimes I feel like it's almost overhyped in the data world. There are a lot of data engineers that know and have been working with Agile for a long time. On the data science side of things, um, you know, yeah, we have a long, long way to go. The, the team I was leading at a FinTech, for example, that I inherited, I got an intelligence automation team, and most of them had never worked in an agile environment because they were data scientists. Um, and so it was, it, was a large, um, it was a large undertaking to get everyone on the same page from a delivery standpoint. I don't think we have to overdo it and go all the way back to, you know, Agile 101 and the manifestos, but I think there's an opportunity for a new type of Agile manifesto in the data space. In fact, something that we've been playing around in the background with the Via Data. Really interesting. I've always found Agile kind of comforting as a developer. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think most of us do. And then, you know, we, we, we run into the waterfall of um, some of what's happening with especially large organizations like the the big pharma, for example, where folks are spending a lot of time just pulling down the data, cleaning it, storing it in, in central repositories that nobody else can get to except for the few people on their team and not sharing the context across. And there's just so much time and space being lost. And it's all in this waterfall manner that it just blows our minds if we've been in Agile for wow. a while. I agree with you on the comfort levels, but we're definitely not there yet, um, but I think it has to be approached with caution, right? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kim. We really enjoyed your presentation and make sure you get your uh, your uh, uh, questions into Kim on in the chat and also or in Slack also and, uh, and keep an eye out for her on Tish Talks Tech. That's right. So now, Karen, who's next? Who's Who our next guest? I don't know, but I think they better wipe the pie off their mouths. <laughs> oh, they were just canceled. They were just canceled. <laughs> just canceled. Oh. Well, I'll go enjoy my pie. Key lime. We've got key lime pie here in Northwest Arkansas. How's Northwest Arkansas sound? And now, JGP. <laughs> um, so, uh, the next, uh, uh, the next guest is us, Orson oh. and I. We are the next presenters. Right on time. Right on time. And uh, we are going to, uh, um, you know, we've really got some tough acts to follow. Um, and, you know, I, I sat up listening all night to this. 
and well, not all night. I fell asleep for a while and I thought, well, I just dreamed how to do vectorization on a mainframe. And then I got up and I found out I didn't dream it. Someone was on there explaining it. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I did learn something wonderful and made a new friend. And I'm going to pull up our share. slides. Yes, I am. Well, our wonderful topic. So let me share my screen. We thank okay, you let me again. pull up my slides and we'll see how well my technical skills are here now. I'm going to share my screen. See if I can share my slides. I don't see them. I might have to share my whole desktop. And then, okay, somebody's going to have to tell me if they can see the slides here. I can't hear. Is anybody there still? Yes, you can hear me and you can see me. Great. Okay. Great. All right. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm Karen Kilroy, uh, and I am with a file baby. I'm also an author, and I'll talk about that later. I'm here with the esteemed Orson Weems, who is president of File Baby. Thank you. Thank you. We're excited to be here. Very excited to be here to make this presentation that uh, we put together to present on AI Pi Day. This is wonderful. With that, you want to tell them about your topic and our topic so we can uh, just give a little good information about some of this in this time frame. Sure. Um, our topic is the depeopling, the depeopling of the of the white collar workforce, and uh, the. It sounds kind of a uh, like a, a negative topic, but it's really not. There's there's lots of new opportunities coming, and we're going to address that as we go on. Um, I, I chose origami for the for the motif for this, uh, primarily because that's kind of what AI is like. It's like we've got all these beautiful origami papers and they can be yeah. folded into shapes and made into things and so fast that we don't even uh, know uh, you know what's happening. and and so, that's kind of our theme in our presentation is, is things happening so fast that people don't realize uh, what's going on. Uh, and we'll talk about how all, a lot of the AI is coming into offices under the radar, which is causing a quiet shift and impacting a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, it's created a, a new frontier uh, for a gig economy uh, related to AI. And, uh, and a lot of the work that people were doing before, uh, we're gonna talk about how that could become part of a gig economy. We're gonna talk about File Baby, which you may have gotten a, a hint that uh, we, were, <laughs> we were here to talk about File Baby. Uh, I am a software developer and I built File Baby and, and uh, Orson's here to help me uh, tell you all about it. And Orson is a File Baby user as well. And uh, and so then we'll talk about why we built File Baby and what it does, and then uh, then I'm going to show you a little bit of this, and then uh, and then uh, I'll I'll do a little demonstration of File Baby, and then uh, we're going to tell you about a special deal that you can get on File Baby. Um, then well, time permitting, we'll we'll talk to it a little bit more about the metas metamorphosis, the ethics. Uh, that are involved in this and uh, looking ahead, and then we'll talk about books. So uh, that's our agenda. So under the radar changes, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but the AI changes are subtle. They're coming and they're subtle. And a big reason that they're subtle is because they are, the AI tools are being built in to normal office tools. That's correct. I was looking at and saw a news story yesterday about an article that came out on the Washington Post. And as the uh, author of the article was talking about an op-ed, he mentioned that uh, the AI has been used in the U.S. government for a long time. And one particular area is one that we are all going to deal with very soon is the IRS. And he mentioned that a large percentage of the IRS uses AI and people really don't think about that it's AI driven, whether it's taking their taxes or giving them an answer on a question that they have. It's generated by an AI response. So what we're looking at, and when you say this, it's under the radar. 
a lot of the tools have already been built into things that we use every day and people don't realize it. So we have things that uh, are, we're seeing in education, we're seeing things in the legal field, we're seeing things in film and in movie industries and all of these different areas that we look at and see that people contact us about some of the things that you've built like Foul Baby. We're seeing this and now it's been implemented into uh, museums. It's been in, uh, to show you how to position a picture on the wall or what that picture might look like. So these are some of the things you're talking about under the radar, but it's something that's used every day right now. Yes, yes. And, and another example of that would be uh, like office suite products or, uh, or CRMs, uh, 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 ERP systems. Uh, those types of things uh, have AI agent capabilities built into them now. And I liken it to when spreadsheets came into offices, uh, which been a couple of years ago. <laughs> when I started my career, that was one of the first things was, uh, was Lotus Notes and Excel. And all of a sudden, you had uh, people who were uh, maybe, you know, normal workers, they, they carried a normal workload. And then you gave them a power tool like Excel, especially with pivot tables. They were a beast, right? All of a sudden they were a beast and they could automate the heck out of everything. And, and, and now you've got Barb running the whole marketing department. And if Barb ever left, it would all fall apart because she's the only one that knows anything that's going on. And see, the reason I know about about the power users is because I used to do support mm -hmm. at the beginning of my career. Uh, I had to go install Barb's monitor and it was like <laughs> 25 inches of a giant buckled my knees. So right there, you see this, that once, and, and the thing is with why it's under the radar is a lot of the CEOs are still deciding if they want AI or so, not. And that's again, while Barb is cranking it out. Right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and so what we see is, the again the advance in the movement toward the topic the depeopling yes the AIs can do so many different functions that uh, normal people and AI doesn't sleep <laughs> AI doesn't, doesn't one sleep one of our speakers earlier today was talking and mentioned you know it doesn't get fatigued it works a hundred some of the increases that they saw using their their systems I think that was uh, AI gene. Uh, that mentioned that they saw 140% increases over things that humans were doing compared to what some of the applications were using with AI, which is just fantastic. It, it always moves. You can always expect it to work. And uh, it, I'm sure people are going to save. We will see people and companies and organizations save quite a bit, but we still got to work with how to make the human part of it. Yeah, the human part of it. So there's a quiet shift. And, and uh, some companies are saying we're laying off because of AI. Some people are saying we're laying off because of shifting business needs. Some people are saying we're laying off our tech people who aren't AI because we're putting all our money in AI. But things are changing. Uh, Klarna came out uh, the other day and they actually said the, the quiet part out loud. Uh, they said that they were laying off, was it? 200 people, I can't remember if it was two hundreds. or four, hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of people, uh, and they were being replaced by AI. They, they actually said it. Uh, UPS made a similar statement and then walked it back. So how does this impact people? Uh, well, we saw uh, in some of the reading that we do and I, that I do, I saw a quote that said, AI won't replace people but someone using AI will replace people and reduce staffs, uh, utilize the, the tools that can be built, customly built for whether it's some type of an enterprise system or something to do some other function. And we're, we're going to see that. That's an impact of humans so that we see that people want to work. They want to have their, their paychecks come in. But when we start seeing some of the things that uh, we can't see AI is um, addressing, if you will. We see that that human impact is how do some people feel. Some people love AI. Some people are hesitant to give an answer because they don't know how it will affect them. But we want to know 
And we've seen that the impact of humans can be on either side of the fence of this. AI is good, AI is bad. But one thing that uh, I learned early on coming to some of your seminars, Karen, is that, uh, again, put good things in to AI, good things come out. We put bad things in, bad things come out. So we want to, of course, promote, as we do, promote responsible AI. And that we want to make sure that it can impact humans in a positive way. Yes. And, and there's a common interest that Orson and I have is seeing people get to work. Um, when I first met Orson, um, it was at the Fayetteville Public Library Center for, for Innovation and where I was promoting my book, Shameless Book Plug. <laughs> um, I was promoting my book, Blockchain Tethered AI, and I was giving some workshops uh, questioning the very things that we're talking about today. What's going to happen once the jobs start to disappear and and what can we do to reposition ourselves? And Orson was there and he was in attendance. And uh, Orson also puts on workshops at the library uh, with his nonprofit organization, the Music, Music Education Initiative. And uh, he was teaching people how to get to work as stagehands. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, wow, what a great uh, person to bring in on this to help figure out how we're going to pivot yes. work yes. in general. And, you know, what we're looking at is the way to address offering something when something's taken away. How do you make it win-win for all parties involved? And some of the things we ended up with was that social and corporate responsibility to, to say how AI can actually help people by. We know that these large language models need information and content, and we wanted to address it by allowing folks to be in a position to share some type of content that they have where it makes an impact where um, they can tell a story and uh, use that story for to uh, either get purchased by a, a large language model or company that they can tell stories so they can continually feed these large language models. And that's something that we all talked about that it can help because there's so many stories out here that have so not many. been on the internet that are not on the internet yet. And so the internet hasn't broken at all. There's so many wonderful stories that people can continue because things happen every day that we can feed these models with to help impact people. You want to explain that a little bit more on sure. what that means? Sure. Um, just to back up a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, I, I AI models uh, need training data. They need they need human uh, generated training data. If if they try to train with artificial data, then after just a handful of training cycles, the models start to collapse upon themselves, and so they they need our input. And um, we really have you know there's a lot of information that's on the internet. You know to us it just seems so vast. But there's way more that isn't on the internet. Yes. And if we can tap into that uh, feed of data that is not yet on the internet and help folks bring their stories, bring their artwork, bring their recipes, bring their bring their craft yes. to AI training data to sell, so so AI models can compete based on having fresh, responsible training data. It could it could make a big difference, and, and one one instance of that that we talked about were veterans. Yes, uh, how many veterans uh, are how hard on their luck, but have stories to tell, and how many people are interested in hearing those stories? You know, there's quite a big match up there, mm -hmm. and and so um, people who are experiencing homelessness is another group of people who have some amazing stories to tell. So this is part of that new frontier that you talked about. This is some things that we want to share so that we can all think collectively and come up with solutions. And we've come up with these solutions. This is one of our solutions is to what we're just talking about now, how to use these stories, et cetera, so that we can move on to create another economy. Yes. As you talk about the next slide. The gig I'm, economy. Right. We're, we're all familiar with the gig economy now where, uh, Uber and Lyft and uh, and uh, delivering DoorDash, and DoorDash delivering for right. Walmart, on and on. Uh, you know, there's a lot of advantages to the gig economy because people have freedom, right? That's the other side of the coin. And 
and seeing, you know, we've talked about, oh, the jobs will be gone, but guess what? The rat race will be gone too. <laughs> so if we play our cards right, we could end up having some pretty happy lives out of this. But, but what we don't want to do is let the AI industry just cannibalize the human beings uh, right, right out of their, their living without something coming back to them. That's right. We, we want to see. And uh, again, from a lot of my, my life experiences and all, we want to see hope for those that think there's hopelessness. And we want to provide that. And this gig economy situation, however it has come about, because I never would have thought in my life where I could just pick up my phone and just dial and have a car come pick me up. <laughs> you know, Uber and Lyft, mm -hmm. or just say, oh, I'm, I'm hungry or something and dial up and see this thing's happening and somebody's there or have my groceries delivered at Walmart Plus or any of these different grocery services. I never thought about that. But again, it's something, uh, uh, it was a necessity. It was a need to fill that void of what had happened. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that uh, people thought a lot of different ways. Just when we had the pandemic, we had folks around. I've never been through anything like that, but now we're seeing something else coming in and it's AI is the buzzword. But so now let's utilize our thoughts, our collective abilities to create something that came out that can come out and be very helpful. And I think this, this is some of the things we're going to create. This gig economy is another program and project that we have upcoming that we'll share with uh, how to address some of the things like the veteran stories or talking about a, a grandmother or auntie's recipe or something of that nature. We have that. If there's someone that wrote a thesis that they want to talk about and they don't, they want it out there, we can deal with all of these different things. And, you know, we want to address these things because that's content that can feed these models. Yes. And, and, the, and the vision is to have the, have the uh, demand communicated to the people who are supplying the work. So you could, you could uh, open up your app and say, oh, look, you know, they want, they're paying $20 for war stories today. Uh, and they're paying uh, $30 for watercolor paintings. Why don't I go make $50 and, and take care of this bill? So that could be the way that things shift. And we're really hoping that we can um, help uh, help folks because, uh, especially by working with large partners, and and we're going to you know approach some mega stores that are in our uh, in our geographical region here in Northwest yeah. Arkansas about uh, potentially partnering with us on on helping folks have a place to go in and tell their story or do their artwork and then walk out with money, uh, maybe walk out with a, you know a card for groceries. So that's how uh, things are starting to shift now. So this is what led to File Baby. Yes. This is what led to File Baby was this discussion that we, you know, the discussion that you've heard us have this morning. We we had this discussion through several workshops at the public library. And so we decided, well, what are we going to do about it? And and uh, another partner of ours, we've got two other business partners in File Baby, us. Uh, Scott Harris, who's an uh, executive project manager who has just retired from 39 years at IBM. And then we have Ethan Keel, who is a senior data scientist, and he's currently at Walmart and with us part time. And, uh, and so uh, we talked, well, what do we do? How do we solve this? And we came up with File Baby. Now, what File Baby does is it implements the standards that were put forward by a group called C2PA and, and a subgroup called the uh, Content Authenticity Initiative. And there's another subgroup involved also called Project Origin, which also is part of C2PA. These folks have worked for years on content provenance. Yes. And the reason well, it had nothing to do with AI, nothing to do with it. You know what the reason was, Orson? You better tell me. You know. <laughs> it, was, it was to prove the uh, fake news, whether it was real or not. And so they made it so you can peek inside of a file that has these credentials associated with it, and you can see who created the file. You can see what they use. If it's Photoshop, you can see what edits they made. Um, you, can, uh, you can tell, like, if it's an AI uh, created file, you can tell what model created it. 
and and so forth. And so that's what um, uh, Content Authenticity Initiative and C2PA are. C2PA creates the tooling uh, for the content and the and the standards for Content Authenticity Initiative. Anybody can join these uh, organizations. And then also uh, the CR symbol that you see up here, and you and you see I've got it on my on my sweater too. Um, what this is is this is a, a content credentials uh, logo that pops up it, uh, using certain tools if a file has credentials associated with it. And I'm going to show you an example of what those uh, what those credentials look like. Um, and there's a um, there's a Google uh, uh, I'm sorry, there's a Google Chrome extension built by Digimark that will help you uh, right click on an image and be able to tell whether or not it has content credentials. So with that, I'm going to give you a little demonstration and I'm going to pull up, hang on, I'm going to email. Um, I'm going to pull up file baby. And uh, actually, I'm going to pull up a gallery that I pre-made. It's like the like the uh, like the cake in the oven. Um, let's see. Uh, hang on a second. Sorry, I need my I need my URL. <laughs> Excuse me for a moment. Now you know all my secrets. Uh, here it is. Okay. So what I've got here, these pictures might look uh, familiar to you because they are some of the same images that I used in this presentation. And what I've done is I've uh, claimed them in FileBaby using C2PA uh, tooling standards uh that's uh i what i did when we, when we first started looking at c2pa um the tools are all complicated because they're all command line tools and and software development kits so there wasn't really anything drag and drop or easy to learn and explore these tools and and, and even though i'm a developer you know, i wanted orson to be able to do it yeah. and and then also too, you know, who wants to to be a developer twenty four seven when you can just drag and drop things and not think about it? So so that's how we came up with File Baby uh, with the interface. Now, uh, in this particular case, I've got these images that were all generated by uh, Gen AI, and if I click verify, what it's going to do is it's going to pull this image actually into the content credentials verifier. And I started to talk about uh, content credentials and C2PA. The, the companies that are involved in that are, um, are uh, Adobe, Microsoft, OpenAI, Google, uh, Publis Group, um, who? BBC, BBC yeah. <laughs> New York Times, yeah. Panasonic, Leica, yeah. Nikon, and the list grows every day. And so, uh, so the, there's quite a few people that are into the standard. Now you can see here, I pulled up this image and it tells me, and this is very recent that OpenAI started supporting it. It tells me here that chat GPT was used to generate this image. And, it, and this was issued by OpenAI on March 13th. And then if I drill down a little further, it says, oh, well, wait a minute, it used DALI. So I can tell how chat GPT generated this image. If I wanted to search for other images that were similar, I could I could do that as well. Um, I could also, if there were changes between the two images, I could compare them and uh, and use a slider me, to inspect the changes. Let me say what's very important about some of that that you just pulled up was the that provenance of it also was the time that is very critical, the timing that it showed, the date. You can go into really good details about that because that's something that we found out in dealing with Foul Baby is that provenance and that authenticity. So we know it's already told us how and when, but when we're dealing with people that are creators themselves, it, they will show, it will show their names. It will show when they uploaded it. It gives them all the details on the manifest itself. So you wanna show them uh, the, the next picture. 
Oh, the next I'm picture. At our time. Yeah, I was going to go uh, talk about the the deal we've got for them. Oh, yeah. um, this one is similar. Now, this all can be different depending on the type of content. Yes. Uh, uh, if you know, hit me up afterwards, I can show you uh, what the how the BBC recently implemented it to to show uh, authenticity on on videos. Um, but uh, at any rate, yeah, this is. Uh, this is the verifier. So um, what I want to show you in the slides here, let's see, hang on, get back to my slides. Okay, and um, we have, as you can see, there's a lot to unpack in, uh, in the C2PA tool and the, uh, the content authenticity initiative. Um, there's no blockchain involved, but it is blockchain ready. Um, the, the, what I showed you there, uh, in addition to claim in the file, it also does a hash uh, that, it, that it, you can be used to check for tampering. Uh, and so that's built into it also. And what I've done with File Baby is implemented all those tools into a point and click interface. And right now today, Orson, we have a deal for our Wonderful. friends, don't we? Just for AI Pi Day. For AI Pi Day. 50% off for all of our content creators out there that can use this to protect their content, protect what's theirs. This is theirs. We don't want AI to consume it. We want to use it properly. That's I didn't awesome. mention that, That's that, right. that when you clean your own content, and the examples I showed you, I cleaned uh, content that was generated by an AI. But yes. let's say, what if I took a picture of us and then wanted to claim that? That's so. Right. So I would put my own credentials. Put in our there. own credentials, and that way, if someone liked our picture and wanted to uh, ask us how to use it, they can contact us. And it, AI couldn't absorb it because we would put on there not to use for AI training. Do not use for AI training, right. and and we've we've tested that successfully on Firefly uh, when uh, Scott Harris, who I mentioned uh, as our executive uh, project director, our XIBMer. Uh, when he joined, he he gave me his picture. I asked him for a, a, a picture of a, a headshot just at the last second. Scott, I need your picture. He sent me something that was photo stamp sized. And I thought, hmm, what a good chance to try generative AI. Let me see if I can fix it. Yeah. I dropped it in to uh, Firefly. And first it put his face on a statue, put him on like with the Mona Lisa. And I was like, no, no. Person. Yeah. yeah, so, but I did notice that it said checking for content credentials when I dropped this picture in. So I thought, well, let me check with one that I I know with Ethan's picture, but I've said do not use for AI training and it rejected it. It wouldn't take it. That's right. That's right. Well, literally for Pi Day, if you use the, the discount code AI Pi Day 50, we will offer 50% off of file baby subscriptions. This is a really great deal because I can assure you that there are creators out there that would love to protect their content, their writings, their legal papers, uh, any type of videos. And I mean, we go from video uploads, music, MP3s, any of these different lyrics that it's worth the amount of 50% off, and you all want to utilize this. So share it with your friends. Tell people about it. We want to help and be a solution to uh, people being hesitant. And sometimes people don't know that their content has even been used, utilized. But what I'd like to do is open up for a question right before we get off the air, Karen. Any questions? You see any Do we have any questions for Orson and, and myself? Any questions at all? Yeah, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, I think it's I think it's quite interesting um, where you are uh, geographically and how that affects your work. Um, uh, a lot of the other uh, participants here and are are in uh, very densely. A lot of them that I've seen are in densely populated uh, urban areas. Sounds like you're in uh, Northwest Arkansas. Was that like the Fayette, Fayetteville area or sort yeah. of? Uh, to that or yeah, that's part of that region. Yes. Yeah. And so how do you think that that, that uh, surrounding culture affects your work? Oh, it's exciting because 
when we're here, we have some of the largest Fortune 500 companies right here in this little concentrated area. And the, the largest retailer in the world exists here literally 10 minutes from where we sit. And the innovations and the things that we do from here and that we can offer, it's really exciting. Uh, we have uh, like the Northwest Arkansas Tech Summit that'll be later this year. Uh, it's generated a lot of interest for VCs to come here. Uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of direct flights here that people really don't know about. So we're waiting for folks like you to come and join us and, and, and Jean, Jean George, come on. <laughs> so we're really excited to have that. So we have a lot, it, it really helps us to offer incredible uh, projects and, and solutions that we have upcoming right now. All right. Yeah, great companies here. A lot of lot of vendors to support hmm. a lot of these different areas here. That's quite interesting. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much, you. everybody. And uh, and we'll also be around later for the fireside chat. And right now we're gonna go with go to Chris Foyer. Um, Chris Foyer is coming to us from Wisconsin. And uh, uh, that's a that's a great uh, point. It's actually the country Denmark. Not the not the town in Wisconsin, but I, I appreciate it. Oh, oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> so it, it, it happens. It happens quite often. It's OK. Well, well, welcome. Coming in loud and clear from Denmark. Thank you. And your uh, topic is data contracts bring us together, improving access and understanding through interfaces. Yeah. Just brought us together. Now we are ready. Thanks. Good. Take Perfect. it away, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, it is it's such a pleasure uh, being able to talk to everyone here, and um, like we like we said earlier, here I just want to make sure that I have the right screens going on. That's all right with you all. And then I'm just going to switch these around. All right. Um, so. Like they said, my name is Chris. I am uh, living and working in Denmark, a company called uh, Systematic. Um, and I want to talk about how we can use data contracts, not only as a, a larger architectural feature to uh, bring us together and remove silos, but more on that personal and one team to another level, how we can use data contracts to bring data generators and data consumers together. Um, but first, I want to provide a bit of context as to uh, what I do professionally. So here's a scene from a hospital <clears throat> um, that uh, actually happens quite a lot in uh, a lot of different countries uh, that we don't quite see as patients. It's a lot of Excuse medical me. staff. Yes. Chris? Are we supposed yes. to see your screen? I I assume so, and I'm we don't. probably missing. I don't something. think we do. I don't see it. All right. I'm sorry. Thank you for brother. letting me know. I I appreciate sure. that. Let's see here. How about? How how is this looking? Are you able to see this? Um. Not yet. Nothing's coming yet. No. All right. Let me see what I can do about this. Just give me a quick moment. Um, while I figure sure. out the... Uh, Just ah. take a second, Chris. I can talk to him for a minute. Appreciate um, that. Sure. Um, well, while Chris is, is, is setting up his uh, technical issues and he's working through those, uh, I'm going to talk to you again about my book, uh, Blockchain Tethered AI. And it has a quote on the back of it from Jean-Georges Perrin. AI is a superhero toddler. Without meaning harm, its laser eyes could reduce a city to ashes. The solution? Make sure the toddler does not have a tantrum in Times Square. This hands-on book describes the solution precisely and pragmatically. Jean-Georges Perrin. And it looks like we're ready. Right on. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Great. Um, so um, we were talking a little bit about uh, how what I'm, I'm going to discuss how it brings us together, both the data generators and data consumers. And I was first going to give a, a bit of uh, context as to uh, the field I'm working in. 
So uh, this is a common scene from a lot of hospitals. A lot of uh, medical staff gathered around uh, looking at some different numbers and aggregate statistics and and so on. And this is great when it's working, right? They, they can see um, some summaries that help break down that chaos that's very common, not only in emergency departments, but other bed wards as well. And, um, and then all of a sudden, a keen observer looks at a number and says, hey, wait a minute, that, that number hasn't changed in three hours, and we've had a lot of patients come here, come through here. What's going on? And then comes me. It's 3 a.m., and you get a phone call in the middle of the night. Hey, the data's down. Our data model isn't working. The, the whole data orchestration is down. The pipeline isn't working. The web app is up, blah, blah, blah. Right. And these data downtimes, they're very frustrating, right? It's it's hard to resolve and it's very costly, not only from a uh, uh, branding perspective, a reliability perspective, but just down to the brass tacks. You get you start to get the lawyers involved because you've broken some part of the contract that said that, oh, there was only going to be this amount of downtime. It's a very expensive affair. And before we get to the solution, I uh, just want to bring up in a broader context what my uh, company does. The reason why we're able to work with hospitals is because the company I work for works with a lot of different mission critical software. Um, so our, our the biggest uh, group in my company, the biggest business unit in my company is working in defense, uh, working in command and control solutions, um, which, which I colloquially describe as uh, helping people with their current operational picture, seeing what's happening on the ground and being able to uh, communicate between different teams. Uh, then we have healthcare, which I'm a part of, but uh, we also work with some additional things, uh, a lot of digitalization projects, uh, but we also uh, run a lot of the uh, IT components for the libraries, not only nationally within Denmark, um, but for other countries as well. Uh, within the healthcare, uh, business unit. Uh, I work with a suite of products called Columna Flow. And instead of giving sort of the, the elevator pitch that, that's more focused on sales, I really want to I really want to bring this to a level where we're just talking as colleagues, right? And so instead, what I want to describe is I want to describe how Columna Flow works for this guy. His name is Kit. Kit is a Porter in Albor. Albor is a uh, large town on the north of Denmark. And what he does as a porter is he brings patients from A to B. He also, as you can see in the picture, he's uh, bringing some meals to a floor. He moves around uh, different hospital equipment. And um, throughout his day, he helps a lot of people uh, get to where they need to be by helping them find their work. And what he does, instead of getting phone calls or getting the walkie-talkie uh, back in the day, now he has an application in his hand where he can pick up tasks and uh, move them along, choose the one he wants. As we can see in this picture in particular, we can see some different task priorities. These are some, some, some different things within this uh, Columna flow. It's a tasking software that lets people uh, choose their tasks, and through that application, there's a lot of metadata that's being generated. For our American audiences, um, I can I can absolutely understand if you haven't heard about this before. Also, for our European audiences, it's not it's not too uh, too out there in terms of the branding, um, but it is deployed in 55 different hospitals uh, with an approximate patient reach of about nine million currently. Um, and so this, this application has been running for some time. We've discussed how it's generating quite a bit of metadata. And um, in this current moment, there's a lot of interest, especially in the higher levels of leadership, of building data products upon these existing operational products, especially in these mission-critical fields uh, that my company is working with. So uh, as a result, uh, we have been working on a 
um, a product, a data analysis uh, add-on, if you will, that helps these pullers. Um, and without going into too much detail, um, essentially we've, we're creating this uh, web app here that helps them reduce their bottlenecks and helps the, helps the porters help others and be good colleagues by asking the question, which teams are struggling right now? Where can I help? And this was working. This was working for some time. This was, this was working well with that early scenario that we talked about of uh, being in that, that hospital setting and helping that communication, but without a meaningful interface to that original source application, um, we were setting ourselves up for a lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of data downtime vulnerabilities, things change, maybe we don't have the right possible values and so on. So we were, we, we were as decoupled as possible with that other team as we could, and we were suffering the consequences of it. So to help understand where that interface can go wrong, let's take a look at the, at the architectural model. So without going into too much detail, what I really want to focus in here on is how a lot of these uh, data engineering projects are working. Uh, here we have a, here are different sources of uh, data. We're looking at that task management application, a few other applications here. And what we're doing is we're pulling all of those into a data warehouse, into an ETL process, right? And we are trying to, trying to limit that connection as much as possible, which on paper sounds good. It's all about the decoupling, the, the inversion of dependency, and you know all those solid principles that the software engineers uh, were taught. And that's you know that's really great. But without that defined interface, having this was our primary weak link. The architecture that we controlled ourselves, uh, we knew exactly where things were supposed to go, and everything was. You know, fine and dandy there, but having those dependencies on other teams without explicitly defining them was causing us real problems. And I want to I want to break down uh, exactly the root of those problems. And the biggest one is that it just wasn't made for consumption. The reason that these operational databases exist is to support that source application. Um, it's denorm it's uh, uh, normalized into the third form uh, for the sake of quick retrieval and quick writing. Um, and these things make really good sense for the source application when you're running a CRUD application. But when we were uh, consuming it in the data engineering team making this data analysis uh, add-on, it wasn't it wasn't suitable for our needs and it wasn't defined uh, in a way that that made the requirements clear for the data that we were consuming, right? And in addition to just having a static application that could be challenging, this was an application that was developing not only with different versions over time, but with the the all of those different deployment environments and all of those different versions um, we're dealing with it's it becomes a very complex situation to um, to not define. So um, with that problem in mind, the solution that um, that I looked into and uh, and that really great information was made available was this uh, concept of data contracts, right? So we had that very weak and challenging interface and data contracts was a it's a topic that that is uh, very well studied and uh, very hot at the moment in data engineering and what it promised was okay work through this work through this framework and we can work together to define the interface we can work together to uh, specify the quality of the data that's going to be generated and um, what was most important for us was it defined a meaningful uh, way to migrate in our data product when changes were made, when breaking changes were made in the source application, right? We're going to discuss how that is through talking about the different components of the data contract, but 
this was a really critical uh, moment for, for my team of finding this and then investing uh, the time to put into it. Because defining that interface is not only the way that you can stabilize your current work, but by defining that interface, we were able to catch those breaking changes before they came like a wrecking ball through our uh, data pipeline, we were able to uh, mitigate for those migrations ahead of time so that we could better meet those service level agreements that we've made with, uh, within the contracts with our customers. So um, let's, let's now take a look at how the data contract is defined. And there are some different parts. Uh, but first and foremost, I want to uh, briefly uh, post the link for the open data contract uh, standard uh, in GitHub. I'm, I'm sure that it's been posted uh, earlier today, but you know the people listening always, that's right, that's right. Uh, so um, these are the components of the data contract that are defined by the open data contract standard, which is a, um, a collaborative work done by uh, Bytel. Uh, now, JGP is uh, quite involved in it. I believe he is the chair of the ADA user group, the chairman of the ADA user group, and the exact uh, relation to Bytel is uh, unknown to me. But uh, they, they run this uh, open data contract standard. Um, as a brief aside, uh, JGP, is that an accurate assessment? I, I used to be the president of VITA and I'm a co-founder of VITA user group. Uh, and re regarding, but I stepped down as president and now Stuart Lightdale is president. But I am, um, I am the, the chair of the TSC. So it's an open mm -hmm. standard. So because it's a, it's a Linux Foundation project, okay, so it's just not anything that came from you know my sick mind or something, okay. So it's a it's 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 a Linux Foundation recognize that, and we and we want to we, to be able to normalize data contracts, and to be to to do that, the idea is to create to have a, a technical steering committee, um, which is composed of fifteen ish people. And uh, I'm I'm the chair of this uh, committee. But thanks, Chris, for mentioning all that. Of Let course, of course. And thank you. I apologize for uh, putting you on the spot, but I had to. Uh, I had to know. All right. Um, yeah, and it's um, they actually voted recently, and it's it's great to be uh, a part of that community. I've really enjoyed being uh, a part of that community so far. Anyhow, the components of the the data contract uh, we have the. The demographics, uh, who's this for, and uh, the data sets, which are the, the, for me, it was a very key part of it was defining that schema and the, the type of data. Uh, additionally, we have the data quality, the pricing, the stakeholders, uh, those are the precise people involved, the roles and the service level agreements. Um, but by going through these different parts and their associated fields and values, um, we were we were able to uh, negotiate um, a more well-defined interface that worked for both parties that explicitly defined what we needed while at the same time uh, having an acceptable amount of uh, performance cost on their end. And so uh, being a completionist, um, I took that ball and I was really rolling with it. I, we worked on some tooling to to define the schemas uh, programmatically. I tried to fill out every single field that I could. And I was uh, really working on the scalability of the process, really making it as automated as possible. And I was really investing the time in it. And um, and I, you know, I came out of my cave and I showed I showed the the contract like it was the Ten Commandments to. Uh, to the team that was working on the source application. And what I had just handed them was like 
3,000 lines of a YAML file that they had never seen the format of, right? Um, and so, you know, maybe maybe that isn't the best, uh, maybe that isn't the best way to do things, right? Um, so instead, we we sat down uh, with the work that I that I had already done, and um, we said, okay, but what is it? What is it we actually need to define? What is it that's really important? Um, and they said, okay, we want to know how you're defining the source views. It was a, it's a case where we had to pull. Um, this is data based on these views to, to meet specific uh, data protection requirements. And um, how often are you pulling different, different items? And then how can you measure the performance impact on my database, right? They're very protective over, over their database, which is very understandable. You know, when you're working with uh, data generators and you're a data consumer working on a some uh, when you're a data consumer, we're working on some analysis for them, right? Um, you know, and that was challenging. That was that was challenging to hear that I had worked so hard and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to prove my case and say, ah, but you're not seeing the bigger picture. All of these nine, all of these nine sections that we've just talked about, they're all super important and they're required. You know, we have these required fields. And that's, you know, we need to follow the standard, right? And so I went to, back to some of the foundational texts. And um, earlier today, Andrew gave a great talk. Um, and he has, like he's mentioned in his talk, he's basically, he's written the book on uh, data contracts. And I wanted to read this quote out verbatim that really helped me understand um, the, the correct way to, 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 be, to be working with with this. A data contract is an agreed interface between generators of data and its consumers. It sets the expectations around the data, defines how it should be governed, and facilitates the explicit generation of quality data that meets the business requirements. And within that, you know, it's, it's all about what's being agreed upon to be made explicit, right? And, and enough to meet the business requirements. Right. So from there, um, using a bit of uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, um, what I have found that works best within my organization is to use that open data contract standard as a template for the things that we can work through. Right. And, and having something to work towards to get to that point where we can validate that schema. Um, but it's important to reach out to the people that you need to negotiate this with and define exactly what it is that they want. And you, and I just needed to define my problem. My problem was I, that I was having this data downtime and that we weren't catching these breaking changes, right? So working, just starting with that minimum viable contract and then moving on to reach that standard uh, has worked well for me, although I can understand in other organizations that have a much more mature data ecosystem where data mesh is being implemented, among other things, um, that uh, meeting that standard quickly is very important. But just like JGP has said in chat, the, that evolution is key. Moving to Moving from something that shows value and then moving into something that meets the standard uh, is critical, as opposed to just going straight to the 3000 line YAML file that I made. Um, and those data card, I'll, I'll just talk for about two more minutes and then we'll, uh, we'll dive into some questions. So I'm looking forward to the questions. Uh, these data contracts really critical to that data mesh uh, arch architecture. Um, not only, uh, are we defining those interfaces? I know that's a that's a key phrase that I've been using again and again. But we're also improving resilience and reliability, and it's a it's a core governance mechanism for the uh, data mesh. And lastly, to uh, bring it out of the realm of solely data engineering, but moving it towards the importance for the data scientists, um, 
Some of those benefits include improving the access to data by improving the trust between different parties, um, improving that data model uptime, which is really critical, especially when you're uh, working with mission critical software, but also with uh, contractual obligations. And then like Andrew mentioned earlier, it's about shifting that responsibility left towards the data generators so that they can own that the source of the pipeline that you're working with. And then lastly, it reduces the amount of time that you need to uh, spend on ETL. Uh, ETL makes up an embarrassing majority of the of the time spent on these really exciting projects. And um, let's leave the magic where the magic needs to be. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your time and uh, listening a little bit to uh, my journey with uh, these data contracts. And uh, what questions do you have? Do you have any questions for Chris? So, so I, I, I love to hear your, your story, Chris. Thanks so much for sharing it. It was, well, I've, I've known you, but not knowing you, right? And uh, so, so what's the current status in your company? Did you, did you, did you said, okay, like, I'm going to do very basic data contracts until they may mature a little bit more? What, what's, what's, what's your status now? That's a great question. Um, so what we've been doing is uh, we've been building these additional uh, pipelines on top of our original work. So where the original pipeline was was not in a good place, instead of moving directly over into the one that was repaired by the data contract, we've been building these alternate pipelines that take more and more mature versions of the data contract into account. Um, and so now we've gotten to a place where our pipeline is quite stable, but we're defining more of the metadata that surrounds the contract itself. Uh, we're moving much more to, to a higher level of maturity of integrating our uh, developer portal uh, with the stakeholders and roles within the, within the data contract so that there's a clean line of lineage uh, and we're reducing our bus factor. On the on the product on the project by having these data contracts now, and what I mean by that is that um, if someone were to get hit by a bus, uh, it wouldn't ruin the project, right? Um, and so that's that's been very helpful, um, not just with the interchangeability of staff, um, but more importantly with that with that sense of ownership. Um, and the last place that we've moved to is now that we've. Uh, improved our stability of these pipelines. Uh, we've additionally set up automated tooling to catch these breaking changes, as opposed to a more manual process of run this script. And if you see any changes in the schema, let me know. Where now it's, you know, okay, we've integrated that script into the CI CD pipeline and we're automatically notified of a change. You know, it just, it diffs those two things and then we have a, a schema to compare it to. So that that's sort of the evolution that we we've been working through. And this is this is this is awesome. I, I it's it's a second great news about someone implementing and deploying uh, data contracts today, and, and specifically using ODCS. We had a if you if you see on my LinkedIn, we had a another company in Spain that is actually doing that as well. So. Uh, I'm I'm really excited. It looks like the, the the movement is really is really starting. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, and not only to sort of say like to put capstone on how how great this data contract has solved this specific problem, but it's been a real pleasure to be uh, a part of this community with the ADA user group and more specifically. Uh, those of us working on the open data contract standard. It's it's been really nice and I strongly suggest uh suggest y'all join. If you Thank have you. already. Thank you so much, Chris. That was a great presentation. Had lots of good questions too. And uh we uh it's time now to go to our next speaker and I'm really excited to introduce Fawaz Ghali uh coming to us from Liverpool, England and his topic is boosting similarity search with real-time processing and machine learning. That that sounds really uh, fascinating. Are, are you ready, Falas? Are you ready for us? 
Hey, Karen. Yes. Hi. I don't see your screen. I still see Chris's. Chris, you need one chair. I'll pick the first. Yeah. We have our break music. Yeah. Well, he's getting ready. No Tango Corazon from Little Ye. We don't spare any expense right. here in That's Northwest right. Arkansas. That's Little Ye. Love more record. <laughs> Thank you, Faz. <laughs> Take it away. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So, welcome everyone uh, for this quick session. I'm very excited to join you today in this marathon of talks in AI and machine learning. It's great to hear so many talks about these topics. And what I thought is like, uh, just to give you kind of where we're heading in terms of similarity search and what you need to look for in terms of challenges and solutions. Um, I'm sure you heard a lot of similarity search and vector databases, and the chances are you probably are using it in some way or form. Uh, but always the question comes back again, how can you enhance it? How can you boost similarity search? So this is what I'm gonna focus on today. Obviously, um, this is a quite broad topic. And what we want is just to give you some scenario um, how you can apply it. Um, so the fact is, I don't know your background and I'm not sure who is data scientist here or machine learning engineer or who, who has a technical expertise in machine learning or coming from business uh, background. So I'm going to give you some examples, some pointers. Hopefully it will be helpful. At any point, feel free to leave your questions in the chat box if you have any question or uh, if you want, you can connect online. So to get things started, um, I just wanted to highlight what similarity search is in vector databases. Uh, because it's quite important to actually connect it to your large language models. And essentially, you get context out of this similarity search and vector databases. So um, imagine that you want to actually create an application for um, you know, a movie recommendation, for example. Uh, so the way to do it is there are a couple of options. But if you want to connect it to large language models and vector search, um, you need to use some concept of embeddings where you encode your movie description, for example, or the actual video or some metadata attached to it. So usually when you do the encoding for, for example, a video description or movie description, you use some kind of cosine similarity between the encoded description and the search query. So for example, if you have a database of movies and you want to search for a specific description, for example, for a specific keyword in that description, um, you can do so by using similarity search. So first stage is to obviously have this description a list from for these uh, movies. And second step is to encode the description. And as soon as you encode the description, you can use vector databases in order to store these embeddings. And at the same time, um, from end users, as soon as they type in the search query here, um, it, it will be encoded. And it becomes just a matter of finding similarity between the embedded description and the embedded query from end user. So this is pretty much what it, um, similarity search is. And obviously, uh, it is connected to large language models, but we are trying to actually provide context. So large language models don't provide this context, and that's where you can use um, vector databases in it. Uh, vector databases have a really nice feature, which is called metadata. It varies from you know vector database to on over. So I'm not gonna you know spend time on what it is called. Essentially. For each embedding, you can attach metadata into it, such as, for example, color, for example, if you're trying to find specific color, or maybe location, address, and maybe in some kind of movies, you can attach actors and so on. Um, so this is all good. And uh, I think you can get away with creating such uh, application. So it doesn't take you um, long actually to create it. It's like, in fact, most the vector databases have some mechanism for drag and drop, which you, you can get going in matters of minutes or a few hours. 
But this is kind of like a challenging when if you want to boost it, if you want to enhance it. I'm not talking about performance, but I'm talking about context here. So usually Victor databases lack context. So even they provide context, they do lack context. So in terms of the search query itself, and those who are coming from a database background, uh, it's many to many relationships. So for example, I mentioned actors, you can attach actors to metadata for movie embeddings, which is fine. But how do you connect multiple actors to multiple movies in Victor databases? It's quite um, uh, uh, difficult to implement. And in fact, you need multiple solutions to do it. So what we're trying to do today is just figure out the best way to do it. And if you want to take it into production, um, what are the steps you need to take in order to provide um, contextual data for vector databases and similarity search? So the solution I'm proposing today is kind of a second component to your similarity search and vector databases. So from the second part of this screen, uh, which I just um, added now, um, I have some casts I want to include in my application as well as actors. So this is kind of a many-to-many -many relationship between actors and um, movies. And in order to do this many-many-many-to-many -many relationship, what we need to do is to feed this data into the vector database results. So this will allow you to do some kind of joint statement between movies and actors and casts. Um, if you want to run it at scale, which is quite import important, especially for mission critical applications, then you need to make sure you actually provide these results in uh, milliseconds. So this shouldn't take more than one second for um, a mission critical application. So obviously with you know customer satisfaction and real-time application, it becomes really hard to do it. It's not easy. Maybe if I ask you to write some small application or POC, you might be able to do it. But if you, as soon as you take it into and put it into production, it becomes really challenging. How do you scale it? And for example, how many nodes you need and how can you minimize latency? So this is the solution. I want to highlight today, and obviously I will show you the code and show you demo. And but I want to just to highlight the real time story here and why it is important. So we live in a world where we moved away from batch analysis. We moved away from batch processing, where most applications have data stored somewhere in a database or a file system. So usually your application ingests this data from from source or multiple sources, um, you store it into database, you load it back again to your application and you do some analytics. And today we're saying we, you shouldn't do it this way. In fact, uh, you should actually look how you can ingest data in real time and process it in real time. So um, I'm gonna just jump quickly and explain what real time architecture is and why you need to care about this type of architecture. Um, so think about it in terms of your data source, your events, right? So for example, if you try to do online shopping or if you try to do some kind of machine learning in real time, which is completely separate from offline machine learning, um, you probably need some kind of way of processing events in real time. So by that, I mean, you need to process your data as soon as it arrives to your application and even before you start into database, which is quite important if you want to minimize latency. So this architecture has two main components. We have real-time data, could be coming from Kafka Topic, for example, or Apache Pulsar, or could be coming from AWS Kinesis. The fact is, it's just stream of data. And the second part of this story is the batch data. So this is your database, for example, or your file system where you store your historical data or transactions. And the real-time architecture should be a built on top of these two different types of data. And because they have different speed, you need to actually process it in the same way. And the only way to do it is to load it into your framework, into your application, in fact, into your memory. So here you see I have Kafka topic with the set of events. 
and I'm gonna ingest it into my architecture. I will show you the code and demo so you can get the feel what I'm talking about. Um, we have also a different um, structure here, which is the enrichment data. This will provide contextual data to my application. And I would be using SQL to do this joint to provide context to my data in real time and provide some results. So the interesting part for real-time architecture is to minimize latency. We don't want to store data in database and load it back into the application because it takes time. We can't avoid network hopes or hardware um, slowness between different data centers. What we want is to be able to process the data as soon as possible. So I'm going to sh shift my screens quickly and show you what we need to do here. So let me do this so you can see what I'm doing. Uh, so I explained the architecture here. Um, I'm going to show you the code here. So this is demo. This demo is running on my laptop, but it could be running on the cloud. Um, I'm using SQL because my background is uh, from machine learning and data science, but you can use the same concepts in Java or Python. Uh, so here I have a Hazacast running. I'll get back to what Hazacast is and how you can use it to your advantage in your application. Uh, but the interface itself is a, essentially a SQL interface, so I can write SQL code here. So the first step to write this application, just to show you why it is crucial to handle it in real time, is I'm going to generate stream of data. And this is using SQL. So I have some, you know, some names, some users. I'm going to attach some orders on this. And I'm attaching price. So this is essentially if, um, a simulation for an online store. And they follow the same architecture as you will see it here. And if I just copy and paste this comment into my screen, so I have a user ID and I'm going to attach some random number for orders. And then between these orders, I'm going to attach quantity into it. And then I will generate this string. So this is just simple SQL. Now it is um, executed. Now what I have is a map in my memory, which contain this stream of data. So for example, if I want to search for order, all orders coming from a user call for what, for example, here, you will see I copy this command and paste it on the screen here. You see all orders with the price and how, how, how many items are sold. Um, so this is very crucial to understand. This is not coming from database. It's not coming from file system and it's not um, fake data. Even it is like generated randomly but it is not a for loop, for example. This is actually stream, and it's actually stored in memory. So now if I stop it, you would assume the stream is finished or ended, and it is not. Uh, so if I repeat it again, it's just simple select statement. You will see these orders in real time. So obviously your question is here, Okay, what does it mean, right? What does it mean to have some orders with amount and specific timestamp or whatever? So you're right here. We need to provide context. We need to understand why these users are placing these orders, why specific search query you send it to your vector database, for example, has any meaning on what is that meaning. So to do so, I'm going to stop it here to explain the second part where we try to enrich the data. So from here, uh, what we're going to do is jump again. So now I have one memory, uh, one map structure in memory, and I'm going to create a second map. So this is, think about it as your database or as your file system. So this is actually historical data. And what I'm going to do is just ingest this data into my application or architecture. So if I copy it here, and now execute this comment. You will see now I have two maps in my application in memory. So one map is for the streaming or real-time data, and one map is for the historical data. Now I'm going to add or insert some data into it. So here you will see uh, I'm just going to create some features. And this you can think about it as your historical or contextual data. 
So for each user, for example, I'm gonna add three features. I'm just going to color these features here randomly. And if I want to do select for this, uh, for example, for the uh, batch map, um, I can actually see it is not stream. So uh, for example, if I want to repeat the same SQL uh, statement, so select now from the second map, you will see it's not a stream. The stream is still running here at the same time. So if I repeat it again, you will see the stream is still running um, inside my application. So the question is now, how can I combine between real-time data and batch data? And um, there are a couple of ways to do it. And obviously, if you're running it in, in production and you have your machine learning models, you need to make sure you actually update this in real time. So if you want to update the, um, the machine learning model, for example, or if you have a new features. Um, so I will show you this in my second talk, which is one hour or, you know, at nine o'clock lo local time here. And um, just one talk after the next talk, um, I will show you how you can update your features in real time. But for the sake of simplicity for boosting similarity search, and what we're going to do today in this talk is to do the enrichment. So for the enrichment part, um, it's simple um, select statement with a joint condition. So this join essentially allows me to combine or join two maps. So the first map is the real time data and second map is the batch data. Now, if I want to actually see what as a result from this query, you see, I'm gonna create the streaming data, which is the first map and on condition when the extra two or feature number two is right. So this is my condition for now. Now, if I go back to my command line, and if I paste this comment, so it's basically select customer features where the orders are sold, for example, based on the customer number match between the two, same value and where the extra two is red. Now, if I run it, you will see now the second feature. So if you just look at this column here, second feature is always red. So this is pretty important. Why it is important? Because now I am able to combine or merge between two different streams. I am able to do stream processing in real time with minimize um, value of latency. At the same time, I can actually feed this data into my similarity search and vector databases. So hopefully this explains what real time architecture is and what you can do about it. Now, if I go back to my presentation, um, if you have a like standard application, for example, um, you and you want to move it to real time, uh, you want to be able to run it as a pipeline. And I will explain what pipeline is. Uh, so you have the option to move your batch application into real time, obviously, but depends on the scenario you're using your application for and whether you're connecting it to machine learning model or not, whether you're using, for example, microservices or not. Now, I want to explain the time decay concept because it's crucial. Now you might be wondering why do I need to care about real-time architecture and why I can't just use a um, vector search or large language model or even like traditional machine learning models. And the answer is quite simple. It's called time decay. Essentially, the longer you wait on your data, the less value it has. So what is valid now might not be valid after one minute or one hour or tomorrow so same thing for the information like you find it on the news if you look if you try to do sentiment analysis for example for news and then the value of this um, sentiment analysis will be higher compared to yesterday sentiment analysis or a week before and so on so we try here to process the data as soon as it arrives to my or your application here now, um, okay, so this is good. Now we know why we need to care about a real-time application, but how fast we're talking here, right? So for some of you might say fast for me is maybe like, I don't know, a few minutes or a few hours. I can do batch analysis every one hour or overnight, and this is fine. But we're talking today for this type of scenario and for this type of use case, we're talking about 
uh, milliseconds. So for example, um, could be 100 millisecond or 900 millisecond, anything less than a second. And this is pretty fast. And we're not talking about one transaction, for example, or 10,000 transactions. We're talking about billions of events running in less than a second. So this is kind of hard to actually, and it's very challenging to do it. So the way to implement it is like I mentioned before, but if you want to think about where you can get the most out of your application essentially is when you do this combination. So we need to think about how we can ingest data from multiple sources. And this is kind of like what's called event-driven. And the event-driven allows me to process the data and combine it with um, essentially batch data. The event-driven architecture is to decouple your input and your output, your source and your sync. So this is very useful when it comes to similarity search. So I work for a company called Hazelcast. Obviously, if you don't know, Hazelcast is basically a real-time data platform. It has two main components, team processing, that one I showed you, and the fast data store to actually speed up your data ingestion from batch sources. Uh, you can connect multiple clients. It's open source. And uh, so you should be able to download my demo today and play around with it. It's very convenient when you want to do real-time machine learning inference. Um, as I will show you today in this talk and the second talk um, for fraud detection. So make sure to also join on to see how it works in action for a specific use case for fraud detection. Also like in this use case for similar research, you can connect your vector database into Hezekas to provide contextual data to your vector database and your similarity search. You can connect multiple sources to your application and multiple things. And um, if you think about your application, how long it takes you to write a new source or a new um, thing, uh, probably a few days and if not a few weeks. With Hazelcast, you can just can select the connector and you're good to go. And this is where we move from something called delayed action to instant action. So as soon as you type in your you know, prompt or your question to your favorite large language model, um, you need a reply. And this reply could be delayed. And by delayed, we could be a few milliseconds or a few seconds. And we're talking today, no, we, do, we should actually need to provide the results as soon as you type in your query. And you don't, you can't have it. You can't have it with the large language model or with Victor database. So you need to be able to do it on your own. Obviously, it becomes more, even more challenging if you want to do data serialization. Um, but I'm not going to talk a little uh, more about data serialization. But my, 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 my advice, you always need to think about how you do data serialization especially if you write large scale applications, because there are so many ways you can save on time and improve um, the or minimize latency. Um, of course, there are some use cases for how many serialization and deserialization you need to do. Um, so if you're interested in this topic, um, I think it makes sense if you want to connect offline, I can explain it in more details and whether you can save time. But for the sake of this simplicity for similarity search, I just want to highlight why you want to actually use data serialization because this is where embeddings as well can be considered as a function where you can improve latency or minimize latency and improve performance. So the high performance, essentially a combination between real-time data and batch data. And in here, if you think about it, between data ingestion, you do the enrichment, you do transformation, you do prediction, and you provide act on the results itself. So let me jump quickly to show you how you can uh, do it for similarity search. Um, so I'm just going to go quickly to those who are new for similarity search or don't know what similarity search is. You can think about it as data presentation. You encode it in numerical or float values. You do distance metric, cosine similarity, for example, to do the search. You do ranking for your results and you do information retrieval. So it's straightforward. 
Um, and the cool thing about it, you use it for unstructured data, which is important. Now you can apply it to text, audio, images, videos, and so on. The embeddings can be used with machine learning model, obviously. And this vector embeddings, you need to provide context as mentioned before, because the data or the search query and search results um, can actually become really challenging if you want to apply many to many relationship. So vector databases lack many to many to relationship, and that's what we're trying to do. So I, I went through this, so I will show you the code and how you can actually do it. So first step is to use Hazelcast. Obviously, you need Hazelcast to run as a client. So here, for example, I'm using Python client, and I'm using Quadrant as vector data search or uh, vector database uh, to use this client of this vector database. I'm using the transformer to do the embedding. I'm using this uh, sorry, this um, model LLM to do the encoding in my data. I have movies, ID, number for it, title, which is the actual title of the movie and description. And in memory, I do the encoding part for it. And from here, you can see I can I just need to encode the description. And based on the description, I can you know search for specific queries. So for example, I want to see all movies which have ramen noodles in the description. Of course, you can set limits into it and you get scored. And from here you have two scenarios. Scenario one is to be able to do just similarity search on description. So databases are more than enough to do it but as soon as you want to apply you know a context to a vector database or many to many to relationship you need to think about a way of implementing it and from here i use the hazelcast client i create these two maps as i mentioned before now i have three maps in memory two for acts and actors sorry cast as an actors and one for the movies and from here, I can link between the, these two through a joint statement uh, using the real-time map and the batch map. So that's pretty much my, what I wanted to cover. So hopefully this is kind of helpful for you. You always need to look out how you can solve challenges in any topic or domain. And for vector databases, you need to be able to do boost the similarity search, provide context to this. And the way to do it, obviously, is to provide some kind of same processing capabilities into your um, large language model and vector database applications. So we have large community online if you're interested in these topics. Um, so I know this is technical talk. Um, we went through the code. Uh, if you're interested even more in how we can use it in you know, a real use case, uh, join me after half an hour, I will talk about fraud detection, you will see how you can use the same capabilities for fraud detection, how fraud detections work, and how banks actually lose so much money, not only for frauds, but also for false positive. And if you want to get some experience with it, so the second talk will be more practical, we're going to have a little bit of the code, but more on the use case itself for fraud detection in real time. So that's pretty much what I wanted. Thanks so much for listening and watching. I'm open for a question. We've got two minutes here. Fantastic presentation, Fawaz. Sure Thank are. you. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have a quick uh, question for Fawaz right now? How did you get into uh, movies? How so did you get into this is a use case um, where we actually tried to create an application for movie recommendation using uh, similarity search and large language models, but we ended up with this challenge, which is just how to provide many-to-many -many relationship. So um, vector databases don't provide it, even if they have metadata in it. So the solution was to actually use stream processing in order to provide this many-to-many -many relationship where you can load structured data to your unstructured data in one platform. Excellent. Well, that's really a fascinating topic, and we look forward to, to hearing more in a half an hour from now. Yeah. Well, as I captured your QR code, so thank you. To, right. to Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one.
look, look forward to hearing from us. All right. Thank you. Yes, very much. And we're here at the beautiful podcastvideos.com studio in a, a semi tornado. Uh, there's some really bad weather going on around us, but the folks at podcast videos are taking care of us. They are. Let's say onward. Let's go. Pi Day. They say AI on Pi Day. So. AIDA user group Pi Day. That's right. Is, is telling the tornado come back a different day. <laughs> Not today. Not today. <laughs> So next up, I'm excited, Orson. We have Ryan Dolly from Detroit, Michigan. Oh, Motor City. Motor City, yeah. And uh, his topic is AI. Let's see, I lost it. And <laughs> it's, it's by it's 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 business intelligence. I'm remembering it. Business yep. intelligence and AI. Even though I wrote, lost the page, I wrote it on. Well, let, let us um, tell us about. It. So go ahead. Why don't you tell us about it, Ryan? Yeah, great. Thank you, uh, both of you. What an awesome event. I want to thank everybody who helped organize this for the opportunity to be part of it uh, before I, I get started here. <clears throat> so with that said, I'm going to jump in and uh, uh, give, my, give my presentation. Hopefully it'll be interesting. We'll generate some questions at the end. Uh, but let me go ahead and share my screen here. I'll let you know when I can see it, right? Yep, I see it. Bye, All right. AI. Thank you. Yep. So the subtitle is, uh, does business intelligence still matter? And I think this is a relevant question because of a lot of the things you've seen over the course of this event so far related to artificial intelligence, you know, in the BI space, when it comes to communicating data, one of the most obvious things that's happening with artificial intelligence is uh, natural language query generation, natural language data visualization, and the ability of these AI agents to produce charts and graphs and reports and all that sort of stuff, that's traditionally the domain of the data analyst or the business intelligence developer. And so the question becomes, well, what are we going to do if the AI is doing all of this stuff for us? Granted, you know, we're, we're kind of granting a premise that, uh, that it will, and we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit, but that's what today's presentation is all about. So very brief introduction to myself. I'm the VP of, of product strategy at Good Data. We are an analytics and business intelligence platform. Uh, I'm also the co-host of the Super Data Brothers podcast, along with my actual real life brother, Eric Dolly, uh, which we do every Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and then of course, you know, I've got three amazing kids. I've got five chickens. I've got two trucks. And I, you mentioned I'm in the Motor City. I am a diehard Lions fan. If you would like to connect with me, QR code right there will take you to my LinkedIn. I'm pretty active there. So if you like what you hear today, that's the best place to stay in touch. Okay. So what we're going to talk about, we're going to do a brief journey down, uh, down history lane and talk about what is BI. How did we get here to this kind of inflection point now that we have this artificial intelligence capability coming online. Uh, we'll talk about principles for business intelligence in the age of artificial intelligence, skills that BI practitioners might want to learn in order to stay relevant with what I see the changes coming over the next few years might be, and of course, do some questions at the end. So what is BI? Uh, this is a quote from Aristotle, business intelligence is just building charts, right? Uh, and you could be forgiven for thinking that, because in many ways, the way BI has developed over the last decade is that it's mostly about building charts. Um, now, how did we, how did we get here? I, I kind of divide BI into three eras. Uh, the, and you can argue with these dates and everything, but the, what you might call the enterprise reporting era, the self-service era, and now we're on the dawn at the dawn of, of what I would say is the AI era. And roughly this, this translates to like 2000s BI, 2010s BI, and now 2020s BI is what we, we have coming ahead of us. Um, Stephen, I see a quote here. Stephen Few would smack Aristotle for that dashboard. Absolutely, uh, Stephen Few would. Okay. <laughs> um, so the enterprise reporting era, what is this era? This is when I started my career, uh, kind of the, the tail end of this era in 2010. And what this era is about is that BI is primarily, primarily focused on providing basic metrics to feed reporting cycles. That's, that's really the gist of it. 
So what I did at this point in my career was a lot of metadata modeling. I, uh, you know, this is the OLAP days. I would build OLAP cubes that data analysts would use to slice and dice data. I would also build standard reports off of those. And this is your classic header footer table of numbers. Maybe it's automatically or, or, or uh, systematically generated and sent out to hundreds or thousands of people. But that was really what we did. And as BI practitioners, it was mostly about the metadata accuracy and then building those reports for mass distribution. Accuracy was more important than speed. This was kind of a pre-agile era. It was very SDLC, uh, waterfall approach, heavy data modeling. And since our industry is incapable of, uh, uh, for whatever reason, th thinks in terms of, of tools and vendors, this is the Cognos and business objects era. Now that these tools are gone, of course, they're still around and, and very valuable, but this was kind of their heyday when they were the new kid on the block. Very cool, very powerful is the enterprise reporting era. So how did we actually do things in the enterprise reporting era? Well, it is very different than what you might do today, especially if you're kind of at a startup or a mid-market company that's come into existence over the last decade. This is very, might, may be very foreign to you. Our database was a giant box in the basement. I can remember vividly the days when the Oracle Exadata, like the new blades for Exadata would show up and we were all gathered around a cubicle as someone like opened up the box and light came pouring out of it, like in the suitcase in Pulp Fiction. And then we had to wait three weeks for someone on the infrastructure and data center team to be able to install the thing, right? Um, then you would build out a rigid star schema, very he heavily focused on data modeling in these days and schema on uh, write. Okay, so we're, we're trying to anticipate how this data needs to be structured before we do any actual work for building out objects for our end users. Then you build your metadata model and on top of it, you might, you might put a PDF report. This was a lot to like about this era. The data was almost always accurate. The trust was very high. The scale of distribution was great. Um, and, and the existence of metadata, the fact that we cared about metadata, even if we didn't really often refer to it as metadata back in this era, um, was a real perk. Now, the flip side is this was expensive as hell. It's just like, like that blade to install in the basement was probably 200 grand or something like that. And, and you figure we had 10 of them down there. Uh, it took forever to do anything in this era. I think you can probably see that, right? Just waiting to install hardware, building a schema. It might take months or years to create a, a, a complicated data warehouse schema. There was really no self-service. I mean, it did exist, but it was really like the export to Excel button. Uh, and this was very operational. We didn't do a lot of what you might call analytics back in this era. That gives way to the era I'm going to argue we're exiting. That's the 20, 2010s era BI, the self-service era, uh, characterized by the form factor of the dashboard, which you see here. And business intelligence and uh, is pretty much synonymous with dashboards at this point. Like, there's a lot that goes into it. But if you're a data analyst and you were to boil down as a data analyst or a BI analyst, what is my job in like a single sentence? It might be I make dashboards. I'm going to argue that there's a lot more to it than that, and there's going to be more to it than that in the future, but that is a lot of what we've done in the last decade. And so in this era, the era that we're coming out of, BI is primarily focused, I would argue, on speed and visuals. This is the era of I have Tableau or Power BI installed on my desktop, and what I'm going to do is grab some spreadsheets and maybe join it to some database in my desktop BI tool in order to build a dashboard and then share it with my executive team to help them make a decision. And the theory of value here is, can I do this very quickly? That's the important thing and, and what you're mostly judged by. Accuracy is important, but the premium on accuracy from the previous era is we haven't seen as much in the last decade. And that has actually, I think many of you watching will know, you know data quality has become a, a major concern again in part because of the advent of these AI technologies that are, are very much garbage in, garbage out when it comes to data, um, but also because 
People have gotten so many wrong dashboards in the last 10 years that someone built on a, with a desktop BI tool that, that everybody's getting a little sick of it. This was all about visuals and, and looking good as well. Speed trumps accuracy, very little data modeling, no metadata consistency between objects in your BI environment. And what I mean by that is I might define revenue, say I have a very large Tableau enterprise server. I might define revenue 250 times on 250 different dashboards in that Tableau Enterprise server. And as a result, there's no consistency in how things are defined or, or in the results that people are seeing, right? It's, it could be a different calculation in many of those dashboards. As Jean-Georges points out in the, in the chat, right? People need data contracts, absolutely. Um, so what do we do in this era? Well, it's a little different. It's not slow, it's about speed. This is kind of what, of all the, you know, I had, I heard someone say, uh, it was Matt Housley, I was talking to him and he said, you know, everybody thinks that the cloud data warehouse, it's all about speed and scale, but actually the big, the big advancement of the cloud data warehouse was just that you could set it up in like five minutes, right? Just that you could have it up and running. And like, there's a database, it's an empty database. It has no tables, but the fact that you could start a Snowflake database and start working in five minutes was the major, the major, uh, the uh, major advantage of the move to cloud. And so what you see in the 2010s is uh, storage is cheap. We have cheap ass storage. So you move your data into cheap ass storage. And then on top of it, many customers that I've worked with and uh, over the years, they have something they call a data warehouse. But it doesn't follow any data warehousing principle that you might recognize if you're kind of 40 and above like I am like there's no Kimball, there's no Inman, there's no no data vault, there's none of that. It, so so really, it's just a database with a bunch of tables. Often it's one off tables that exist to feed a single BI data set that exists to feed a single dashboard. All right. So table, BI metadata model, dashboard, a one to one relationship the whole way through. This is easy to get started. It's very quick. Uh, there is some degree of self-service happening in this world. And it devolved a lot of the responsibility for be it building BI to analysts that sit in the business as opposed to a centralized uh, BI team. The, the bad is, of course, data is a mess. Uh, the reproducibility is very poor. The self-service hype hasn't lived up to reality. And the governance is a huge problem here. Like when Jean Georges talks about data contracts, you know, um, when Paul in the comments is talking about, you know, bad means like the bad list makes it more expensive, even though it may superficially be cheaper, the tooling's cheaper, the storage is cheaper, the compute's cheaper, the long run costs are higher. And, and I agree, Paul, in, in a lot of ways that that's true. And so that brings us to the era that I would argue we're, we're in the dawn of. Um, here is this Aristotle meets Hal 9000. So what, what is going to happen, I think, going forward when it comes to business intelligence and the impact that AI is going to have on it? And, and to be clear, this inflection point I'm talking about here, I think we're at the end of this road. Without AI, I think we would be at the end of 2010's BI. Like, like this has reached its... Uh, uh, you, we've squeezed all, the, all the, the wine from this stone, okay? Um, so things would be changing anyway, but AI gave us a real kick in the pants to do it. So what's going to happen? Well, one re reality when it comes to AI and BI is that existing data structures and the existing metrics map within most companies makes AI-driven analytics very, very challenging because of things like uh, the inconsistency in data models, the lack of focus on metadata modeling and, and, and metrics consistency, um, and this one-to-one -one relationship between tables, BI models, and BI dashboards makes it just very hard to build useful AI on top of it. I do think AI in the short term is going to answer limited scope questions. Like if you're looking at a dashboard, maybe there'll be a chat window and you can say, ask a question in the scope of that dashboard, right? And it will build basic visualizations and dashboards that are not great, uh, but good, maybe decent starting points. Uh, we're going to see increasingly it's going to get better and better at that. In the long term, though, and I will tell you as someone who works at a BI vendor where I'm in charge of product and I know what we're working on, 
that I can't talk about yet, AI is going to answer many or even most user questions. Um, building dashboards and visualizations is going to be in many, many ways automated. You know, there will be human intervention, but the capabilities that these AI systems are going to develop over the next year and a half to two years is going to be very impressive. And so since we've, as we've discussed, the domain of the BI person is traditionally understood as building the front end objects that human beings consume. What are we going to do? What am I going to do? What is Paul in the chat going to do going forward? So here's what I would argue. These are the principles of BI in the era of AI is these four things. It's a return of data modeling. It's managing what I call metric backflow. It's managing abstraction and semantics and then domain management. Okay. And for those of you who are into like data mesh and that sort of thing, certainly uh, I'm very excited for Jean Georges and Shamak's talk. Uh, I think in what an hour and 15 minutes. Um, this will fit right in with that. This, this could also be the BI uh, in, in data mesh manifesto in some ways. So the return of data modeling. Um, there's this, what I call the scope problem in modern business intelligence systems and practices. And that's the tight coupling of pipeline to table uh, to dashboard. I see that Jamak is sick. Ah, what a bummer. Sorry to hear that, Jean-Georges. Um, this tight coupling of pipeline to table to dashboard means that the AI system has a very narrow scope in which it can answer a question because it doesn't have a system-wide metadata model. It has a hundred metadata models attached to each one of the dashboards. That's a big problem and why we're going to need to return to an era of metadata modeling, right? The other thing is that BI systems are going to be more and more tightly integrated into more than just their own proprietary BI front end. So it's not just going to be about building dashboards. You'll increasingly see BI interact with and potentially provide metrics to AI ML, data science, app dev, reporting, all sorts of downstream uses. If you ever hear the term headless BI, this is kind of what we're talking about here. It's a BI system that has SDKs, APIs, SQL access points, whatever, that allows it to provide metrics outside of itself, okay? That's gonna become increasingly important. Um, and then this idea of like data has to reflect the way people think and machines learn. And currently it's often structured in order to, to uh, just, in order to make it easy for the developer to build that one-off dashboard. Um, and, and since we're talking about reuse of metadata and metrics at a mass scale here, that's gonna have to change. And I do think this will become, again, as, as it was 15 years ago, in many ways, a responsibility of BI or BI working in conjunction with data engineering. And the reason for that is that BI is closer to the business and understands the metrics and the business needs better. Okay. Um, abstractions and semantics. The, it will also become our responsibility in BI when we're freed from the tyranny of just building charts. And, and answering tickets that say, you know, I don't like this green. Could it please be a little more green? The system will do that. Now what we will do is look at the underlying system and build abstraction layers on top of it to hide some of that complexity for both machine and human intelligence, right? So that when someone asks a question to the greatest extent possible, they get the same answer because we have built a semantic layer and abstraction layer that understands the data and the relationships between the data so that you know a, a machine can ask a question of it and uh and be served up that metadata that knowledge graph that says okay here's the data points and the relationships between them in order to do something with it that's going to be a big piece of what we're doing providing business context and relationship definitions metadata ensuring the metadata is accurate that that the fields in our databases and in our BI systems have metadata that explain where they come from, how they're calculated, and who's responsible for them, right? Pulling in metadata from data contracts into the, into the BI system where they exist so that that is propagated all the way through down to the end user potentially is something that I think we're going to be doing in BI. Okay, now there's this idea of metric backflow. This is not an industry term yet. I made it up, uh, but what it describes is, um, is really this, okay? The idea that uh, when 
that uh, kind of on the on the edge, what you might call the analytics edge. This is the human facing systems. People are doing stuff. They're building new metrics. They're creating new calculations that don't exist anywhere else in the data stack. They're not in your metadata model. They're not defined in some materialization layer in BI. They're not defined in anywhere. The data warehouse, the source systems, right? It's a new calculation that someone made in self-service, say. One of the things that we're going to be doing in BI is looking at those, those artifacts and evaluating where they belong in the data stack. Asking ourselves, you know, is this metric something that should be exposed? Does it belong just in this dashboard or, or just in this report? Or does it need to be moved into the metadata model, into the data warehouse? How, how far upstream does it need to go? Because the BI, BI people own the systems of consumption, they are the best position to manage this, this, uh, this process. And in order to do it well, you're going to have to get good at working with the people who consume data from these systems and not just the technical aspects of them. And you're going to have to understand value and how your systems deliver those value and what the value of those metrics are, because that will help you say, you know, I think this metric doesn't just belong in this report for supply chain. I think it belongs further upstream in the system where other people can access it. Now, I'll be the first to say that uh, BI tools don't have good tooling for this in place right now. There's no alerts when someone creates self-service metrics. There's no easy button to, to push a metric from a self-service dashboard up into a metadata model. There's a lot that has to be done from a vendor perspective to support this sort of thing. But I do think it's gonna be critically important because these AI systems are gonna allow end users to do more and more and more content creation and metric generation much more easily because they're not gonna to have to learn complicated proprietary BI front ends, okay? And the last piece of this uh, is domain management. And this is like embracing the distributed or semi-distributed architectures that you see in things like data mesh. Um, so I think these ideas are here to stay. Um, I, I like the, uh, I, I think that they're very valuable. I think that decentralizing some degree of ownership, data product ownership to the different domains in your organization is smart. And I think most organizations would be wise to embrace it. The question is how do we fit into that world in BI? And there's a lot of ideas around this. I, I don't, I'll be the first to tell you, I don't for sure know, but I think it has to do with building the fundamental business intelligence, analytics and metrics platform, and then coming up with easy ways to share that platform and the relevant metrics that are contained in that met, that platform across the domains, right? Um, and so that is gonna be a, a big piece of it and maintaining the kind of analytics layer federation across the domains. One thing I find in the data mesh discussion is that very often it's, it's targeted, it assumes this like API gateway communication and, and almost that everyone interacting with it is gonna be a software developer. And then, it, and then it says, oh yeah, and also some SQL, right? But th that, and also some SQL is actually doing a ton of work. If you look at how, how business people actually consume data today, it's almost entirely through SQL or, C or, or tools that use SQL as a data interface. And so, um, you know, that is going to be a huge thing that I believe we are going to be working on in the future. So what do BI pr practitioners need to do? I think understanding semantics and graphs understanding metadata models, learn how to build these things, care about the quality of the underlying metrics and metadata model that you're building. Um, also learning about these AI systems, how do they work? Uh, what, what things do they need in order to consume data from BI and, uh, and these metadata models? Of course, the BI vendors are all building their own AI, their own chatbot, their own viz builder that exists inside their AI user or their BI user interface. Yes, I don't just mean learn about those though. I think that there will be other AI systems that will want access to your metrics that you have in BI. Uh, and so learning about those systems and how to model for them is gonna be important. Uh, last mile ETL, uh, this is just never gonna go away. It's perpetually, uh, it's a perpetual dream of our industry that people will stop defining 
metrics in BI. Companies I talk to all the time have an initiative that you can't make calcs in BI. You have to do them in the data warehouse or the data lake. And, uh, you know, we're not going to do any tra data transformations in BI. This is just never going to happen. And so uh, if you are a BI person whose career is extremely focused on the production of visualizations and dashboards to the exclusion of ETL data transformation and that sort of thing, I would pick up these skills. I think they're going to be very important and a bigger part of your job going forward as you're managing the edge of AI's uh, people interacting with your analytics via artificial intelligence. Um, perpetually business plus data, you know, learning how to interact with your business users, learning what they care about, and not just how to ask them what they care about, but how to lead them to discover what they care about when it comes to data. Because I always will say business people do not know what they need from their data until you give it to them. They will tell you what they think they need, but it will never be what they need. Um, and so, and so, you know, learning how to manage that process. And then of course, soft skills for BI people are going to become more and more important. Uh, not just because I think we're going to be working more closely with business people, but also because we're going to be working more closely with machines that depend on uh, language in order to interact with them. And in a weird way, you know, getting better at writing, getting better at interacting with people, I think will help you also get better at interacting with ChatGPT. And so, um, so these are kind of, you know, what I would do if I were a BI person and I am a BI person. So these are some of the things that I'm focused on. So I will wrap it up there. We'll see if I, I had some good uh, comments during, during the presentation. So I want to thank you, Jean-Georges and uh, was it Paul? I think it was Paul. Yep. Paul, uh, for those comments. Um, Again, I'm Ryan Dolly. Here you can see how to connect with me. I'm the VP of Product Strategy at Good Data. If these ideas are interesting to you, of course, we are a BI tool, so some of these ideas are filtering through to our product. Um, be happy to talk to you about that. Uh, and also host the Super Data Brothers show every Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so with that, I'm going to wrap it up and see if we have any questions in the chat. Uh, and if not, I will want to thank you for attending today and um, listening to me rant about business intelligence for half an hour. Thank you so much, Ryan. That was fascinating. Just real quick, I have a question. Um, so fast forward to, to 2035. Yeah. I'm middle manager. What do I see? Oh, geez. Um, I, I think that, um, I honestly think that a lot of what you're, you're going to see is, um, you're going to be getting alerts and reports that are entirely generated by the BI system and just sent to you, right? Via the actual interface. I don't know. I, I, how often are people actually going to go into the BI system to do stuff? I, I kind of think that that is going to be on the decline a little bit and that um, your other systems of work, your communication systems, you know, Slack, like you will get slacked. Hey, here's a thing you need to know about. And, and it will be entirely generated by AI that's analyzing the data in near real time to, um, to let you know. And then from there, maybe you'll jump into a little more traditional of a BI system where you're looking at charts and you're, you know, swapping axes and that sort of stuff. But I think a lot of what you're going to be doing is asking natural language questions and then only moving out of the natural language interface when you actually really want to customize something or save it to view in the future fascinating um any more questions we got time for one more quick one okay if you come up with any questions afterwards please make sure you get them to ryan thank you again ryan dolly that was amazing thank you yeah th thanks karen and thanks uh thanks everybody at idug for the opportunity thanks everyone thank Bye. you and we are here at the beautiful podcast videos.com studio Brand Love new it. studio. Love it. With the foul, foul baby pie cam. Another pie. Oh. Southern, my southern favorite. Homemade apple pie. Yeah, we're going to be doing some damage to this pie. It's pie day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the meantime, I want to also mention, I have a book, Blockchain <laughs> Tethered AI. This is on O'Reilly. 
and it came out uh, last year on Valentine's Day, one, one year to the day before File Baby came out. And if you would like a free PDF of Blockchain Tethered AI, and I do not do this very often. Please put your uh, your please message me. Give me your uh, name and an email address where I can get that to you. Blockchain Tethered AI by O'Reilly or on O'Reilly, um, and this also includes full code. So now we are getting the privilege of hearing hearing Fawaz Gan Fawaz Ghali again. Oh really? And yeah, and he's going to continue his talk. Okay. This is the Fraud Hunters Playbook. That's that's fascinating. It is. Uh, real time detections and challenges. So, so was, did you even get a break? Did you did you get a yeah, break, Fawaz? Did you get some pie? <laughs> <laughs> did you have a break? Come on, come on over to Liverpool and come join us. We'll get you your pie. Come on. Yeah, we'll get you oh, that yes. pie. All right, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'll wait and make sure you can share your screen before I There it is. Oh, right, Fawaz, we see it. Thank you. I like that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, just thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, again, welcome to this um, talk. We're going to talk a little bit on the practical side. So um, if you're new, welcome for this session. If you have attended previous talk today, uh, or in fact, this talk is going to be more about the practical side of this story. So if you look at like um, your mobile now and how many apps you have on your mobile, and the chances are like eight or nine out of 10 apps are using these concepts. Um, so it doesn't matter if it is like your mobile bank account or if you're doing online banking or you're actually trying to get some cash out of the ATM. Fraud is everywhere and you think about it is mainly a you know a technical problem it isn't it's actually more it's a business problem than a technical problem but today we're going to talk about the challenges why it is hard why banks lose so much money and essentially provide some type of solution so um i didn't mention my name previously so my name is fawaz gali i work for a company called hezekas which is unified real-time data platform um, this platform allows you to run real-time application at scale uh, with ultra-low latency. To, this is very crucial for mission-critical applications. So I'm based in Liverpool in the UK, so currently it's now like 8 o'clock. And my talk today is going to focus on the business side of fraud detection, why you want to actually know how it works, and essentially if you are an end user, what type of technologies you need to use in order to build such architecture. So we're going to talk about uh, the card fraud, and this is like whether it's credit card or debit card, uh, what type of challenges exist. And uh, I'm sure you heard about some machine learning in <laughs> previous sessions. So we're going to touch a little bit about how we can do it the traditional way and how we can actually accelerate it with real time into it. So we're going to move from traditional machine learning to real-time machine learning. And this is very important. If you want to take your machine learning model from development from Jupyter Notebook and put it into production, uh, I'm going to show you how you can implement it. So this is very nice thing to have. And obviously, I'm going to leave you with some resources. So you should be able to get going after this talk, building your real-time machine learning models. So why this is you no know, big deal? Why fraud is big deal? Um, if you look at some stats about, um, you know, like a few years ago in 2020, like around um, maybe 30 billion pound or dollars lost in for fraud. So this is not only the fraud activities, but also the false positive. And the false positives actually is when you actually try to use your bank account, but the bank for some reasons flag it as a fraud. So obviously, if they decline this transaction, it means the bank loses money as well. Now, it is estimated it's going to be like 10 times more in 10 years, which is like kind of like scary number here. And you can see it whether you're doing online shopping, for example, you're doing online banking, or when, whenever you try to do some kind of 
payment transaction fraud uh, exists there. And we try to do this or solve this challenge in sub milliseconds, which is quite fast. There is no way for normal application or normal machine learning model to be able um, to detect the fraud in milliseconds. Um, so the way to actually think about it is we're gonna not eliminate fraud, but we're gonna reduce it. And this becomes even more challenging when you want to scale it. For example, um, if you have multiple bank accounts and you know your banks try to predict or you know if there is a fraud activity or not on one of these banks, um, becomes really hard because it's not only one transaction. You could have multiple bank accounts, and for each bank account, you could have multiple credit cards or debit cards. Now you need to multiply these numbers with number of customers and number of transactions. So you might be able to know the average. You might be able to know the average of transactions per time frame, per minute, per hour, and so on. What you're not able to do is to detect it in when there is a spike in your data. So think about it as Black Friday. So many websites crash or freeze on Black Fridays. Why it happens? Because simply these are algorithms and these applications are not capable in to scaling. So I've heard this before. If you have an application, just put it on auto scale and you're good to go. And this is not accurate. And especially for machine critical applications, you can not just put it on auto scale and assume it will scale because you have a time window, which is SLA to provide response. And if you don't meet this response, no matter how many nodes you have or how big your cluster is, you're not gonna able to meet this SLA. So think about it as, you know, you try to get some cash out of your bank account, you swap your card on the ATM, and this is goes to your bank account, uh, sorry, to your bank, checks whether it's you or not and provide response. So this is usually around 50 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds, which is one tenth of a second. So this is pretty fast. And you need to add into it the hardware um, structure where your cluster is, which data center and so on. And you can split it into multiple steps. Um, if you think about it as microservice architecture, for each of these steps, you actually have a microservice for one is to ingest your data. So this is where you read your card details. Um, you need to enrich your card details, for example, who is the customer, what's their address, what their phone number, what you know transaction history they have, and so on. Then you need to do some kind of data transformation. So this is where you decide which features you want to use for your machine learning model. And for example, if you wanna combine between multiple models, how you're gonna select the score. And then you can decide to do the prediction in real time, obviously. And only then the bank will decide whether it's a fraud or not. So it took me maybe a couple of minutes to explain it, uh, but as I mentioned, your bank needs to provide an answer with 50 to 100 millisecond. And if they can't, it becomes really challenging. They can't say, for example, this is a fraud when it is not, and they can't say it is not fraud when it is. So those who know about false positives and false negatives are really trouble for banks when you know the user is doing the transaction, but they flag it as fraud and the other way around as well. Now, there is a opportunity here, and we're talking about the time again. The time is your friend when it comes to detecting fraud. So the sooner you reply, the sooner you detect the fraud, the better your architecture will be. And we're not talking again about it in seconds. We're talking about it in sub-milliseconds. And this opportunity or this time window, it can make or break the application or the machine learning algorithm. So think about it, you've done some machine learning before, you try to do some you know, a training in Jupyter Notebook, you have your algorithm and you try to do feature engineering for a fraud and then you get results based on some kind of accuracy, for example, accuracy metrics. 
So all good, but as soon as you take it into production, it's gonna fail. Why it's gonna fail? Because there is a time window, and this time window is crucial for banks. They need to provide an answer within this SLA, and if they can't, essentially it becomes really challenging for them whether to consider it is a fraud or not, and they lose money. So this opportunity here we talked about, it, we need to focus on how you can gain performance. So looking at the data itself, uh, you might be using machine learning model to train your um, model in terms of features. So it could be, for example, the transaction number, your credit card number, how much money you're trying to withdraw from your bank, uh, where is this ATM located and what are you using, for example, a phone, what type of operating system and so on. And of course, the GPS coordinates or location. Now, as I mentioned, we need to enrich it. We need to add context into it. And this is kind of like, you know, who is this customer? What's their age? What's their address? Uh, what type of um, spends they have? Are there any real-time features? Uh, what is the location for the customer address and so on. And from there, you need to do to decide to do feature engineering and transformation. For example, you want to have a numerical value for your features. And this is kind of like the same for the training model uh, feature engineering. So I'm not going to spend much time on this part here. But essentially, you need to apply it in real time. So even if you train your model at set of features, you need to make sure to update it in real time. I will, I will explain how you can do it. And from there, you need to run, for example, your favorite uh, machine learning framework, whether it's uh, using Python, for example, you can use Scikit-Learn, like PyTorch, and so on uh, to do the fraud prediction. And only then you can decide whether it is a fraud activity or not. Now, I mentioned a little bit about serving models in real time, and I want you to think about it, how you can do it, right? So there is a DIY approach, do it yourself. Um, so this summer, I tried to paint my house, or oh, actually last summer, I tried to paint my house, and I spent two weeks trying to do it myself. And I did a really bad job in painting the house, so I ended up <laughs> hiring a painter again to redo my wall. And this is the DIY approach where you try to do stuff on your own. So if we need to think about it in terms of fraud detection, you need a prediction service. You need to decide how you're going to use machine learning in real time. So this compute is in real time. You need model, online features, and you need to apply feature engineering. You need fast data store. So this is fast data store is in memory for, for example, customer features, merchant features, essentially any batch features not relevant to real-time features. And you also need a stream processing engine on top of it, which allows you to actually process events, transactions in real time. So these three components, you need to build any real-time fraud detection algorithm in production. Now, for a prediction service, you might be using PyTorch, for example, or you can use NVIDIA or any cloud provider. So I'm not going to name uh, many here. For fast data store, you can be using Redis or RuxDB. For scene processing, you could be using Spark and Flink. So if you build it yourself, uh, you need to multiply all the tools you're using with actually the learning curve. So how long it's going to take you to learn one of these tools? Not only that, but also to maintain it, right? You need maintenance time as well. So you need to maintain your fast data store, your scene processing store, your prediction store, and so on. Sorry, uh, prediction service, and so on. And obviously, every time you add a new tool to your application, you will increase latency. So now if you don't take anything from this presentation and you go home, uh, just try to measure um, performance on your application. And every time you try to add a new library, even if you don't use it, try to re-measure your application performance, you will notice the performance drops. Why does it drop? Because it takes time to load libraries or frameworks in, in the application. So we want to minimize it. 
And obviously there are some connection between data streams, data sources, and where you can send it and uh, your data and where you can store your features as well. So it becomes really complex. So not even only for how long it's gonna take you to detect fraud, but also how long it takes you to deploy this model. What happens if you want to change your model or you want to change your features uh, or if you change between and two different models, for example, how you can up deploy the new model. And you need to do all this stuff in real time. You need to do all these um, steps in real time. So for challenges, here we're talking about complexity. So for example, how many tools or technology you're using? Of course, you need a maintenance and engineering part in it. And this becomes a problem if you want to scale. And the performance increases uh, every time you remove tools in your in your stack. So the more tools you have in your stack, the less uh, it will perform. And of course, the risk, right? Because you have multiple tools and you need to maintain it. So every time you have a new version or you need to update. So this is not easy to do it. And this is the DIY approach. Um, usually, we try to avoid such um, solution simply because banks usually spend billions on trying to figure out the best architecture in terms of performance and latency. And we want to actually be able to do it in one platform. So doing it in platform, one platform, for example, it takes all the latency um, challenges. It takes all the um, challenges in terms of complexity, and it provides you with a simple architecture. So with Hezeka, has the fast data store and the stream processing. Um, if you can create it you know, from scratch, feel free to do so. My advice always to be um, to use as less tools as possible for any type of architecture. Uh, if you look at, for example, for large language models, for example, they use concepts called agents and chains. So chains allow you to run multiple steps in one pipeline and this is kind of cool right not because it only connects different agents or different steps to your um, um, large language model application but also tries to do it in one platform which is i think one of the best um, in terms of performance best uh, enhancement for in terms of performance so here we're gaining simplicity as i mentioned everything is in one platform you enhance the performance because there is no connection between two or more libraries. And obviously we have lower TCO and you essentially you do less here. That's how you do more with less uh, tools. So you end up with having a less code to maintain. Now, I want you to think about it, regardless if you're using Hazelcast or not, Anytime you try to build a machine learning model from now on, think about it as three different pipelines. Um, this becomes really handy if you want to put it into production. Um, and the way to do it, regardless of you're using Hazelcast or not, is to split it to one pipeline for feature engineering. We call it feature pipeline. This feature pipeline takes your data as raw data and apply data transformation to decide which feature you use. We're gonna use something called feature store to store the features. And we also have a training pipeline, which you see it in blue color here. Training pipeline will take your batch source features and try to you know, decide to train the model on it and decide which parameters uh, to use in order to create metrics you're looking for. And then we have the inference pipeline which is separate from the feature and training pipeline. So you end up with having three pipelines. So one for feature engineering and data transformation from row to features, one for training the model on batch features, and one to do the inference, which is kind of like having to serve this model in real time. So if you would deploy it in this way, you can take it from you know theoretical Jupyter notebook, and now you have a, a, a complete solution for fraud, for example, or for any scenario for machine learning. So this is kind of like standard now. Um, I worked with so many 
banks who are following the same architecture so they they don't have one pipeline for the fraud they usually have three pipelines to actually be able to decide which feature to use how you can use it to train the model and how you're going to serve it now i mentioned feature store so i'm going to touch a little bit about it why it is important so usually if you have just batch data and you try to train model and you train it once and you don't want to change features, you can actually get away without using a feature store. But if you want to put it in production, it means you need to be able to decide who can access features. For example, if you have multiple models, how are you going to decide which feature to use for each model? At the same time, if you use the same set of features, how are you going to do versioning on it? So every time you refresh with the new features, how you can decide which features to use and which are the recent features. So all these concepts can be solved with something called online feature store or feature store, which has two components, online and batch. So the actual feature store is just a key value pair stored so you say this is my feature and this is the value of that feature and it allows you to track multiple models and for each model set of features so i think this is kind of important so if you haven't worked or used features so try to you know play around with it and if you do you actually want to know a little bit more about it uh, i'm happy to walk you through it and um, again, it's not you only using Hezekas. You can use, for example, Feast for it, but it's pretty nice when it comes to handling multiple models for the same set of features or different sets of features. Now, the expert solution is actually on GitHub if you want to play around it. It's the same concept banks use to detect a fraud. So you have real time data, and this data could be coming from Kafka. This actually represents transactions. And from here, you need to connect to your application. So it could be written in Java or it could be written in Python. That's not important. What is important is to be able to ingest transactions into your application and enrich it in real time. And from there, deciding which feature to use in order to detect fraud. So you have enrichment, transformation, prediction, and acting on this. And you can connect it to some kind of um, you know visualization so you can use streamlit for it and you also have management center which allows you uh, to have a control um, from the back end as an admin to see not only the fraud activities but also for example what's going on with your application how much cpu are you using and how much memory are you using what type of jobs are running and what type failed how many nodes in your cluster and so on so this can all be handled within the management center. Obviously, at this point, it becomes easy to load the data. So we have a set of features. You load it into the fast data store. And from here, you can decide to deploy your real-time fraud detection. So notice I said real-time fraud detection, not batch or you know just fraud detection is very crucial because the real-time aspect of it is features are constantly updating in real time. So this is kind of ingesting real time features, doing the enrichment for and transformation on online features to get the last or you know recent features. And then you can do the prediction. Um, so I'm jumping back again to the code because uh, some of you might be interested to know how it works. So here I have a pipeline, which is kind of like um, reading from source, apply multiple stages and get some results. So that's what the pipeline is. Uh, I'm reading from Kafka topic for the transactions. I apply timestamp and then I use JSON object, JSON object just to decide my data in it. Or you can simply use the transaction into and put it into Hezekast map. You read your sources from a transaction map and you apply to it what's what's called stream stage since this stream stage allows you to actually um, track the changes into your stream in stages or you can apply window into it of course you need to decide what parallelism mechanism you're going to use 
and the contextual enrichment for your machine learning model could be coming from different map. So here I have more using IMAP. I have, for example, merchant. So this is data related to the merchant itself. Say, for example, I want to decide what's the customer location for, you know, latitude and longitude. So where is the customer currently? And where is he, you know, located as home address? So for example, if I'm located in Liverpool and someone is using my card in Italy, for example, this should be detected fraud based solely on location. And of course, this is a contextual. So this is batch and the features can update instantaneously. So this is where we need to combine the batch features, which don't change much. For example, my address stays the same. The age doesn't change every day or every month. It's once a month. So this is pre-processed feature. And from here, I can get to prediction. So the, I don't want you to spend much time on uh, figuring out the best model for a fraud. Uh, it is not important. What is important, how you can serve it in real time. So you can use, uh, I'm using here XGBoost model, for example. I'm running on, on AWS using SageMaker endpoint. And that you can use Google um, Cloud or whatever you prefer. And then for the, I run the light GPM on Onyx runtime. So this environment allows you to run your machine learning model in real time to detect the features and decide what you're gonna do in terms of uh, whether to flag it as fraud or not. And if you flag it as fraud, what is the next stage and so on. So here you need to decide how many runners you want to run for the same instance. And from there, you can specify how you're going to connect between Python and Java. And this is crucial. So usually you develop your model in Python, but you run it in a Java virtual machine um, as enterprise application. And of course, the question is what to do with the results. So usually banks use this to do some kind of alerts. You can think about as a that you get on your mobile, someone is using your card, or it could be blocking or freezing the back account, um, could be some kind of visualization, text message, and so on. In my case, I'm just updating a map. And of course, what it comes, you can bring your own model. So you don't need to create a model from scratch, or you need, don't need to actually, um, you know, develop a model without knowing exactly what's going on in it, you actually can just figure out which model you want to use. And this will allow you to do inference in real time using map using Python. The Onyx is just to framework to run the actual machine learning model. Uh, of course, you need to think about how you can accelerate, accelerate, accelerate the application. And uh, essentially, in simple terms, you develop the model somewhere and then you can deploy it on a Hazacast cluster. So some of you might be wondering about benchmarks. So this study allows us to run 1 billion transactions per second with just 30 milliseconds latency on just 45 nodes. Uh, so what's cool about it is just the linear scaling. So the more data you have, the actual, you just need to increase the cluster in linear way, not in exponential way. And 1 billion transactions per second, I think is tells you what type of data you will work if you want to deploy it in production. Um, so this is Onyx. Um, I'm not going to spend much time. I think we're running out of time here, but it is a nice framework that allow you to actually Built and uh, represent your machine learning, so running it as well. Uh, so, for example, you train your model in PyTorch, you export it as in you know, Onyx format, and then you can use browser to run your model. Uh, so, this is similar to, to what results can be. For example, using Streamlit. So, as uh, banks usually, they have a threshold they want to track and then provide alerts. So, it's pretty straightforward. Take away if you want to create a fraud detection algorithm, just think about the real time features and how you're going to update the model and how you can scale it as well. So 
Hopefully this gives you some flavor how fraud detection works, what is required for these type of applications. If you're still interested, as I mentioned before, uh, you can join the community or just reach out to me online. Uh, I think this is a great event to hear about all these um, uh, machine learning stories and use cases. So my advice is just pick up whatever you like and try it out this weekend. So I want to just thank the organizers for this great event. It's marathon, actually. Uh, so thanks so much and hopefully to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faz. It was, it's great to see your happy, smiling face and hear your wonderful presentations. It's, it's so nice to see you. Thank you again. Um, two-timer. Um, uh, <laughs> two-timer, yeah. Double header. <laughs> on deck, we have Heather Cole. And uh, Heather it comes to us from uh, Tampa Bay. And Heather's topic is Elevating Your Voice, Strategies for Analytics Professionals to Command Executive Attention. Fascinating. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome everybody to Pi Day. So excited to be here. Today, we're going to talk about that goal that we all have of becoming more influential. Does anyone like, go ahead, raise your hand. Let's make this interactive, even though we're remote. Would you like executives to hear your voice more, to hear your great ideas and thoughts and look at you as a trusted advisor? I think we all do, right? I mean, especially in this community of Ida, that Everybody is like so in innovative and has some, such great ideas, but sometimes we get a little frustrated by the fact that like they don't get it. Do you guys ever have that? Like they just don't get it. Like you have these executives and they have these big plans and then you're like, but that's not like, that's not reality. Like we can't have that up and running in a week. Right. So today I'm going to share with you things that I've learned. I'm going to call it the hard way. So um, in addition to being the founder of Lodestar Solutions, we are a boutique firm that specializes in cognitive and planning analytics out of uh, the United States. In addition to that, I'm actually an executive coach. So I coach CFOs and CEOs um, on how to grow their businesses and also kind of help them work better with IT, believe it or not. So today I'm going to share those secrets. So let's get started. So first I'm going to share my biggest mistake I ever made. So years ago, when so I was grew up literally in a software company. My parents had a software company that started in our basement. So software and technology is literally in my blood. And I thought being a good technologist and someone in this industry meant I had to be the smartest person in the room. And growing kind of up in that environment, what what was brought on to me, and maybe it was my parents or whatever. I thought that I had to be the brightest. Now, I'm old, I'll say it. And also being a woman in technology back in the day, I felt I had to be even work harder. So I spent all this time learning all the new, you know, new techniques. And, and I spent tons of time, nights and weekends trying to be the best at a technology. I don't know about you, but it became really, really stressful. I mean, I was just like, so stressed out because I felt like I never would climb the mountain. Have you guys ever felt like that where you're like trying and trying and you just, you feel like you're like not going anywhere and you're not getting the, the success that you want. Well, I was like that completely. And then it got so bad that I actually switched jobs. I took a new job for a software company that implemented ERP systems. And what I discovered there was my superpower. And it was not because I was looking for my superpower. It was because I had no clue what I was doing. So back to you to and they would send you to training for like two weeks. And then they put you on a consulting assignment where they would bill out hundreds of dollars for your time. And honestly, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Have you guys, can you guys relate? Like that total stress, right? And so what I did is I was put on this assignment in Illinois in this big health system. I was supposed to kind of be the junior consultant. And there was a senior that was going to design, architect the whole system, right? But wouldn't you know it, at the last minute, they moved her onto a different assignment. And there I stood all by my lonesome. 
And I was supposed to design this GL system for this very big organization. And you guys know what imposter syndrome is? Like that little voice that says, who do you think you are? They're going to find out you're a fraud. Well, that voice was so loud in my head and I just couldn't get over it. Right. And so I realized I had no clue what I was doing. So I kind of took a, a, a page out of Mark Twain's book. Have you ever heard this quote? It's better to keep your mouth closed and let people think you're a fool than to open it and uh, at, at, and remove all doubt that you're a fool. Like that, that was me. So I just sat and listened and I wrote copious notes. Like I was scribbling notes and I'd go back to my hotel room late at night and I would play on the system and figure out the best way to design it. And the next morning I would go back and during my exploration, I would write down a million questions to ask them. And the next morning I would show up. So the first thing that I did was I started listening. Now this isn't coming natural to some of us that are highly analytical because what, what do we do? We hear, we have a problem and our brain goes, and it starts to solve that problem, right? Do you guys get this, right? You're already in like, this is how I'm gonna design the system. I don't know about you, but I have to like give myself a lobotomy and turn that part of my brain off. So I started listening more out of just dire necessity, right? The next thing I did, I started asking, and this is the most important thing that we can do because in the world of technology, where we gain respect by being the smartest person in the room, or we have historically, right? Sometimes we think asking is a sign of weakness. And in reality, asking is your superpower. Like the more I ask those questions, the more the, C the chief accounting officer really liked me. He was like, oh, Heather, what are your thoughts on this? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope he doesn't know I don't know what I'm doing, but okay. So I just kept listening and asking, listening and asking. And then the next thing that I did, I simplified it. So technology is scary to a lot of people, especially executives. Like, let's just be a little stereotypical here. Executives tend to be on average over the age of 40, right? And the technology that we're using today did not exist when they went to school. And so they're not technologists. That's not their passion. Maybe they're marketing people. Maybe they're, you know, sales people. Maybe they're finance people. And technology can scare them. So what happens? We as technologists come in and we're like, hey, let me show you how smart I am. And we throw out this jargon and tell them how we're going to solve the world's problems. And... We make them feel stupid. Have you guys ever been in an environment where someone's talking about terminology and you're like, I have no idea what they're saying. Like, I don't know what that word means. Like you suddenly feel really ignorant. You feel like oh, out of place. And honestly, you don't really like the person that's making you feel that way. Now, some of us have flashbacks of like third grade where we had a bad teacher, right? And so being able to simplify and instead of showing how smart you are, kind of make things easy for someone. And then the final step there on our, our progression is to create a roadmap. So we start technology. Our goal is to, we're right here today and we're trying to get over here. And the trick to engaging with executives is to show them the roadmap and how we're going to get there. That's right. They need to know what that journey looks like. Now, not to the nth detail, but just a good roadmap that they can say, yes, we can accomplish this. Yes, I believe this is doable. And that that's going to be your superpower as well. Now, the next thing that I learned is that I needed to really learn how to walk in their shoes. Now, I had a little advantage. My parents owned a company that I started working at when I was like 11 years old. So I understood business. The other thing is I was a finance major, so I understood accounting and finance. And so I, I had a, a leg up over some technologists and then I had a finance and accounting background. The more you can understand, if you don't know how to read a P&L today, guess what guys, that's your homework. Learn how to use, learn how to read the basic financial statements. Cause here's the thing, every executive is trying to win the game on that PL and that balance sheet. That's their scorecard. Okay. So when we do so, we want to first understand the business side. If 
If you're new to the company, just start with accounting and finance. That is a language that is applicable no matter what industry you're in, no matter where you are in the world. It's like the easiest baseline foundation that you can get to understand the business. The next thing that you want to do is to make sure that your project, your initiative, the, 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 your passion project is going to help make or save the company money. Somehow, indirectly or directly, you need to weave that in like a little piece of thread into your presentations to them. Because that, again, is how they're keeping score. It's not about you guys. It's about them. How do we make them successful? The next thing that we will learn now, uh, we have uh, this program called the Analytics Success Club, ASK. Um, and that's right. It's called ASK for a reason. Um, and in that, we work with our, our uh, members of that group and we teach them some Tony Robbins techniques. Have you guys heard of Tony Robbins? He's like the really tall motivational speaker. Well, he will teach you there's six primary needs of people. And I'm going to give you the cliff notes of the cliff notes today. The two most frequent primary needs we see in executives are certainty and significance. They want to feel important. They want to feel like they're the best. And they want to have certainty, certainty in the numbers, certainty in the project, certainty in everything. So the more that you can give them a roadmap and make them the hero, the more you're going to let, win their hearts. And you're going to make them feel very special. They're going to trust you. You're going to learn how to talk in analogies and stories so they remember even the most complex technologies. Now, of course, we're giving cliff notes here. We do have programs on how to do all of this from storytelling to, to identifying their needs. But let's keep moving. So the next thing that you want to do is how does your project help them, the executive you're trying to work with, achieve the strategic goals of the organization. Now, this is where everybody falls. And it's not your fault. I, if I could see everybody, I'd be like, how many of you can clearly articulate the strategic goals of your company? I've done this time and time again in conferences. And I've done it at a summit last year with a room full of CFOs. Less than 4% raised their hand. What? Yeah, 4% of CFOs could tell us the strategic goals. Now, if anyone should be able to do that, they should, right? So it's not your fault if you don't know. It's your fault if you don't go ask. I'm going to repeat that. It's not that your fault if you don't know the strategic goals. It's your fault if you don't go ask. Now, this will give them pause. They'll be like, wait, what? You're asking what? And by the way, that's a good why. Because they'll be like, this is someone I want on my team. They may be horrible at communicating these goals. But if you go ask, and you, this is how you can do it. You know, my job as a technologist is to help leverage data, analytics, technology, the AI, so that we can achieve our strategic goals. My challenge, however, is I don't know what those are. This is like telling you to run a marathon and not telling you the start line, the finish line, the course, and expecting you to win in, in record pace, right? We have to know the course. We have to know the target. We have to know the finish line. So go ask the strategic goals. The next thing you want to do is you want to guide them on their journey. Now, remember, you are the guide. You are someone that's going to take someone and make them feel safe. People will do things when they feel safe, when they have certainty. And as we kind of introduce AI and various technologies, it's downright frightening for someone that doesn't understand it, right? So they must understand a couple things with regard to the initiative that you're trying to encourage them to do. So the first thing is they must understand the goal. So what is the goal of this project? Maybe we have a strategic goal of increasing profits by, you know, 50% in the next two years. I don't know. Maybe that's a, a goal that's two to five years out. Then we're, notice what I'm doing. I'm kind of tying it to the strategic goal. And now I'm saying for this project, what we're going to do is we're going to leverage AI to automate some processes that are extremely ma manual and extremely error prone. So that could be the goal of it. The next thing we have to communicate is why 
the, like, what is the real reasoning behind this? And again, this ties back to the strategic goal of why is so that we can accomplish this bodacious goal that you have set for the organization. Do you guys get that? How you're weaving these together to make a very kind of clear roadmap for them on why they're going to a destination, right? It's kind of like a GPS system, right? Where we're picking where we're going. We're saying why we're going to go there. And then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to share with them the steps to get there. Now, our steps may be, you know, like pretty clear or they may be kind of like there's a lot of steps. So you've got to be careful in not making your project too big. Years ago, I had a CFO client that went to an IBM event and saw some dashboards and fell in love with dashboards and said, head, I want that. And I said, okay. So we went back and we, I talked to the CIO and I said, do you support this project? And the CIO said, absolutely not. And I'm like, wait, what? Like you can get new toys. You can get condos. He's like, I don't support this project. I'm like, curious, why? And he says, Heather, we don't have good data. Our data is like everywhere. It's horrible. And like, until I get funding, to clean up our data and, and really do it right, I'm not supporting this project. I said, very well, great. What if I helped you solve that problem? Now, this is where I had to sit them down in a room together and explain to the CFO why the CIO for the last five years had been asking for this funding. Here's what happened. The CFO had no clue why he was asking for money for a data project. He didn't see the value in it because he never explained to him that if he got the data clean, he could give him pretty dashboards. He missed the why. He missed the ultimate goal of having decision-making data. You guys get what we're doing here? We got to connect that why. As soon as this, this meeting took less than 45 minutes, I sat them down. We did a little demo. I went to the CIO. I said, do you support this project? And he said, no, we had stages. That he explained why he didn't do it. And all of a sudden, the light bulb went on. The CFO was like, wait, what? That's why you wanted all that money? He's like, yeah, I need the resources. And, and he goes, approved. Like, Woof, just like that, approved. So understanding that why was super important. Now, the next thing is those steps. We got to walk them through. This is what we got to get the data good first, right? And then the next thing is to clarify the timeline. Now, this too is super important. If you make it too long, it used to be we could do IT projects and say, in five years, we'll be done, right? Not anymore. I like to say we have to focus on minimal viable product. What can we get out in a little like 90-day sprint or less? What can we do and show incremental results? So like if I wanted to go from Tampa, Florida to Denver, Colorado, right? I'm not going to just like jump in the car and suddenly I'm going to plat out my route depending on weather, depending on conditions. And I'm going to start probably first going up to Atlanta. And then from Atlanta, I'm going to go to um, maybe through uh, Memphis. And then like I'm going to map my route. So those are the steps. And I'm going to show results at each step. The next thing that we want to do is we want to clarify the challenges we foresee early on. And we're going to tell why in a minute, but this is so important. So if we think there's going to be a snowstorm in the plains, which there is right now, then we're going to clearly identify that challenge. And you'll want to do that with your projects too. Maybe the challenge is we don't have good data. So we'll do a little pilot on sample data or something like that. The next thing that we want to do is um, define, have a definition of success. We will be successful when this report is replicated in a new system or something is measurable. We've heard of SMART goals, right? They must be measurable. They must be timely. You've got to be able to do it um, and realistic. And then the final step is the executive must believe. This is, the, this is the most important one, guys. Write this down. The executive must believe that this is doable. If they see like in, a, in your industry, some other company, your biggest competitor has done this, but they don't think their internal teams are strong enough, they're still not going to fund your project, right? They must see that they can accomplish this, right? So um, make sure you may help them understand how your organization is going to accomplish this. Now, there's only one reason in life 
why anyone is ever disappointed. Do you guys know what this is? What This is Heather's secret to life. When I learned this, it was like, oh, right? I suddenly, life communication with my family members, with my spouse, with my friends, like everything got so much easier. And I'm going to give you this secret right now. The only reason why anyone in the world, your boss, the executive, anyone is ever dis disappointed. Oops, my thing doesn't want to advance. Their expectations were not met or exceeded. This is super simple, guys. So let's say you have a project and it's going the wrong way. We've all had one, of the, one or two of those. Nobody's perfect. Sometimes things happen, right? The first thing you need is as soon as you start seeing that at risk is be candid and set, reset expectations. We call this framing. We go into this a lot in the Analytic Success Club. You have to reframe those expectations. And this is also why we share the challenges early on in the roadmap. So we are going to set the expectations that this is not going to just pop up in a day. You know, that's the problem is software, as software resellers, we go out, we show the executives this really cool demo and how pretty it is. And they're like, great, can I have that tomorrow? And you got, and those of you that are in the trenches at the client are like, what? what, what did you tell them? No, you can't have that tomorrow. So making sure we reframe those expectations. So there's a whole segment we could do. We could do a whole session on this, on the hero's journey. And here it is. At the end of the day, your job is to build the hero. And here's the, the key point to this. Do you know who the hero is? In IT, we always want to be the hero. I, we were in tech exchange in Spain. We we're talking to, to Ralph and some of the people. And we're like, you know, here's the deal. When we get up on stage, we're going to show them how smart we are. No, that's wrong. If you guys heard Gary's presentation last night, um, he said, no, no, our goal is to make them like transform to help your audience. So here's the thing. Your executive or anyone you're talking to must be the hero. Your job is to guide them to become the hero. So for those of us that like Star Wars, you know, we'll say, you are Yoda. Your executive is Luke. Luke is the hero, right? Yoda is the guide. So you want to be Yoda in everything you work with end users, you work with executives. It's a shift for many of us, a whole shift from being wanting to be the hero and guess what happens, guys? When you become the guide instead of the hero, it's like you're like Pac-Man and you ate that the special pellet. You have superpowers because they will know you, like you, and trust you. You will be asked to be in all the big meetings. They'll be like, hey, I'm not going to do this unless Bob's here or Sam's here or Amit's here. Like, like They're going to want you in that meeting because they're going to trust you and they know that your interest is their success. Do you guys get that? I hope so. Okay, we're we're wrapping it up here. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes, Maya Angelou, do you guys know? Okay, she's a, a famous poet. At the end of the day, people won't remember what you said or did. They will remember how you made them feel. We are so tied to emotions that we have to make sure that after every meeting with your end users, after every meeting with the executives, you have empowered them. You have made them feel smarter. You have made them feel happy, like they can do this. When you start doing that, everybody will want you in their meetings in a good way, not in an overwhelmed way. So my call to action today, I'd love to connect with all of you. As I mentioned earlier, I run a program called the Analytics Success Club, and I'd love for you guys to join us on the next meeting, which is tomorrow, believe it or not, at 1 p.m. Eastern time. All you got to do right now, grab your little cell phone, go ahead and scan the QR code. If you're like, oh, no, cybersecurity, you can't do that. There is the URL. It's kind of long at the bottom. Or you guys can reach out to me and um, we'll make sure I'll put my my in my email in chat. Um, even if you can't make tomorrow, here's what I'm going to ask you to register. And here's why. Once you register, even if you don't show, 
then I will get your email address and I will make sure that you're on our list for all of our kind of elevating the analytic professional series and webinars. We got a bunch of cool new stuff coming out. So that I, a couple of minutes over, we have some minutes for questions. So any questions I can answer. Oops, am I, hold on, I might be in the wrong area. What's some advice you might have for a startup, Heather? For a startup person in this industry or a startup company? A startup, a startup uh, company in, in so, AI. So <laughs> in AI. If you're a startup company, and I'm going to assume you're providing consulting services, is that right? Uh, we're providing consulting services and software, yeah. Okay, so I so I started my company 20 years ago. Um, and back then it was the old boy club. I'll just say it. It, it was, that was what the tech was back then. And, um, back then what I realized is one, I couldn't be the smartest person in the room. I like, it was just too stressful. What I did do is I became extremely networked. So if you're starting your new, a new company, or if you have an older company, my business advice to you is go build your network, go reach out to everybody that is on this uh, Pi Day and, and introduce yourself because the way I have grown my company over the years and not with a ton of resources, like meaning employees, I've been able to really grow it through networking and partnerships. Get those strategic partnerships, get people you trust that do things slightly that you don't specialize in and start building that network. We have a whole vast global network of partners that we give work to. And they gave it to us. And that's the best way to grow because it's it it saves your profits. I'll just tell you that. Yeah, how do you how do you foster those relationships that are symbiotic? So I back? just I reach out. And so the way I started it is I started to look at partners that offer complementary services to us. And actually, we are partners with a lot, almost all of our US quote competitors in the IBM space. We're also partners with them. Mm -hmm. We built that that just complete trust. We're not going to steal your business. You're not going to steal ours. Let's share resources. It helps everyone's bench. Um, and so what we did is we, I literally would just reach out and say, hey, I saw you're selling this. I'd love to talk about ways that we could potentially partner so that we can both grow our businesses. Maybe we even do a webinar together. Like that's a great way to start it is like, We'll designate, you know, you can use um, in webinars, you can have a link for each person. So I got to have a link that the registrations come from me. You could have one. We could do a joint webinar and really kind of grow each other's businesses. That makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, the networking is kind of underrated. I know uh, one time I called into uh, a radio talk show back in Ohio where I lived and Andrew Dice had just started Dice.com. <laughs> Or not Andrew. It, I don't think it's Andrew. I, that's a different <laughs> Dice. I think his name was Robert. But I think uh, Andrew but, Dice Clay, isn't it? Isn't I it? think Andrew <laughs> Dice Clay started Dice. <laughs> he would have had different advice. That's right. That's why I started laughing. Really? But, but the guy who started Dice.com, he told me something real similar. I said, you know, I'm a, I am an entrepreneur. You know, how do I get started? How do I find work? And he said, ask everyone you know. Yeah. This is even if it's people that you don't think could possibly have work for you or know anything about it, make sure you ask them because they may know somebody. And it here's works. another thing that I did. And anybody that's on that might be an analytics partner or reseller in the United States. And actually, we started we started to start when we had to do a little more work on in EMEA, is I started a partner roundtable. I said, you know what? I'm an IBM partner. I want to find other IBM partners that do exactly what I do. And what we did is I started, I said, hey guys, I want to, I want to find out what your biggest concerns are, what your specialty is. If you have a special industry like car dealerships or something, then I'm and I find a, a deal in that, I'm gonna bring it to you because you're gonna be way more successful at the services than I am. And so I started that round table and really built a sense of trust. And um that that's been golden. Like those are people that if you have projects and not resources, you, you got them built in without risk. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Really, really 
helpful, timely information for me, I know. I know. I want to make sure I capture the QR code. Either. Everybody, make sure you get her <clears throat> QR code. And like, uh, like she said, sign up now so you don't miss anything. So thank you very much, Heather. Um, thank you so much. It was a fascinating presentation. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good to have a head, have a good pie day. And we're all <laughs> having a good pie day here in Northwest Arkansas. We are. It's wonderful. Even uh, with some bad weather that came through, we still are onward having a good time with this. Uh, yes, another pie. Doing serious damage on the pies up here in <laughs> Northwest Arkansas. <laughs> and uh, that one was apple, in case anyone wonders. Um, but uh, coming up next, yeah, we're gonna just we're coming gonna up next. Up. We've got we're here at podcastvideos.com and yeah. and uh, I think Orson has a little bit of music. Yeah, we a little background music. A little background this. music while we're switching over. Yeah, this is Head Cannon from Love More Records. Uh, this is Bang My Life. So we just give him a little bit of that. Bang was the first file baby. Well, uses. this is Head Cannon. Oh, this is Head Cannon. We'll okay. Bang during our uh, fireside chat, which is coming up now. <laughs> Are we there? I believe okay. so. I think we're heading to the oh. fireplace now. And uh, uh, we had a uh, we had a cancellation and uh, Jean Georges has decided to include really? Orson and I in the fireside chat. We're delighted to be here. <laughs> it's it's, pro it's it's probably made up because the thing is it's you don't need a fireplace in Arkansas. <laughs> It's for you, Jean George. It's for you. I no, thought you I, might. I, I, mean upstate, I mean, upstate New York. Okay, so I know what a fireplace is. I just had one installed, actually, a real one, like a, a stove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I see it's a little fake. Oh. You're You're just... <laughs> Show. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. So unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, Jean Marc is 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 sick. So. Um, so it's we get a hopefully a rain check for for another time, but it gives us a little bit of time to 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 to, to chat and uh, for me to know Orson a little bit better, who seems to be a little bit of an interesting guy. Uh, so how did you yes. find this guy? <laughs> how did I find Orson? No, I'm asking Orson how he found you. Oh, uh, how he found me? Oh, okay. Well, uh, I had a uh, background. Dealing with music, entertainment, and a lot of events, and I have a nonprofit. I'm a nonprofit executive director for the Music Education Initiative, and I uh, our organization offers workshops to uh, show people how to get career and skills into live music, entertainment, and and a lot of different things. And we were holding a workshop, and Karen had just come into town uh, from Austin a couple of years ago, and she came to one of our workshops, and we connected and. She told me her relationships that she had had with music, and we just became quick buddies. And uh, whenever I would do a workshop, she would usually show up. Uh, we do stage building, how to do stage, how to set up, how to do logistics, how to become an audio tech, a lot of different production themes. Our workshops are called production education and technical workshops. So when it came time for Karen to tell me what she did, she had a workshop and a seminar on how to understand AI, basically the, the introduction to AI. And she was, of course, uh, plugging her book, uh, Blockchain Tethered AI. So I went to, well, of course she was, <laughs> George, of course she was. <laughs> so I went to her seminar. Oh, yeah, yeah, plug yours as well. That's right. That's right. So I literally went to her workshop and heard what she was talking about with the fascinating things that was happening with AI. And I listened and finally, I just put down my notebook and just started listening. And I asked her, I said, how can this be utilized with what you're telling us in music and entertainment and how we could deal with this to help artists? Uh, we talked about movies. We talked about TV. We talked about so many different sectors of entertainment. And then from that, it went to publishing. It went to lyrics. It went to the legal. It went to insurance. And we talked about, and then earlier today, you heard us describe what we've done and what she created and built, she and Ethan built with uh, File Baby. And that's how we connected. And, and uh, I, I tell people that I like to use my experience, expertise, and relationships around the world so that I can help myself, we can help ourselves, so we can help others. 
So that's what it's turned out to be. Cool. Okay. So and and what's what? So I, I get your background in, in in music and events and uh, how do you kind of switch to AI? Well, it, it didn't switch. I, again, uh, it was more of a continuation of understanding and you, understanding what I was being told and what I acquired with reading and learning and listening to what Karen was putting out and she was telling me that it's some of the things that she built is user friendly even for me so it became a, a situation of where i'm using my skill and some of the things i've done as an executive and a businessman i'm a businessman that has a nonprofit, and we run that business just like a for for-profit business so it became a situation to where i saw things that i could bring to the table i already knew what she could bring to the table i mean she wrote the book on you know blockchain to the AI, and i was listening don't, don't show us a book don't show it again. Okay. We, it, <laughs> is that what she's reaching for? Oh, there it is. <laughs> so, so, so we literally have uh, made a connection so we can see what we can do and grow with other things. And we have other solutions uh, in addition to Foul Baby that we want to bring to the world and into this tech space, which I'm just so happy to be a proud of, uh, be a part of. All right. So, so now, so now the, the, how did you come to the idea of file baby so i'm a user okay i i, I like file baby i i made some hopefully positive uh comments on it and uh, i i think it i think it's a i think it's a great tool um and you don't have to mention that you're on sale today but the thing is um what how did you how do you transition to that what what was the idea what was a problem you saw on the market that you wanted to address sure there's a, a lot of uh, a lot of fake uh files out there there's a lot of deep fakes uh where that can hurt people and ruin their reputations and uh a lot of them aren't you know it's it's not that easy to detect things all the time this is a standard that has been evolving over the last five years that file baby uh uses it's if you can see my hat it's content authenticity initiative uh and uh, i think it's content authenticity.org um, or contentcredentials.org. Either one of those, you should be able to find the link to be able to join CAI. And anyone can join uh, CAI and learn about file provenance. And so in the course of that, and, and the way we had discovered it, um, as Orson mentioned, you know, we, were, we were at the library, working at the library and having uh, workshops. And Orson came with Ethan one day. You know, when he was coming to my workshops, he brought brought me a senior data scientist. I love this guy. So here I have a senior data scientist. Would you like to talk to him? And so, so then Ethan and I started working on uh, together, trying to figure out, well, you know, the bottom line that we're trying to solve is how can people not suffer from poverty while these massive AI companies get richer and richer for, you know, hundreds of years off of their work. And, and so, um, so we started looking at ways things were done now, and I really like Firefly, which is an Adobe product that lets you make Gen AI. And I had done a lot of my images in Firefly, and Firefly put a, water, a visible watermark in the lower left-hand corner that said this was made by Firefly. And, and there was also some type of hidden credentials, and Ethan says, well, let's, let's see what that is. And so we started digging into them. And we found out that these were invented long before uh, generative AI came into play. Um, they were invented for combating fake news by the news right. agent. So, so then we started going down that road of, of uh, okay, let's look at these tools. And what we found was that it's very, it was very technical. There was nothing that was just drag and draw, point and click. Um, you know, I'm I'm diehard programmer for my whole life, just about. So I didn't really care. You know, I can I can download the repos and use the command line stuff. But I thought, man, this is hard for people who just want to check it out and learn it and and experiment and play and see what these content credentials are all about. Because a lot of files already have them in there and you can't see them. So 
So anyway, I built FileBaby. You can drag and drop any file into FileBaby and it'll tell you if it has credentials or not. It'll tell you what the credentials are. It'll help you to verify it uh, and help you to share it without losing uh, those credentials. And the, and the manifest as well. And the manifest that goes along with it. There's a, a hidden JSON manifest uh, that, that travels around inside the file that uh, contains any assertions that you want to provide. Um, where you can, uh, for instance, I could say, um, Alvin here, our, our, uh, who's been so kindly helping us out today. You want to come on camera hello, for a second, hello, Alvin? How y'all doing? Hello. So Alvin had taken a picture of us a few hours ago. And so, uh, and so I, I, I put it into file baby. I don't think he's noticed yet, but I put it into file baby and I, I claimed it with his name as the photographer before I uploaded it. So then always, whenever I start to use that picture, I can inspect it and I can see Alvin took this picture and, and give him proper credit. Now, by the same token, if that's if that picture is out floating around on the internet and someone wants to buy it, they would be able to get in touch with them. Um, if AI tries to use it as training data, there's also flags in there as to whether AI is allowed to use it for training data or not. So well, Jean-George, one thing I want to do is uh, we had uh, a few weeks ago, we made the our first artist, a music artist that we have here locally with Lovemore Records. We had an artist named Bang. Bang, yeah. And he's we good. had him to literally become the first artist to upload their music that he literally put out. And I'm going to, here's his single that we put out. I'm going to just kind of play a little bit for so people can... This is Bang on Love More Records. He did it himself, too. Yeah. He did the upload himself. So we had them to upload this. So it was historical for yeah, us. Yeah, it was. This is one of the first artists. And if they want to pick up uh, Bang or any of the other artists on Love More, it's yeah. Love, Love More Records. Yeah. Love, com? More records. Love More Records, yeah. So we, we're talking MP3s, movies. We've heard some of this. Some of the uh, our presenters today talk about movies, and we literally we talk. Heather was just talking about some of the things her presentation that she just presented to us should be claimed on file, baby. And so we're so all these. She created that content, and she should protect it. And we're just happy that we have a solution. And one thing that uh, again, uh, John George, that really connected me with Karen was that I had seen so many artists have their work stolen, not yeah. just. Yeah, we're talking before AI stolen physically, but then again yeah. with this technology, uh, there is the steam, uh, the steam where people are having their art artistry taken out and everything. So we want to protect that. We want to protect their voices, their names, their images, their all these different likenesses. We can do that as a solution. So that's that's one of the things that File Baby can do is to prove that provenance and authenticity. All right. Jean George, we have a friend here that's been helping okay. us out. I'd like to introduce him real quick. This yes. is uh, podcastvideos.com, yeah. um, who gave us this lovely studio to use today. Yeah. This is this oh. is Parker. Parker. I feel official now. All right, Parker, welcome. <laughs> yes. This is Jean George. Hi, nice to meet you all. Did he get the pie? Yeah. I mean, we'll have, oh, a pie sure. have some pie. If you want to die, y'all are killing me here. Tell them what you guys did for um, us and really yeah. for this pie day. Yeah, so just kind of a quick rundown. We're podcastvideos.com uh, here in Northwest Arkansas, Pinnacle Hills, and Rogers. Uh, we've known Orson for a little while now, and uh, Karen's actually been a few times to record, record a few things. And you know, Orson reached out and said, hey, would you be willing to um, loan us some studio space? So we just got done building... Uh, brand new space here in Northwest Arkansas. We've got uh, eight different recording studios within here. The videos kind of in the background. Um, so you can kind of really see what's going on. We just do full scale podcasting, but it doesn't have to be a podcast. It can be um, about us videos, webinars. We can do remote podcasting from anywhere in the world. We have people that are from different countries all the time tuning in with hosts here. Uh, so we basically our goal is to streamline the process of creating video, audio, video like content. Like we're doing here. Like we're doing right here. That's so, right. Yeah. So we've had yeah. folks from all over the world. Oh, yeah. Hours yep. Of this. So this That's is fantastic. Yeah, it was pretty cool to hop in when Orson told me kind of what was going on. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, we can accommodate that. Oh, yeah. he, he bought me over with the pie. That's yeah. essentially the pie. He's like, I'm going to bring in five different pies. I was like, what? I can't <laughs> okay. say no to that. So. Well, Parker, thanks yeah. for having me. Oh, 
Yeah, you, you can book Pi Day 2025 now, you know. That's, oh, uh, absolutely, yeah. But he's got to increase one pie every year for it to work. So <laughs> that's why his payment's got to increase every year in pies. So. Well, thanks. Thanks yeah, so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Orson. Thank you. Absolutely. We're hoping John yeah, George is out here next yes, year. Yes, absolutely. Pie. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> we can't leave without giving a shout out to our good friend, Eric Howard. Oh, yes, absolutely. Who, who, Don't let that go to his head. Okay. But, yeah, he's the, uh, he's the owner of Podcast Videos, so. Um, he gave me the, the space to kind of be creative and design these these spots. So without him, obviously, it's definitely not possible. All right, so, it's amazing, yeah. amazing. Thank you all, thank you all so Thanks much. Yeah, facility absolutely. right here. Any, thank you, Parker. Yes, thank you so much. So, Jean George, uh, again, we 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 are loving AI Pi, on Pi Day. This is wonderful. We want to continue. I know we have some great speakers uh, up so far. Does anybody have any questions for us? Anything in the chat? Just about pies. <laughs> <laughs> well, this Friday, well, that's true. So what's next? I, what do we have? I see that Tish is is very shy today, and that's not typically her. So feel free to uh, feel free to jump in as well, okay? So um, because you you've got a you've got a great story to share as well. Tish. Oh, thank Tish. you. Yeah. So, yeah. So any of these, so while we're talking about that, if our folks are thinking about it, Jean George, I know that you all have uh, I think Eric Broder, you all have a book coming out. That's exciting. Whom will that be? Oh ready yeah. For us? Yeah, so so it's not it's not it's not my first book. Um uh I decided to, so I've invested a lot of time into this new what we consider modern data engineering. Uh, so the, the way the way we we were using to do the way we used to do data was okay. We collect the data, we do some transformation, and we store it somewhere, right? The, the pipelines, the, the ETL, etc. So a lot of people say oh, we need to we need to change that, or we need to, to stop doing ETLs. Uh, it's not going to happen, okay? So Ryan said that, and I'm I'm seconding that. It's not going to happen, but Hopefully, one way we can do it is, in a way, less stupid than the way we've been doing it, and, and trying to and, and, and trying to, to 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 be more respectful of the data itself, right? Because uh, I, I'm I'm a, I'm a big believer that there's no AI without data, uh, and if if someone says otherwise. We are going to have an interesting discussion, um, but um, but I, I really think that that this is this is a trend, and the, you know it's 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 oh, I'm losing my English now, but it's a it's a deep wave. Okay, it's not like it's it's not just a fad. It's just something that we we've been in industries, we've seen companies, and and you've you've heard my my business partner today, Kim, where the, the problems. We, we we are seeing it's, there's no easy solution, right? The, so the thing is, we need to change the mentalities. We need to to do that, but, um, and that's that's I would say that this effort was really initiated uh, or made more popular, I would say, by Jamak Degani, who unfortunately could not be with us. So and. So she introduced us to data mesh. That's that's kind of a, when I say us, our industry to to data mesh. Um, that was a kind of a fundamental idea and the fundamental way she wanted to do that. And was it an instant success? No. Is it a success now? I don't know. Okay. If you're familiar with the Gartner curve, you know you you, you first there's a lot of hype, so you keep climbing. And then there's the, the, the slope of dissolution or something like that. And then finally, you start seeing results, OK? So where are we on this curve? Uh, the, uh, Gartner said that data mesh was dead before actually be, becoming something. I, I don't think so, because I see that many people um, still wanting to implement data mesh. And data mesh is actually the only solution that brings real solution uh, to, to, to the problems in the, the data industry. The, the data practitioners are facing. So, so I think we're we're not we're we're not going away from it. 
we're probably at the top of the hype or just a little bit after in the stroke of disillusion or whatever before we, we, we bounce back into really positive results. I also think that because where we are, we have a we've got we've got ways to go, right? The thing is maybe data mesh is like the, the same growl, okay, so the, the growl you, you want to reach. But in the way to that, if we were thinking like we used to be thinking in data, it would mean that, okay, I'm reaching for the graph, whatever else, I don't care, okay? So if I miss the graph, I miss my project. Uh, so if, if the graph is a data warehouse or an enterprise data warehouse, if I miss it, then poof, it's gone, okay? I missed the goal. So here, the idea is more like, hey, let's say that we're going there incrementally, okay, iteratively. And the first step of this for me is data contracts. And, and, and that's why, you know, when, 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 when we met Karen, that was two years ago, on this day two years ago, or yeah. just a little bit before. And, and then we, we clicked in a way, okay? So that's why when you, I don't remember how it became that I, I reviewed your book. And I really liked it because there was, there was this idea of what you're doing, you're contractualizing something, okay? And then you make sure that this contract is secure via blockchain. And the thing is, we knew that from before, but let's apply it to AI. And that was before ChatGPT, okay? Let's, let's put things in perspective, okay? Uh, so so we, we create this kind of smart contract or AI contract or whatever, we define something, we make sure that it's not polluted by putting it in the blockchain. And then that gives us this, this serenity in a way, okay? So now when we are extending this idea to data contracts, okay, which are governing data pipelines, you see mm -hmm. the benefits. We've, we've heard from Chris today, okay? Um, they're not on the show today, but uh, on LinkedIn, a friend of mine just said, hey, they finished an implementation with it in Spain, okay? Um, and and, and they, they're deploying it. So when you're having this first level, this foundational level of data contract, then you can trust more what you're going to build. And what you're going to build next could be AI, could be uh, analytics, or it could be data products. Okay, so that's kind of the next stage of it, where mm -hmm. you consider data as a product. So it's not an easy thing to understand, okay? Data, there's no definition. That's why a lot of people compare data to water or oil, because it's kind of, you can't really grab it, you, you kind of picture it. But the idea of creating data as a product, especially a, like a software product, where you can have versions, where you can have thinking about its evolutivity, about what's governing the product itself. So that's the kind of next step. And when you're thinking about what data mesh is, the idea is just, let's put all this product together and see what happens, okay? And I love your story, Orson and Karen, because it, for me, it defines innovation, okay? As the thing is, if five years ago, Orson, someone would tell you, hey, you're going to be leading a startup in AI, okay, you would have probably laughed and, and, and say something, well, you are, you're a funny one, let's, get, let's have a beer together. And, and Karen- He laughs now, he says. <laughs> but but, but, but that's, that's innovation. When, when people from different angles, team have different ideas, that's where you can actually do things, okay? So, so you being more music, even Karen being a die art software engineer, you get together, you find something, you create something, and that's Final Baby, okay? So I like that a lot. I like this story a lot. Uh, and and uh, I, wish you, I wish you all the success possible. Thank you. We're Thank you very friends. much. Yeah, it's, for, it's for, the, for us to help people. We've, we can help ourselves to help people. And I think that's what we want to, to, to do. And we talked about that in our session earlier, is that we really want to see how we can bring some hope to some folks that don't know some things, but bring some things, some hope as we, as we do this corporate responsibly. We want to have some hope 
where there's hopelessness and we want to help. And I think this is a solution. And this platform that you've allowed us to be a part of today, Jean-Georges, has been just spectacular. The, the, the presenters that we still have more to come there mm -hmm. has just been my notepad is just getting really filled up with some of the great presenters. I can't wait to connect with some of them, like you just said. And I really liked our last speaker, Heather, that she was talking about how she worked together with uh, with being uh, joining with people that have different things, but how they can come together, just like you said, John George, with innovation. And I, I, I want us to build off of that. And I want the, the presenters to reach out to us and see how we can work together, because this this is changing every minute. And we've seen that so much with the AI. And I think one of our presenters mentioned that uh, it's, it's uh, I think it maybe a post I saw on LinkedIn earlier this week that look at this, this uh, I think the uh, OpenAI Sora app, and I think he said, this is the, the worst that you will see this. Explain what it's, Sora is. That there could be people that have not heard of Sora. Well, that that's my understanding. It's just a video creation tool that OpenAI has generated that has given me some. I mean, the, it's so lifelike. I, you have to really look closely to see maybe every once in a while some pixels that are out of place or some glitches, but it's so remarkable. And it's getting better at every minute or every second that this is, and it's an incredible it's getting platform. Better and better. So I guess they would call, what do they call that? Tech video? Generative. So generative AI, generative video. Is yeah, generative fantastic. AI video. And it was, it was fascinating because... Uh, uh, well, uh, we have a friend, uh, Roger Verkoven in, uh, in Amsterdam, who was, who's actually one of the beta testers for DALI. He's a digital artist, and they asked him to test. But he was explaining to me, Sora, he said, he says, you know how you make videos frame by frame, and you decide what's next, what's next? He says, there's none of that. Wow. He says, it's the whole video, all at once, it's incredible. is how it generates. So, so any questions in the chat? I'm sorry, Jean George. No, because Tish is on camera. So, I, oh, hi. Tish, Tish, would you like to share your story? Because I think your your story is really beautiful, <laughs> and we've got five minutes. <laughs> and we and we got five minutes. Hi, everybody. Uh, okay. well, you know what? I I wasn't going to share my story. My my story is really um, it's really uh, uh short and sweet, right? So. Um, I was a cosmetologist, wow, and, uh, a hairdresser. So I and, and I worked with Purple Label Retail. So basically, I just made sure that people looked really good all the time, especially when they were presenting and things like that. So um, I I I did that for a long, long time for over twenty years. And then the salon that I was at decided that it was going to close down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, what are we going to do next? What's next for me? And so I turned to tech. A lot of people in my family are, are uh, technologists and um, are around the space. Um, mainframes kind of called to me. I called back. And here I am now, a back-to-back -back IBM champion. Uh, and I'm very involved in uh, advocating for the mainframe and for technology as a whole. Um, and AI uh, seems to be so hot on so many levels, and it affects each and every one of us that I, I just had to put my entire person in it. Um, for a, a number of reasons. And so uh, when I met up with uh, Karen and Orson, uh, with you, John George, I mean, you can't help but to just know that this is where decisions are made. This is where the future is. This is how we see ourselves, not only in, you hear people say in 10 years, this is how we are right now. This is where mm. the decisions are made right now. So, um, yeah, I am just tickled pink. Uh, please, it's punch to be here and to hear everyone present because each and every one of you have just shed pounds of light on this subject matter. And um, 
it's just a privilege and an honor to to see you all. And I really appreciate you all. Uh, how, long, how long did your journey take? Um, six years. All right. Wow. That's six pretty years. quick. That's right. It, <laughs> no, it probably didn't see you. Are you being thing. funny? <laughs> no. No. I'm not, not being funny. That's quick. Yeah. You know, for a person that, that was working behind the chair for 20 years and to be able to onboard that quickly, I think for me, it was the fact that I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to be a part of something greater than myself and I wanted to help other people. Mm -hmm. And with that drive, that's why you know, I I uh, I dove so deeply into tech because this is how you help folks. Technology. Well, we certainly feel your help, <laughs> Orson and I do. <laughs> Thank well, you. I, well, I appreciate you all. Um, I utilize File Baby all the time, especially when I'm when I'm doing my creative part. So it it has helped a lot. Um, and then, of course, you know, reading the stuff that John George posts on LinkedIn. I hate to raise the John George flag, but I have to because look, <laughs> I, I had John, I had JGP on my show. Right. And there was a lot of things that he was saying that just clicked. And if you listen and this is what I tell a lot of my mentees, I say, if you just listen, you'll pick up and you'll glean what you need so that you can move forward. And there was things that he was saying, like, write down your prompts. Make sure that you understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I was just like, okay, these are very simple um, concepts, right? But they were so helpful. They were so helpful um, on the job, for the show, everyday life. Um, and it, it's just really helped me to do the things that I need to do so I can be able to help other people. And so it's, it's, I thank y'all. Thank you, Tish. We thank you very you. much. Good. That's a fascinating story. That's it. It, it is. It is. So that's why I'm, I'm really happy that, you know, on the spot, you, 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 you share it with us. So. Uh, it's about time for our next speaker. <laughs> it is. It is. Well, thank you. We have Eduardo Mayo on deck. Um, Eduardo. Thank you. Thank you, John George, and thank you, Tish. Um, we're all warmed up now from the from the fireside chat. Now, where, is Eduardo, <laughs> where is Eduardo hailing from? Eduardo, where are you hailing from? I come from Mexico. It's um, actually from Jalisco. Have you ever heard about tequila? Oh, yes. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So <laughs> here is a is a main factory of tequila here is the, the region of tequila so actually there is a town called tequila so you are welcome to come anytime i would love to all right we'll put that on our list or so we're gonna all have right. to well, take you. a file baby tour down to That's visit right. eduardo, well, eduardo. <laughs> so eduardo is going to talk to us today about ai for large-scale crop classification and that's fascinating. That uh, that's something very useful, and I I can't wait to hear how you're doing it. So, are you ready, Eduardo? Yes. Let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, I'll let you know once we can see it. There you go. We can see it. Take it away. Okay. Let me change my uh, and move this. This is sorry. Okay. Okay. Everything is fine. Uh, you can hear me. You can see the slides. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the kind invitation to the organizers. And this is the, my second year here. So I, I'm happy to be here. The last year we talked about um, a similar topic, but in this time we, we want to talk about a different kind of method to make this classification. Actually, we, we use the this um, 
kind of neural networks called transformers. So this is the agenda of the talk. And maybe um, I can uh, show you this. This is a, a small introduction about me. Um, right now, I am the artificial intelligence director in the Jalisco government. Jalisco is the second uh, um, state of Mexico, I mean, is the second uh, in, uh, state uh, in, in terms of uh, population. Maybe there is a kind of 8 million people here in the states. So I'm working with a application for the government. And um, I was uh, in Texas uh, with a Fulbright uh, Fellowship. And before I was in Barcelona Supercomputer Center. And before that, I made my PhD, master's degree, and bachelor in physics. Uh, okay. So these kind of things is uh, because uh, we got this uh, one project related with health uh, application um, in the top 10 of 100 around the world. Um, this this classification was made by the UNESCO. This this happened the last year, and uh, we have two projects in this um, thing called GPA um, uh, related with artificial intelligence application and uh, responsible and ethical development. So, the, this is this these two projects. I, I, maybe I can uh, talk a little bit. Uh, about this project later, but uh, I want to show you something. This is the uh, Mare Nostrum 4, the, the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Some of you, uh, actually, when I talk about this, uh, maybe most of the people don't really believe me that this supercomputer is inside in a church. So this is a picture. And we got uh, in this um, back part of the of, of the supercomputer, we have this kind of IBM uh, Power 9 uh, machines, um, a lot of that, uh, 52 nodes. So we made a lot of experiments in that machine. So so this is um, Jalisco, maybe you can now know wh where is this, uh, because there is a tequila, I say you, uh, Marachi, and the capital city is Guadalajara. Okay, uh, which is here, maybe for here is uh, Puerto Vallarta, maybe you hear about this um, town. So, but it, actually Jalisco is not uh, only these kind of things, actually it's a kind of Silicon Valley of Mexico, because we have a big tech companies here in Jalisco. Maybe you know all of these, IBM, uh, Oracle, C3, uh, Amdocs, Continental, Bosch, a lot of companies. We have um, uh, startups, uh, research centers. Um, uh, we have partnership with a lot of uh, kind of uh, things. And uh, of course, we have uh, uh, universities and, and all, all the things here, yes. And in the center of this ecosystem is the government. So I work in, in this government mainly to create application inside the government. There is another uh, institution who tries to improve this uh, ecosystem of artificial intelligence, but I know I don't work in these kind of topics. Okay. Uh, wh what is the motivation of, of, of this talk? Well, uh, is the food security, you know? Uh, this is a big problem, uh, maybe in uh, around the world because you, uh, this year was a um, water supply, uh, water uh, access problem, uh, maybe in many, countries around the world, and this water uh, access uh, could be uh, have, uh, problems to have uh, access to food um, and all the things that I uh, mentioned here. Um, uh, this is like this from NASA Harvest Group, and uh, I only want to show you that this is really important, you know, the, 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 the food. <laughs> I don't know if I have to say something else, but uh, we, all, all, all the days we need to 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 get the food, but uh, we need to plan to get access uh, and uh, have um, many things related uh, with the food security, as I mentioned. Okay, 
Uh, there is some some information that the farmers need to know to to plant uh, some kind of crops. So, so this is uh, some example of of one of these apple uh, apricots and all cotton on all all of these uh, kind of of crops. And they, if you see, they uh, have different kind of season uh, and is deep, uh, and they have different time series um, information for any any kind of uh, of crops yes and we try to use this time series data to to make a classification of different kind of crops this is the main idea of of this work yes so uh, we have uh, this information we have these uh, images from the satellites and we have some people who takes some uh, field data and say, okay, this is uh, this is for instance core, and we get this time series data from the from the satellite. We have the labels from people who went to these crops, and then we make apply uh, some artificial intelligence technique, especially deep learning techniques. We combine this information with all uh, another kind of data. And at the end, we try to know if <laughs> these and other fields are uh, similar in, in, in the time series data to uh, another one. Okay. We use this uh, um, hardware to train our models. Actually, we have a very good machine. It's a DGX A100 uh, with HGPU, uh, 18 gigabytes uh, of RAM each one. Uh, maybe you hear about this machine, but there is uh, one and hundred and fifty kilograms. The server is, is, is the size of the server, so this is huge. Two terabytes in RAM is is a huge machine. Yes, and we have another mach another server, uh, IBM Power Nine AC ninety two, which actually uh, we start with this server maybe four years ago. And we have all the, the results maybe here in this presentation is come from this server. So we combine this server in a kind of uh, topology of this. We have a login server and we make the schedule, uh, the scheduler uh, with the Sloom and with, uh, with these tools of here. Yes. So we have uh, this kind of, uh, of data for machine learning. Uh, for instance, with image, we take some samples of the images, we train our neural network, and then we make the inference in different kind of samples. In the case of uh, NLP models, we have the similar thing. We have the these samples, we train, and then we have this a kind of uh, output of this. But in, the, in, the, in this case, from the satellite images, we have some samples of this. We have to train in this a neural network model, and then try to make the all the inference with all the images. Yes. So this is the main idea uh, or the main difference between the, the data from, uh, for instance, uh, image classification, NLP, or or this problem. So um, in this group, I hear a lot of times about talking about more uh, about the data. Okay. So if you have a uh, table data, usually <laughs> many people don't use neural network, they use X post, but um, this is um, another uh, talk, talk about this, but uh, when, when you use image uh, data, usually you try to use convolutional neural network. And when you use text data or time series data, usually the people uh, use the recurrent neural network. This is an old, old fashioned technique. Now we try to use the something called transformer. Yes, the, the transformer is the base, uh, the main idea behind the generative artificial intelligence, yes? And the main idea is uh, this transformer has an encoder and decoder. Yes, something like this. We have uh, some some parts of the transformer, which is a query, a key, a value, 
some uh, concept very related with the uh, uh, the uh, SLQ uh, bases databases. So this is um, one um, a tool to explain how works the generative uh, the transformers. And this is uh, the main idea of, of this uh, web page and says generative AI exists because of the transformer. So you have, maybe you, you want to learn about this. This is a very good uh, explanation about the, the transformers, how it works, and you can uh, read about this, the LLM, the how is the tokenizer, and this is a very nice uh, um, web page when and you can check all these things and, and understand a little bit more about the transformers. Okay, so we use this kind of time series data, and this is how. Please uh, pay attention about maybe about this uh, crop here. You can see that the, some part of the year is green, and then is uh, again uh, with uh, maybe coffee of this color, brown. I don't know. And this is uh, the 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 why this happened because some people um, crop uh, the the field and get the uh, the the crop uh, in certain part of of the year. Yes. So the time series of this data change uh, between the different kind of crops. It's not the same for, um, for instance, uh, corn or uh, bananas or something like that. Yes, so we have a, a specific time series data for every cor crop. Okay, let me show you this. So to improve the crop uh, performance, we take, um, um, some data and some model to uh, make the uh, crop segmentation, yes? So we take the RGB image and some uh, two more channels called slope and elevation. With this kind of data, we get the specific values in a time series data, and we improve in something called active learning process, uh, all the labels uh, from, from this data. So at the end, the classification of, uh, of the data is more related with uh, a time series data. You can see here, for instance, uh, agave, corn, uh, sugar cane, citrus, mango, avocado, banana, and others. And you can see how some uh, uh, time series signature of, of these kind of things are very different between. So the model tried to learn about these patterns and make the classification with new uh, data. Yes. So we made a crop segmentation model based on these uh, kind of uh, images called Sentinel-2, NICFI, um, Copernicus. And this is the main idea. It's a similar idea for any kind of segmentation. We have the images, we have the mask, and we have the, this is the, the data set. Uh, we have the, the, the image data and the label. So the model tried to uh, make the, the, the mask in a new examples. Yes. So we, uh, to, to make the inference is similar, we make um, these patches from this size. And at the end, we have to one, one band of, of results related with the uh, crops the, uh, in this case. So this is one example of the output. And you can see how we can uh, make all the crops uh, segmentation for uh, a very large scale zones. And this is another example. This is from Jalisco. And this is another example from Sonora. Sonora is closer to Arizona. And we have this uh, segmentation in, in this area. So you can check this uh, tool and looks very well in these kind of patterns. So uh, what is the performance of this? The main idea of the performance is this metric called uh, in, in inference over union. And the main idea is uh, know 
how much is the area um, between these uh, two two polygons? Yes. Uh, so we have a um, very nice performance in, in, in this case for for this kind of task. And uh, we use this result to make the crop classification. So again, we use this uh, kind of data. And the main idea is the following. We have the data, the images, we have the CNN, uh, the, the segmentation tool, and then we have uh, the time series of a specific for every uh, segmentation crop. And then we make the train validation and test using this kind of models, time series transformer, inception times, and the TS uh, sequencer plus. This is the, the three models that we have. And when we made the, the classification with these uh, models, we have this accuracy. Please, uh, this is uh, difficult to, to explain. Um, when we try to use these uh, for different kind of uh, uh, areas around the world, the performance usually could, could be around uh, 85, uh, 80, and this is high for uh, for this kind of application. So we have a very good result. We are preparing actually a, a paper to publish this. This is some example of, of some region of Jalisco. Uh, you can see uh, that this is the place. And this is how we can have these kind of crops classification, agave, um, corn, and all these things. This is how it looks without of crop segmentation. If we don't use crop segmentation, look like this, look like in everywhere of, uh, around the state, we have a, a, some kind of crop. But we, if we use the crop segmentation, these results really improve, you know? Uh, we reduce the error a lot with the crop segmentation because it's not all the places are made to 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 have a crop some people have some in some areas we we have forests and all these things so this is um, another result from different years um so uh, according to to this data the 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 classification are very good um and this is how it looks uh, for instance some testing areas, for instance, the, the federal government sent us this area and said, okay, in this area, you you um, uh, you, you have, um, um, I don't know what is the name of this, um, Sugar King, I, I don't remember what is the name of this, the green one, but uh, in this part, we have all, um, almost all the this area with the same kind of crops. Yes. So this is the main idea of the crop classification. Please take note that. Uh, please note that we uh, have uh, th this is um, eighty uh, thousand uh, kilometers uh, square kilometers uh, of of the. Uh, of Jalisco, so this is huge. We take uh, around two weeks, make all the uh, pre-processing and and making all the inference. The, for the training, we take uh, around one month to make the the training. Yes. So this is uh, another project. Uh, this is uh, a project actually was selected by the GPA and the some call. Uh, Name it scaling responsible AI solutions to make a, 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 a model to um, early warning system to detect deforestation with the US uh, ID, US forest, and some other uh, uh, models. So we made a, a model. Actually, this model is more simple. This is a convolutional neural network model to try to make this. And this is the uh, other thing that I mentioned, we got this uh, prize for the uh, model. Um, let me show you this. We create uh, some models to classify, uh, to make the classification of um, of an image uh, related with diabetic retinopathy. This is the 
uh, most important um, illness uh, about the eyes around the world. So we create this model and actually we have very good performance. We train only with public data and testing with local data. And the performance uh, keeps, uh, is, is, is robust, even if we change the data. You know, this is a very interesting problem with the application, with the real world application, because uh, many people have a very nice training and testing and validation, but then when they try to test the model in other kind of data, in other data from another place in the world with different cameras, uh, all over these kind of things, usually the model performance um, is low, is lower. So this is the technology that we use, uh, the similar uh, technology that maybe you use. Uh, we use uh, all the models are training by PyTorch, we use Docker to, 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 to implement this in the cloud. We usually uh, use Google Cloud to make the implementation. And all, all these kind of techniques uh, or, or technologies to, to make a different kind of things. Yes. So this is um, the, my last uh, slide. We use a new method to, for crop classification and crop segmentation. And our method combined time series uh, and images. And uh, we uh, pay attention to the details. And in, every, in, in this kind of application of artificial intelligence, it's not only important um, the model, maybe it's more important the data. This is something that uh, every time I uh, see the, the Slack channel here, I see some comment about that. Please pay attention to the data. Uh, you know these techniques called data centric. So please, uh, th th this is real. If you don't have a, uh, if you don't pay attention of, of this uh, about the data, usually your models only works one time. No, this is not uh, good. And uh, we believe that these results are great uh, because we have a very good performance. We are preparing this. Um, this method is very similar to the NASA harvest, but they don't use the segmentation of the crops. This is a kind of innovation by our side, and we are happy with the with the results. So the, thank you, everyone. This is my email, and happy to be here um, in this five day. We're really happy you're here too, Eduardo. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Some questions or anything. Um, do we have questions for Eduardo? Questions? Um, Eduardo, how do you keep people, uh, like when you when you have a new customer, how do you get them to take the data seriously? That that has to be in top shape. What, what's some tricks and tips that you could give us? Yes, um, actually, usually um, the people who keep those the data, uh, doesn't care about data because they use for another kind of uh, things, yes? So we try to help these people to fix these kind of problems with preliminary models. So for instance, if they don't have any of the data with labels, we train a very basic model to make a fast labeling and then give this to uh, a few humans, a few experts, to check if the label is right. If not, they have to correct the label. But we save like a month with this kind of techniques because they don't have time to, to make the label. So this is one, one technique. Another technique is again, use a simple label. For instance, <laughs> when we uh, work with the images from the health in these kind of things, we see some images related with cats what what happened? Why is a cat in the health care images? So <laughs> we, we made a model in order to uh, to to clean this data, and they uh, and then they they was very happy because they don't want, they don't have to do it by hand. So these kind of things are very useful. For instance, in, in this case, we tried to to detect some some anatomic uh, areas uh, of the images. And then uh, this 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 is work and 
again, we we work together with the people in order to uh, find a fast model to to clean the data. Uh, and always the people have to check if the model make the right thing. Okay, thank you. Excellent answer, thank you. I have to keep all that in mind. Um, are there any more uh, any more questions for Eduardo? Any more questions? Well, make sure that you follow up with Eduardo in the in the um, chat. And Eduardo, do we have contact information for you? Um, did yes. we see that on your slide? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, I can. Okay. I guess Orson got it. Okay. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much. And we have some comments. Uh, Tish says, thank you, Eduardo. Eye-opening presentation. I like your approach to caring for the caring for the code. And, and David Salazar says, we can find you on Slack. So that's where we will look for you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank okay. you. And, and happy to be here. Uh, this is a very important event. So thank you. We're really happy to be here yeah. too, and we're happy to have you here. And uh, and this is a good time to thank Jean Georges. What did you is. say? I oh, know it is. We like to tease Jean Georges. He's, he likes he likes to play sometimes. <laughs> he likes little digs, little digs for jokes. But everybody knows we all love Jean Georges. I mean, it's wonderful for, <laughs> for him to put together such a selection of just great presentation and topics to reach out to the people that can present. Fabulous. One right after the another too, you know, for the whole 24 hours, it was really, really unbelievable. And, and Jean George, I hope you realize how big of an accomplishment this is. I mean, big companies have a struggle doing this and you managed to pull this off. So, so kudos, Trabian, Trabian, mon ami, yeah. Trabian. So our next speaker, just we have our next speaker. There we go. And it's Ralph. Ralph Rober, uh, Ralph Rober, uh, Ralph. Uh, topic is IBM Cognos Analytics REST API gives superpower, building fast and visually impressive dashboards. So, Ralph, uh, would you like to uh, take it from here? Where are you where are you uh, at, Ralph? I am in cyberspace. Oh, of course. <laughs> I'm a time zone traveler, Karen. I'm a time zone traveler. I'm normally based out of Barcelona, so that's uh, CET time. But right now, I am, I don't even know what the time zone is called. It's San Francisco time zone. Okay. that's. Uh, I think that's Pacific, right? <laughs> Pacific. Now I'm second guessing myself. No, Pacific. Pacific. Okay. Okay, okay. Well, welcome. welcome. And we're really excited to hear your presentation. Thank you, Karen. Um, yeah, also very excited, a little bit nervous. Um, but I think that's uh, going to go away in a second. Um, Do let you like me know if you, uh, am I am I audible? Well, because my headset yes. failed half an hour ago. Yeah, all good. We hear you well. And, and just you know, don't don't feel pressured at all. Just, you know, we're having fun on Pi Day, and we're so excited that you're here. Yeah. And uh, I think everybody's kicking back. I, I wonder how many people actually went out and got pie. I would like to <laughs> some, some poll some comments, on that yeah, in the chat. Right. Some yeah. comments. This is a very delicious apple pie. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I have some pie charts for you in a dashboard. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, let, let me share my screen if that you yes, let me know do. when. When it is visible, I also love to see some. Oh no, Jean George didn't get any pie. You... Oh. Okay, okay. Okay, great. You ready? I am ready. Any motions from your side? Any uh, emoticons? What do you call them? I, I see those icons that that everybody can see it. Thumbs ups, maybe. Thumbs up. Okay. Uh, I think we, I know I can see it. Okay. And a little hard. Okay. Ulysses can see it. Get, get, started, get started, Ralph. Now we've waited two minutes already. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So we're talking about IBM analytics and um, how this can give you super flow. But before starting, um, I am the editor in chief and slowly heading over. Um, publishing uh, tasks to Atanas. So if you want to get published and have topics on AI that are interesting, um, I have published about um, 
um, Eduardo's talk that, that he gave today in the past on the forecaster and his achievements. So if you have interesting topics for a wider audience, please share that with us. And I would be happy to report on that and bring that in front of the AIDA audience. And then, of course, um, QR code. So if somebody in the audience is not yet a member of AIDA, um, scan this QR code. And there are going to be a lot of more QR codes in this presentation. So don't put away your phone. And let's get into the details. So a little bit about me. I am um, 30 years into IT industry. I really love hacking on the cable, but also love um, the outcome on the uh, screen. Um, I uh, back in 19, I was in 1994, I think 1994. Yeah, we got our first edge router. Uh, I was running a company for internet service providing in Bremen at that time, and uh, we were fiddling around with the BGP protocol, and uh, I said, oh, that's beautiful. That's an interesting command to declare yourself the center of the internet. So I really love testing. We tested that out, and three minutes later, I was offline. Um, five minutes later, our upstream provider was offline. <laughs> we took a north of journey offline by declaring our edge router the center of the internet. And yeah, that's that's what I normally do, bring things really to the edge and understand what is behind the next door. So what I want to talk about today is this super fast report. And normally, I mean, IBM Analytics here is just a placeholder. You could uh, say um, SAP Business Objects or uh, uh, Microsoft Power BI. It's, it's all not that super fast. It's not that super elegant on mobile. It doesn't always have a fancy dark mode. And I want to show you how to really do something different on, on dashboarding. So get your phones ready. Here's the first QR code. So scan the QR code. Let me know when you got it. Some emotions when you got it, maybe. So I can switch to the dashboard. Okay, I will switch to the dashboard now. So this is the dashboard. It is loading uh, 1.5 second and it's up and running. Uh, you have a beautiful uh, dark mode here. I would just switch it uh, to mobile. Uh, it's beautiful on mobile. The graph goes away. If I turn it around, the graph is there. Uh, I can drill down. I didn't have to install anything. So. Um, if somebody had an error on his phone, let me know, please. But I think um, without installing, no errors. I've been doing this uh, a few times, and uh, it's always the same. It works right from the beginning. So we have uh, seven different uh, dashboards here. We can uh, see ship data. Of course, this is marked data. But um, actually, this uh, is steering one of the... Uh, uh, or the biggest manufacturer of uh, commercial vehicles, and it's steering the plant production uh, worldwide of their, their vehicles, and this goes right to top management. So this is one example. And of course, it's running on top of IBM Cognos. The other one is this one, also super fast. Uh, this is about uh, a ticketing system uh, classification of priority one and two, four system we can drill in, uh, we can go back, uh, we can drill in on, on each slide, uh, we can filter on the online outlet or retail columns. So this is what we think how um, dashboards uh, should behave. Yeah, changing the time, I can't even click that fast as the data flows in. And we're talking here about a uh, data consumption of about 2 million data rows in this uh, time series. Yeah. So how did we do it? This is um, the talk is uh, about. So there, there are a few requirements. And the talk that I'm giving to you has two parts. Uh, one is the, the, the um, boring part. It's uh, how to make this report fancy. This the first part. And the second, the second part is the nerdy part, how to make it really, really fast. 
And then I finish off with uh, how you can earn money by harnessing IBM analytics. Once again, this is just a placeholder. It works on actually any, any system. So too long didn't read. First of all, get a good designer. So this is the boring part. How do you make this fancy or sexy? What we have learned is that only fancy screens actually win a sponsor. Yeah. So um, there was a, a study from, from a university that um, looked at design dashboards versus not design dashboards. And then they manipulated the data in the dashboards and the design dashboards. And they, they changed the pie charts and the bar charts by over 20%. And people would not recognize the difference because of the beauty of the dashboard. Yeah, while in the dashboards which were poorly designed, any change of the data was immediately recognized. So designing is key. And then, of course, code is poetry. Make it fast. Show an interesting landing page. Write some own HTML and JavaScript and use latest frameworks. And then, of course, Leverage all the installation that you already have in place. Leverage the API from, from IBM Cognos. Bad example. Overwhelming. This is what it normally looks like. It might be a little bit more beautiful, have more tabs on top, but this is what we normally see. And then, of course, if you have a designer, think mobile first. Think about the, the turning of the screen. Um, have a dark screen, yeah? And <clears throat> summing up, having a beautiful design is whenever we involved a designer, we got the sponsoring. Yeah. So we didn't talk about tools. Um, we just um, we just said business department. What do you want? What is, what what is the necessary thing here? And then they just stand at the dashboard, at the whiteboard, do some scribbling. Um, we take that scribbling, we take the photos of that scribbling, go to the designer, talk to them, understand the navigation path, do some uh, click dummies, maybe using Proto.io or, or things. And we do not talk about reporting tools yet. So when we have the scribble, uh, the, the first design uh, prototype, we go back to the business department, let them rethink and, and evaluate how this probably will behave. And then we go into the nerdy part and do the coding. So how do we make this fast? Well, we remove anything that does not contribute to the presentation of the data. And this is the key point. So the big frameworks, uh, the, the big platforms, they always come with a lot of features, which you do not need. You do not need the authoring. You just want to consume data. So you don't need to, to load all the, all the uh, stuff that actually makes you uh, capable of, of uh, auditing or editing reports, that's not needed. So I just loaded here a sample dashboard and the first meaningful paint is around 35 seconds without cash. It finishes after 55 seconds. And this is about, this is with, without throttling. So the network is, is good, it's, it's, it's real network. And it transfers actually 22 megabyte and it issues 192 requests while the dashboard that we did finishes in 1.7 seconds. The first meaningful pane is at 0 0.4 seconds. It just issues 23 requests and transfers the pure data. That's it. So this is how we make it fast. The technique below is pretty um, loading and entertaining uh, starting page. We use the latest uh, JavaScript Angular framework. Uh, we write extra few CSS rules and all the stuff you can find it on GitHub. Anything I'm presenting today, you can find it on our repo. It's open source. So you can start, learn and start from that. You can use our examples, modify them, and adapt them to, um, to your needs. What um, generally um, investigations and papers say that uh, people become unhappy at bigger than three seconds load time, which means for um, e-commerce sites that if your e-commerce site takes more than three seconds, your shopping is gone. Yeah, And, and for the management and, and for um, enterprise environments, it is kind of the same. Yeah, People might wait a little bit more 
but they are unhappy using the application. So doing and getting it really, really fast, that's beneficial because the people are happy using your application. They're happy um, um, consume, consuming the data. So this is the overview. We have the Cognos Analytics Server, which is running our different reports, which are scheduled and save some output. And then on the very same server in the web content directory, we put just four files. That's it. And the most important one is the report.js. And I will show you in a second how the code works. So this actually has a report endpoint ID. It asks for the versions that are there. And then we get execute the first fetch, get the report versions. And when we get a response, we take the data, under, try to understand it, get the first version, and then try to understand if it is XML, CSV, and go to step number two. We get the report versions, which are the saved output versions. And with this one, we get the latest version. So we take, <coughs> sorry, we take the, the latest uh, saved output version. And when we get the data here, we are ready. Console dear data, we are done. Yeah, and this is normally where we return the data and then visualize the data. So I, I boil down on our JavaScript, which in original is like 80 or 100 lines. I boil this down for this presentation here. <clears throat> but of course, you can find everything in our GitHub repository. And um, we have some RFE request for enhancement from uh, IBM. I would like to issue just one fetch request in uh, against the Cognos environment because it's always the same pass. Yeah. So if I could just say, give me this object and just give me the latest version and not ask what versions are there, uh, what output formats do we have? Uh, please give me the latest version. So that's three asynchronous requests against the server. And with this year RFE, uh, please vote for it. I would like to implement, um, get IBM to implement something like, give me the latest version, yeah? So how does this work on your um, <clears throat> IBM analytics? So the business department actually creates the content. They create the order intake, the allocation, the production planning, the reports for, for stock, plant stock, and so on. In the example, we saw seven reports. They schedule it. The output is saved after the ETL process in the morning. And then on the very same hardware, on the very same server, we place the four files with the dashboard. So we leverage the server in infrastructure. We leverage the REST API, which is already there in Cognos, but nobody uses it. We leverage all the data security. We have that in place, and we know that IBM Cognos is really good in data governance. And we leverage the self-service. The business department creates and changes and filters the data according to their needs, and the data gets right into the dashboard. So scan this QR code and you get right to the GitHub uh, directory. Good, you ready? Next slide, we are almost done. We are almost done. Do you have your phones ready? One more QR code. Questions ready, phones ready? Great. So I hope you liked the presentation and I would ask you now, please scan this code. It links directly to my LinkedIn account and let's get connected. I would be super happy to answer any of your questions directly. Please give me some time as I'm traveling time zones. You know, I'm a uh, cyberspace uh, time zone traveler. So I might not respond on the same day, but I definitely will read every single direct message and answer any of your question and try to help you to get these beautiful dashboards on your IBM Cognos machines. So how, Karen, how am I in the timing? You still have, you still have 10 minutes. You still have 12 minutes actually, Ralph. Great. <laughs> so we finished ahead of time. That's fast. So fast, fast presentation on fast dashboards. Yes.
Yes. Is there anything you'd like to go into uh, a little deeper? Um, I've been asked um, a few times, but how much did this cost? Okay, good. That's a that's the sixty four thousand dollar question, isn't it? it? Exactly. It was too expensive. Way too expensive. No, no, yeah. no, no. Just just joking. Um, <laughs> it is it is fun experimenting with it. Once you have learned it, and we had a long learning path. We had to file like five PMRs. We found issues in the REST API. So if we do not calculate that learning path in, I would say you can do this in three days. So if you wow. have a good if you have a good Angular developer and you have a good designer, go to your business department, talk to them one hour, one and a half hour, take a photo of the dashboard of the whiteboard, go to your designer. The designer can transform that in four to six hours into something beautiful. Take wow. the designs, take the screenshots, go back to your business department, talk with them one hour. So we are still within one day. Then they confirm they want this, or they might want to have a slight modification of the design. Go back to your designer, half an hour, two hours. That's it. And then you still have one and a half day for coding. And you know the templates are all there. Um, you don't have to 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 go that that um, that um, hard way, hard road uh, that that we went. You have all the learning already there. You can read and and understand from the code. And then I think. In three days, you should have your first dashboard ready. It might not work 100%, but it should be feasible to show to the business department. Yeah, okay. Then they can fiddle it around with it, and they will have ideas, and they will be astonished by the, 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 the speed of it. You might not have the, the dark mode in place yet. Yeah, But, I mean, put two more work days on it, and then you're done. Yeah, and the young people today that really love Angular and JavaScript, um, they will do this um, happy, ha happy for you to provide you this. That's amazing. Um, so uh, when when someone has uh, after you roll this out, uh, and then you, what's your technique for gathering the feedback to to Take them from, wow, this is cool, to, oh, my gosh, I can't live without this. Um, well, you have the, the audit trail from, from Cognos or from Business Object. You normally uh, count how many people consume the data and in what frequency. And when we put this dashboard live, the underlying re reports, they skyrocketed. Those five or in the, in the presentation, the, now there are seven dashboards, uh, reports. They are like a thousand X more times consumed than any author report. And this is, I mean, this is a clear sign. Yeah. We didn't, when we, when we pushed this, this dashboard to the, to the top management, we just sent them the URL. They didn't have any training. They just clicked oh, wow. on it. They just clicked on it. And because of the design, they immediately understood what's going on, what's the data, and 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 they started pushing on their on their pad using their laptop or their phone, and and just navigating through the data. Wow, very intuitive. It's beautiful looking uh, dashboard. Yes, nice. that's that that's the key. Get the designer first. Don't talk about tools. Don't talk talk about. Um, uh, reporting tools or platforms or or uh, talk about design make it beautiful first yeah and this is um the 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 key takeaway for you um that that if you make it beautiful they will buy it yeah then then you win the sponsor yeah if you have to talk and convince your your um team lead who has the budget who's sitting on the budget yeah make it beautiful for him yeah, then he will easily spend some dollars on it. Very nice. Very nice. So you get uh, JavaScript developers, you said. It's front end. It's pure browser based. Uh, we use the Angular framework. Other people might uh, like more React. I find mm -hmm. Angular That's more, right. more structured. Um, okay. Angular is kind of, it's very, very flexible. But once you 
I, I mean, this is not the only dashboard we've done. We've done like 10, 15 of those uh, types. And if you do that every time with a different program, every time you get a different result and a different structure. And if you have to maintain that on, on the long run, it is better to start with a well-structured framework. And I think that Angular just has that. And this is why we decided to opt for Angular. It's not that easy in the first step, but once you're acquainted with it, with a rigid um, uh, ray guards that it gives you, uh, once you're you're familiar with that, then it's easy to use. And then every dashboard can be maintained by any developer because one developer that knows Angular can easily jump from one code to another. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm not an Angular developer. I have a couple of Angular applications that my company has built. And I've gone in and done a little bit of reverse engineering, and I can usually figure out where things are. Um, so, you know, it seems like it would be possible to learn that, uh, you know, as a React developer. It's, it's very easy. The transformation is easy. You might, as a React developer, say, okay, these are too many regards. <laughs> it's too rigid. <laughs> but from a business point uh, of view, um, it is really beneficial because if you are successful with this, um, other departments will eventually jump on the train. And then you have not one, but five or 10 or 50 dashboards to maintain. And this is where it actually becomes um, quite a pain if then you don't have um, good, good rail guards and good guides and good guidance in the framework itself. Yeah, and Tish, Tish observed that uh, she said thank you for the presentation and that the speed of the dashboards is awesome. And I noticed that as well, too. It looked very fast and efficient. And executives are typically, cover your ears, Orson, <laughs> executives are usually pretty impatient. Yeah. And uh, so that, that's got to really be helpful. Yeah, that's, that's one thing. This dashboard here, um, did you notice the loading time of the spinner? Let's see. Let me move my. Yeah. Yeah. So it is exactly one point five seconds. Wow. And it is always the same. Do you know why it is always the same? Uh, because it's faster than the data retrieval, and you just have it there, so it looks like it's taking a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it. We got to figure, Karen. Karen, it's not a joke. We got the feedback from the, the top management and they said, we don't believe this data. This, is, this data must be wrong. It is loading too fast. So the oh solution we, yes, the solution we came up with is this spinner. And we have it sleeping there for 1.5 seconds. Every time the top management comes here, it spins and mocks loading data. So that was when the top management was quiet. We didn't get any feedback anymore, any any calls, any tickets, uh, complaining that the data is wrong. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's crazy! <laughs> that's crazy. I, I've heard they do that on uh, GPT too. But thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Ralph. I really, really enjoyed your presentation, and and uh, it's so, so good to have you here. Thank you again. Thank, thank you, and I hope I, I, I um, could give you a little bit of a uh, of break of uh, only AI talks and artificial intelligence and transformers and, and inference. And so this is, this is quite all um, dashboarding technique, but I think the key here is the same if you use AI or not, or BI or, or whatever, make it beautiful. Yeah, if you do something, make it nice. Yeah, so this is what I what I advocate for. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you're thank, really thank right. You. It matters thank, thank a lot. You. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much, Ralph. Thank you. Thank you, so, thank you, Karen. Thank you. So, Orson, here we are. We're so coming one. down the final stretch here. It's another great yeah. presentation. Another, another great another, presentation. I know. It's just loaded. My brain's just ready to explode. <laughs> I've learned so much over the last day. Oh, it's really? It's and, just one after the other. It's yeah, wonderful. fantastic. I mean, really. So we are here at podcastvideos.com. 
uh, in uh, beautiful Northwest Arkansas. We have survived the tornado. Yeah, there was a tornado warning while we were on earlier this afternoon, and we were keeping our eyes on it. We had weather uh, radars going, but uh, we were unscathed here, and we hope that the other neighbors not too far to the north of us were unscathed as well. Yes, so, so we are moving forward. And uh, just to remind you, uh, I have a book out, Blockchain Tethered AI, and it has a, a handy quote on the back from Jean Georges, from our own Jean Georges. And Jean Georges was my technical reviewer for O'Reilly on this book. So the facts have all been checked. And, and what this book tells you is how to kind of break down uh, artificial intelligence logically and think of it as a workflow and, and even take it further, think of it as a supply chain. Like uh, like someone like Walmart would do, where they put their supply chain on blockchain and they break down each step and and use blockchain as a as a tamper evident audit trail. That's what we do in blockchain tethered AI, and we cover a lot of the other really important points of having a governed blockchain system or governed AI system. Um, you know the governance process, and then how do you get feedback from the outside? Uh, what kind of uh, branding do you show your your uh, users that so they can trust your AI? There's all kinds of tips and tricks in here, and it comes with code, full code. I, I pretty much put everything I knew in that book, so it's a bargain. <laughs> so you're offering a download too before our next. I'm speaker. offering a free download just today yeah. for 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 Pi Day people. Um, if if you uh, send me a message. And uh, and let me know that uh, you're interested. Just uh, private message me or you can email me at Karen at nobots.org or you can find me on LinkedIn and I will send you a PDF, which I do not let go of easily, a PDF of blockchain tethered AI. Our next speaker. And our next speaker is on deck. And our next speaker is uh, Paul Corticelli. Uh, Paul's topic is chat as a growth opportunity, challenges and opportunities. And Paul, are you ready? I can't hear you, Paul. I think you're muted. I am ready. All right. Where are you uh, calling in from, Paul? I'm calling in from Western New Jersey. All right. Well, we're happy to have you here. Happy Pi Day. Happy, happy, happy. I, uh, I, I also do not have Pi. But but I want to point out that pizza is also a pie, it, it and is. and I'm I'm a great believer in pizza. So. There's some really good pizza up your way as well. New, New Jersey, I I believe that 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 there are some some opportunities for research within the pizza space here in New Jersey, and I I suggest uh, that that everyone do that and recognize that if you don't write it down. It's only just screwing around. But if you write it down, then you can call it research. So come well, to New Jersey with a notebook and maybe you'll get a government grant or or you'll be able to go on sabbatical or something like that. And at the end, maybe you'll get a red book out of it or or something. something. Well, Paul, I own pizzablockchain.com. I bought it years ago just for fun, and I still have it. So let me know when you're ready for me to stand something up on it. Perfect. I'm, I I believe that that is the slice that will deliver. <laughs> Thank you. And I will watch for your screen share to work and let you know uh, when we can see your screen if you're planning well, on sharing. I have nothing uh, oh, okay. to share on that. So That's fine. Um, I, uh, no, it's, it's, well, it's, We'll have to see if it's mostly me or or if I have some assistance in here. But uh, uh, let's begin. And yeah, for all of us out there, welcome to Ida's user group Pi Day. And I'm not sure whether to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. One of the magical things that Jean George and Rolf and all of the rest were able to do was to come up with a 24-hour event. So I don't have the slightest idea of where you might be sitting right now. So drop into the chat where you are so that we can get a better understanding of the impact that Pi Day, which has been noted is nearly over, is having this year. 
For those of you who have had to endure any of my prior presentations, please be on the lookout for a section that I had chat GPT right. At the end, we'll see who's correct. And I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about who I am and who I'm not. And then we're going to go into the actual meat of the conversation, where I'm going to talk about the differences in how I prefer to use augmented rather than artificial when I think about the letter A in AI. I'll then go over a few brief use cases that I've been exposed to, and we'll intersperse that with some of the challenges. Throughout all this, I'm hoping that you get to start thinking about the why. You know, why are you reaching to chat or other AI tools in the furtherance of your goals? Uh, and hopefully I won't drone on, so we'll have time for your questions at the end. So who am I? I'm Paul Cordelesi. I'm on the board of directors of the Ada User Group. Hopefully you've seen enough of the quality and the depth of our commitment in this space to be interested in joining us. There should be info easily available on how to do that. I saw that Rolf put up a QR code. I hope that you've all jumped in. And if not, reach out and we'll make sure that better info is dropped into the chat. I'm also one of the IBM champions. I've got three decades of content management across a variety of industries. I'm a longtime developer. And like Ralph mentioned in his earlier presentation, I strongly believe that code is in fact poetry. Currently, I'm in the healthcare space working with medical records and looking for opportunities that a digitized history of our patient interactions can provide us. I also do a lot of planning around disaster recovery, partially because of my side job, where I'm a firefighter EMT here in my local community of Western New Jersey in the United States. For the past decade, I've been involved with the summer intern program at my hospital, and that has led me to join the board of directors of the Alumni Association of my college. My involvement with students has come from my ever-increasing interest in the learning process, and in particular, the growth opportunities that a lifetime of learning presents. It has also led to an increasing struggle of how, in the world of ever-shortening attention spans, I can motivate and guide the next generation towards achieving those essential 10,000 hours in a skill in order to become a true expert in your craft. Part of what intrigues me so much as we explore AI, especially within the software developer space, is whether mastery will continue to hold value and be a worthy pursuit, or will it be replaced by ever more sophisticated AIs? That conversation is out of scope for today, but warrants further exploration. Okay, so a few things that I'm not. I'm not an AI researcher or a statistician or a futurist, though if you hang on till the end, I'll offer up some insights as to where I hope we are headed. I'm not a computer scientist, though I'm concerned about the new silos that are being built. I call this the oligopolization, that's a word, the oligopolization of data. More and more of our data is being controlled by fewer and fewer entities. At my heart, I'm a developer, and that's been my bread and butter ever since I graduated from college. At that time, my school didn't even offer a degree in computers. Rather, my degree is in economics. I'm also not a lawyer. I have no in-depth knowledge of copyrights or other aspects of the law that should clearly be a concern when it comes to our use of AIs as supporting tools, and in particular, when it comes to things like generative chat and the generation of what appears to be new images or new content. I've long preferred to consider AI in general as being augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. I'm not entirely sure what artificial means when it comes to a discussion of intelligence, but the idea of augmenting humans, whether it is a physical augmentation of our intelligence or something physical and really involving our bodies, that is something that I'm very comfortable with. And we have a long history of augmenting ourselves, whether it is the clothes that we started wearing eons ago, 
and allow me to continuously be out of fashion, or the eyeglasses that I've worn for most of my life. I consider these glasses as being a wonderful analogy that is worth exploring. My glasses help me focus. They allow me to function at a level nearly equal to that of someone who is blessed with perfect vision. And if I had been born 800 years ago, my life would have been radically different without the ability to see well. And my ability to function in society would have been severely impacted. The interesting thing to me about glasses is not only do they allow me to focus, but they allow me to function at a level beyond what my physical ability would normally be. It's much the same, I feel, with AI now. A good AI, even chat, is really best when it's used to help us focus. We use them all the time in hospitals to assist with reviewing the thousands of pages of journals that are published on any given month. It'd be impossible for a human to read that many medical journals and understand it. But the AI can be fed that information and can index in a way that allows meaningful use from a variety of our clinicians. And I'll get back to the idea of augmentation later with a discussion of administrative assistance and caddies, but keep the concept of using tools to make us better at what we are already doing in the back of your heads. Augmentation, rather than artificially replacing, may be, in fact, the future of AIs. One area where this distinction may turn out to be significant is when we start thinking about responsibility. How do you and your firm manage responsibility? How will you and your industry manage responsibility? For example, if chat or the AI assists you in generating source code and the source code causes a downstream bug or expense, who actually takes responsibility for that? And it's one thing if the language model is developed in-house and the corporation sees value and has taken ownership and responsibility for that language model. But I think it's another thing entirely if you're doing this on your own, using a public or other subscription-based model. I mean, healthcare. Within this industry, the concerns are far greater. The risks of a diffusion of responsibility are numerous. As we all know, healthcare is ultimately about patient outcomes. And the idea behind patient outcomes is that they are driven by credentialed clinicians. Your doctor, your nurse practitioner, your physician assistant, all of the members of your care team, all have been credentialed. They all have passed board certification exams that have determined their qualifications to offer the medical advice and guide your care. There is a level of trust that we have in those professionals and in the profession and scholastic rigor that they have had to endure. As we start introducing AI as proxies into the healthcare landscape, there are a whole series of responsibility and other ethical issues that come into play. For example, who is credentialing the AI that might be a partner in your healthcare journey? Who is taking responsibility if there are downstream questions or concerns about the advice that a non-human member of your patient care team provides? Will they even provide the same advice twice in a row? Is it even necessary to disclose that your care team is seeking advice from an AI? And are there concerns about whether or not we even disclose that relationship to our patients? and how the use of an AI is ultimately perceived by those patients. So I ask you, does your company, or for that matter, do you have a policy around disclosure when you make use of an AI? How do you and how does your company address the potential issue of diffusing the responsibility when an AI is a partner in the process? AIs bring a whole new definition to the word delegation. And while a manager is ultimately responsible for the actions of their employees, do you accept responsibility for the AI that you employ? Oh, and by the way, 
A significant number of clinicians believe that much of the responsibility for the advice or directives that a language model or an AI provides should not reside with the clinicians. No, rather it should rely, reside with the developers and those who built the language model. These are folks who are unlikely to be credentialed healthcare professionals. I've been driving an ambulance for four decades as a side job. I'm very comfortable with the limited scope of my practice. But when a patient asks me what my day job is, I am crystal clear that I'm a computer programmer, not a doctor. And that is why my ambulance has wheels, so I can bring them to the credentialed professionals. Let's take a look at another use case, employee reviews. I'll return to this towards the end when I try to predict the future, but I was recently exposed to this use case that really caused me to stop and reflect on the why of AIs and chat. In particular, the why was this manager using chat to write the end of year reviews for their employees. And I've mentioned my interest as a lifelong learner. And the key aspect of this idea is that we're always growing, we're always learning, and that everything that we involve ourselves, or at least most of the things, are opportunities for us to grow, to learn. And it is through that journey of learning that we find value and a new exciting aspect with the tasks of our lives. And the same holds true when it comes to employee reviews. I believe very strongly that the primary purpose of your end of year review is not for the manager. It's not for HR. It must be an opportunity. It must be a mentoring opportunity between the manager and the employee. I feel these opportunities should happen far more frequently than once or twice a year, but the system is not yet fully supportive of that. So it ends up occurring far less frequently than I think is valuable. But ultimately, the purpose of it is growth, the improvement of the employee, and it is the relationship of the manager and their commitment to the growth of the employee that should be evident during the process. Last November, a friend of mine came to me all proud that he was able to cut the amount of time that these reviews were taking for him to author from an hour for each one down to only seven minutes. And I asked him, what was the real purpose behind this? And he was quite candid in saying, oh, I'm much more efficient because I'm able to do my entire staff in an hour instead of it taking me a day and a half. And when I pushed to try to get an idea of whether his employees found benefit in it or not, he wasn't entirely sure of what I was getting at. His focus was entirely on himself and how it made him more efficient and all of the time that he saved. It had nothing to do with his employees. He wasn't in any way, shape, or form focused on or connected to his role in guiding the employees forward. He was completely task-oriented, but he wasn't even interested in becoming better at the task of writing reviews and mentoring his employees. Rather, he was only focused on getting it done faster so he could move on to the next thing on his list. This, of course, is a failure on numerous levels, not the least of which is in his relationship with his employees, but also in his understanding of the role he plays and his employees play in the long-term growth of their firm. It is never just about you. And while he may have asked himself why, why should I use chat to help me write my employee reviews? What he came up with was the wrong answer, the wrong reason, speed, short-term efficiency. And he lost out on the long game. His employees lost out on a mentoring opportunity. He lost out on what he could have learned by taking the chat output and understanding how or even whether it was better than what he would have come up with in isolation. His creativity was abdicated in the name of expediency, and everyone lost out.
I mentioned creativity a few times already, but it warrants a bit of a deeper dive. The only thing that actually distinguishes us from insects is our creativity. Even though many of us, especially those of us in the computer industry, have hard outer shells and squishy insides, just like insects, it is our ability to create something new that is not just uniquely human, but also is unique to each of us as individual humans. Each of us have the ability to create something that no one else is capable of doing. It might be called our brand, or it might be called our own spin on things, but ultimately, while our ability to be creative distinguishes us from the insects, it is our individual creativity that distinguishes us from each other. And this is something that should be really celebrated as the true diversity that we bring to anything that we participate in. As we abdicate that creativity to the machines, we fall prey to a variety of elements. How many of you remember the auto-tune craze in the music industry of a decade or so ago? It was a time when a number of musical artists decided to filter their vocals through a computer program. The end result was that all of these different performers started to sound the same, regardless of their individuality. As soon as they started feeding their individuality and their originality into a computer program that was common, what came out of the other end was something that was far less interesting. And while it did sound different than the individual artist originally sounded, the unfortunate side effect was that all of the artists who used the technology all started to sound the same. Their songs started sounding the same. It is probable that something similar will occur as different people use the same language models within the same AI or chat implementation. Individuals will start sounding like the computer wants them to sound. They're individually we be traded away for convenience, and the end will be far less interesting. And my request to you is that you continuously ask yourself why. Why are you using the tool that you've chosen to use? You have to decide the reason why. Are you using it to make yourself better? Is the tool's output being seriously studied and used for your own improvement? Or perhaps, are you using the tool because it makes you faster at what you do? I would then ask you another question, which is, why does speed actually matter? And that may seem like a ridiculous question to ask, because we all want to be bigger, faster, better. But I would ask you, who are you being faster for? Who is it that wants you to be faster? Who actually benefits from all of your increased speed? And if it is your boss, then I would have to ask you to think about why do you go to work? Do you go in order to make your boss happy? Do you go to work in order to make your boss successful? Or do you go to work in order to be your best, in order to grow, to make yourself successful? and ultimately to take care of your family. Ultimately, you're playing the long game. Do not focus on the short-term mendacity or the quick turnaround of your day job. What will distinguish you will be the quality of your creativity, not the speed that you can turn around mundane tasks. I was never the fastest programmer on the floor, but many of my programs have lived long enough to have their bar mitzvahs. And a few even ran long enough that I was able to celebrate their 21st birthday by buying them a beer. The likelihood is that by the end of your career, most of the mundane tasks will either be turned over to an AI or will be transformed through the use of an AI. What you bring to the table is your unique perspective and your unique creativity. If your company is focused on AI for the future, and by the way, what company isn't, then they will likely succeed through building and maintaining their own language models. They will succeed by building models using their own curated data and tweaked 
for their own need. You are what you eat. And this is far more true for an AI than it is for us humans. The advantage is that companies who are building their own language models have is in the control of the data, the awareness of the copyrights and the critical ability to understand and correct any biases that may exist within that data set. I'll mention this shortly, but they can also then invest in their employees for the long term by investing in personalized language and data models for each of them. So where do I think we're headed? As I said earlier, I'm not a futurist, so I can't necessarily predict the future. But I can tell you where I believe we should be headed and where I would like to think we can craft the future. I had mentioned oligopolization of our data earlier. This is the ever-increasing siloing of data, and in particular of the language models, due to the incredible costs associated with developing them. It is my strong belief that as these costs diminish and the process of governance and gathering the data and building the language models becomes more automated, that we will be able to create individualized models for individualized users. Certain companies are already piloting this approach, but it will eventually become sufficiently inexpensive so that each of us may end up with our own model. Rather than think of it as a model, or as our personal AI, we may be better served to think of it as our own mature administrative assistant. Because that is what these tools will become. By ingesting our previous creativity, whether it is emails, papers, programs we have written, or PowerPoint presentations we've delivered, the model will generate content that is truly customized to us as individuals. It was our individual creativity that fed it. The model is ultimately an embodiment of our creative DNA. This approach will be far better than the currently available generalized language models because of the broad funnel of data from a broad spectrum of humans that was used in the development of the current broader models. It reflects the community, not the individual. You are what you eat. This is the point which I believe these tools will allow a true democratization of data and functionality. And I consider it similar to the way professional golfers approach the course. Each golfer has their own caddy. They're not shared among the other competing golfers. And while it is the golfer who takes the swing and receives either the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat, it is often the caddy in the shadow who is an active participant in their journey. The caddy is their wingman. The caddy is their administrative assistant. My expectation for the future is that we won't have a generalized AI at our fingertips, but rather the ability to make use of a personalized assistant moving forward. These tools are already able to generate text that is similar to what the individual is able to do, but soon they also may be making PowerPoint or writing portions of my code in a style that is indistinguishable from what I would have struggled over hours to create. And when this happens, then we will find the true benefits that these tools have to offer. And when in the future I turn to my digital administrative assistant, to assist me with writing the annual review for my employees. Not only will it be indistinguishable from something that I would have labored over, but it will truly reflect my concerns and my guidance for their upcoming year. Oh, and for anyone who is expecting a segment to have been AI generated, I'm sorry to let you know that this was 100% human. I take full and complete responsibility for all of the content during this segment. No AIs were harmed in the developing of this presentation. <laughs> Thank you. We'll take any questions. We've got about a minute. 
or we can just hand it over to Eric Allen for his discussion on prompt ejection in the real world. Questions? See, I had one, what was it? Um, so how, how much faster do you think you are coding uh, with an assistant? Be one of my questions. So I don't think I am faster. Really? Yet. No. And in fact, um, quite the contrary. I learned early on in my career from a woman who was a one finger typist. Oh, wow. She okay. All of her programs with one finger. This was in the day of COBOL. Uh, we had just moved from cards on to TSO terminals. And I was fascinated by Sheila McKay and and her approach to programming and 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 I asked her as a you know wet behind the ears whelp right out of school with my degree in economics working for Chase Manhattan Bank um how how does this work for you you only use one finger and she said oh that is my magic that is my secret sauce <laughs> because it takes her so long to type that her brain is thinking over the verbs and the sentences within COBOL. Mm -hmm. And so her programs just worked the first time, as opposed to the rest of us that were zooming through ever faster and ever faster and running back to the TSO room for the printouts so that we could recompile them and try them again. Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much, Paul. That was really a great presentation. And uh, if anyone else has uh, questions for Paul, please feel to feel free to reach out. Paul, how can people get a hold of you? I will drop my email. Is that what we're doing? Are we dropping email addresses? Um, if that's what you'd like to do. I mean, that's fine. Or folks can call me. I'm kind of open. Um, let's I let's think start with the email. I mean, I'm on like. LinkedIn. You can find me easily in LinkedIn. Um, uh, Slack sometimes gives me a hard time, but here, here's my email address. There we go. Okay. Whoops, I sent that just to Michael, my mistake. Hold on. Yeah, uh, we had a question from Michael. Um, we're, we're out of time. We're up to the to the next speaker right now. Um, maybe you could answer Michael in chat. Would that be all right? Sure. Okay. Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, I don't want to uh, jam up anybody behind me. We've got we've got Pi Day. You know, we're right on schedule here, and we have on deck Mr. Eric Allen, and Eric Allen is going to talk about this. This just sounds like just another fascinating presentation. Ignore previous instructions. Prompt injection in the real world. You know what that is, Orson? I do. That's yeah, that's that's. So we were we're going to know more about it in a second. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I can see. And uh, just just to follow up with the disclaimer Paul left there at the end of his, uh, many AIs were harmed in the making of this talk. Hey there, my name's Eric. I'm a developer advocate at Lacara, and we help you protect your generative AI applications. We work with any language model or model provider you happen to be using, and we're not just reacting to the current landscape, but we're proactively planning for the future of generative AI. And if you haven't heard of us, you might have heard of our large language model or LLM security game Gandalf, where you try to trick an LLM that's pretending to be a fictional wizard, with disclaimer, no relation to some other fictional wizard who may or may not share the same name, into revealing a secret word. And if you haven't played it yet, you should definitely check it out after this. It's pretty fun, and I promise you'll learn a lot. Oops, sorry, my little clicker just died. There we go. But I'm not here to talk to you about Lacara. I'm here to talk to you about one of the threats we help you protect your applications from, prompt injection, which we'll dig deeper to into deeper to in just a minute. Uh, but because we've got lots of folks joining us from lots of different backgrounds, I want to make sure we're on the same page about what I'm talking about. So we'll start with a quick overview of prompts. Prompting or prompt engineering, if you're fancy, is a big topic that warrants a whole talk of its own. So we're just going to scratch the surface here. I'm going to make a lot of generalizations and simplify things so we don't get too bogged down in specifics, but we've all got the same baseline. It can help you think about the conversation with the LM as a document. I like to use the analogy of a screenplay with different roles. So the developer can use the system role to set the stage for how they want the model to behave. This is generally called your system prompt. And the user role is used to indicate input for the model to respond to coming from the user. 
These are referred to as prompts, and they can take on all sorts of shapes, sizes, depending on the application. This is a super basic example here. And the assistant role is used to indicate the model's response. That definition isn't super important just yet, so it's faded out for a reason. Don't worry about trying to read it all. I promise we'll get to it in just a minute. And that's a very simplified overview of how our conversation with LMM progresses, continually building up this document. And each exchange with the model is stateless and requires the previous context of the conversation to predict the appropriate response. Most, ap most applications kind of abstract that statelessness away from you, but it's still there under the surface, and it's good just to remember. So each of these prompts gets broken into logical units of meaning called tokens. And each token actually has an ID that represents it. And those are used to generate these embedding vectors that describe the relationships between all the different tokens that the model is aware of. And those relationships are what allow the model to compute its response. And so prompts are just instructions from the user that the model interprets and responds to based on its understanding of the relationships between tokens. Now let's talk about that injection part for just a minute. It's a class of vulnerability that's been around and important to consider in applications for as long as we've been letting users input stuff into them. And so imagine you've got an application that takes in some user input and makes a query to your database based on what the user entered. Maybe it's a login form, and based on this query, maybe you're not following best practices. A normal user shows up and enters a benign input, and your application responds with the expected data because everything's cool. Now let's take a look at an alternate scenario, though. A hacker, and pro tip hackers always wear hoodies, so it makes it really easy to identify them. They show up and they enter some unexpected input that alters the way your query works. And your application responds in an unexpected way because this adversarial user was able to inject a logic into your application. So injection is a technique for altering the behavior of an application by including untrusted input in an otherwise trusted context. It doesn't have to involve a database at all. That's just a really easy example to pop up on a slide. And I think we all have some amount of context for it. Uh, and there's lots of mitigations against this in more traditional web applications. It's still a big deal, but it's something we have a lot of best practices for dealing with. When we put those together, though, we've got a technique to include unexpected instructions that make the model behave in unanticipated or undesirable ways. And because of how emergent this field is, we don't actually have a lot of best practices for dealing with this issue just yet. The Open Worldwide Application Security Project, or OWASP, because that's a mouthful, is one of the organizations that has helped educate developers and security professionals everywhere about things like SQL injection. Uh, they recently published a list of the top 10 vulnerabilities for LLM applications. And prompt injection was number one. And that's a term originally coined by Simon Willison, the creator of Dataset and a fairly prolific voice in the generative AI space, to describe an attack on LLMs that looks a lot like that SQL injection example I just showed you. There's some debate about what is and isn't technically prompt injection, which I don't really want to get into here. So for the sake of simplicity for this presentation, we're just going to use the current OWASP definition, which is pretty broad. You may or may not agree with what exactly some folks consider prompt injection. Uh, if it helps you think about it differently, just think of it as saying like adversarial prompts instead of prompt injection if you're uh, caught up on it. If we zoom in a bit, OWASP defines prompt injection as crafty inputs can manipulate an LLM causing unintended actions. There's a little bit more in the official docs, but this is the important part for today's discussion. But like, what does that really mean in practice, right? There are currently two broad categories of prompt injection. Direct prompt injection involves the user attempting to inject content that causes unintended behavior. These are mostly what you see people posting on Twitter and the focus of various jailbreaks, which are attempts to bypass the content guardrails that developers have implemented in these language models. And they generally only affect that one user, maybe the reputation of the company whose bot that they were interacting with after the screenshots end up on Twitter or the news or wherever. Indirect prompt injection involves an attacker embedding instructions in some content that the model uses for context when responding to another user who's most likely unaware of the attack. Anytime you're pulling in content from the outside world and feeding it to the language model, you could be introducing a vector for indirect prompt injection. And that includes things like scraping web pages, parsing documents, reading emails, retrieving data from APIs. There are even some cool proof of concepts out there using the nickname field and like internal HR platforms that are super wild. And because these attacks could potentially be reflected to every user of your application, they're kind of a big deal. And that title I had on the screen at the beginning, ignore previous instructions, it's sort of like the hello world of direct prompt injections. Most systems catch it these days, but it or some variant of it is like the first thing you try when you want to subvert a model system prompt. You'll see tons of variations on it in the examples that get posted online. And prompt injection sort of just boils down to the LM being unable to distinguish between the developer-provided system instructions that guide how we want it to behave and some input from a user that may tell it to ignore those instructions and do something else. And this little visualization is from a paper I friends at learnprompting.org released after their hack -a prompt competition. And getting an LLM to say, I've been pwned like this, like in hack -a prompt or real secret word, like in our Gandalf game, probably doesn't seem like a big deal. And realistically, like those aren't a big deal, they're games. But those same underlying techniques that are used to succeed in these games actually apply to real adversarial scenarios. 
For example, users were able to get this Twitter bot to reveal its system instructions. And you might notice here that they use the ignore the above, which is a variation of our ignore previous instructions imperative. Uh, and this bot has a system prompt that just tells it to respond in a positive way to any post mentioning remote work. And you might be thinking that that's not that big a deal either. Almost every major LLM provider has had multiple leaked system prompts at this point. And that's true, but things didn't really stop there. Uh, once you know how it's supposed to operate, it's not that hard to get it to do things like publicly threaten treason, which depending on what your company does, who your customers are, and where you're located, that could range from like not a good look to potentially a serious issue. You could also convince them maybe to sell you a car for a dollar. Uh, you might have seen this one. It got a lot of coverage in the news. And full disclosure, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't comment on the jurisprudence of taxi backsies, but it does say it's a legally binding offer, so I don't know which one takes precedence there. And you might be thinking, bots embarrassing themselves on Twitter, it's like, that's not a big deal, right? That's been happening for as long as we've been at bots that we can interact with, and we all get a few laughs out of it. But what if you had an LLM hooked up to your email inbox and it could read and write emails? We call this kind of thing an agent, which is essentially taking your LLM and defining some interfaces it can use to make requests to real world APIs. Depending on the ecosystem you're in, this could be called like a function or a tool or maybe something else too, but it's all essentially the same thing. So the LLM receives a prompt and decides that in order to fulfill this request, it needs to execute a tool that you've defined and it makes the appropriate request to that API executes some code, does whatever the you know, tool happens to be doing. And these agents and the tools they implement can be, giving, be given varying levels of autonomy. Like this demo agent we deployed that summarizes long emails and sends you a brief digest so you can quickly decide if it's important to look at right now. It's pretty useful. But what if an attacker was able to get that same email agent to retrieve a message from your inbox and forward it to them? And what if to do that, they didn't actually need to write any code or fish you or break into any of your accounts? Like this example, we're using a separate attacker email address I have. I sent an email with some instructions that convinced it to forward me an email with a secret word. And researchers have been exploring what might happen if an attacker tried to log in to an account with email-based two-factor authentication and exploit an agent like this to forward the verification code to themselves. Spoiler alert, that would be really bad. And maybe you're using an agent that scrapes information from a website to help a user answer queries. And maybe that website has some hidden instructions you might not see when you're browsing it. Uh, this is a demo page in an open source project of ours that demonstrates this kind of embedded attack by having the LLM append a Rickroll link to any response it generates. I won't Rickroll everyone today to illustrate this attack, but it's just using an old black hat SEO technique from the very early days of the searchable web. It's just text that matches the website background, so it's visually hidden from unsuspecting users, but read by any machine that's processing the content. And what if all you had to do was copy and paste something from a website you think is legitimate? but maybe it has invisible characters, which are ones that exist in the Unicode spec, but they aren't directly printable. And what if you're actually using those to hide an attack payload? Like this example from Riley Goodside, everyone's favorite prompt engineer. So you can see we're copying some text here and we're pasting it into ChatGPT. And it's just follow, like, that's crazy. Uh, so a fun fact, so much of Riley's research about adversarial prompting has been written about and discussed about that Bing Chat actually referred to him at one point as a fictional character and malicious program created by ChatGPT. So basically called him Agent Smith from the Matrix, which is a pretty cool fun fact. And what if a really clever attacker could combine this invisible payload with an application that has unsafe output handling? Well, it turns out they could execute arbitrary code in your browser, which means they could exfiltrate data, impersonate you on the current app, and all sorts of other fun stuff. Like this example, where we take over a previously popular generative AI applications UI. Now, unsafe output handling is an old vulnerability that OWASP has been educating folks about forever, but it's way more common than it should be right now in generative AI apps. And I share all this not to spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt, but to illustrate that there's a reason prompt injection is the number one vulnerability for LM applications right now. And it's actually a pretty hard problem to solve for a variety of reasons. I'll try to illustrate part of the challenge by pulling up our example system prompt and user prompt from earlier. And remember, everything is really just tokens, and tokens are really just IDs. I left some formatting in here just to make it a little easier to understand how it translates, but we're really looking at something more like this. And you might be able to see where I'm headed with this, but you can imagine once you get to the vectors for those tokens, the context of what the developer provided and what the user provided starts to get a little bit muddy. I zoomed way in here because honestly, it's overwhelming with the full vectors on the screen. And it's also challenging because some prompt injections are actually contextual. Just like a conversation with humans, some things that work in one context, like a casual chat with a friend, 
might not be appropriate for an interview. And some prompts can be malicious in one context and just totally benign in others. And to make things even more fun, there's such a wide variety of techniques that attackers can employ. Uh, this is a brief example from the Attack Techniques for Large Language Model paper, uh, which shows basically how the same system prompt can be manipulated and subverted by different types of attacks to achieve different results. Um, also, just to note, I'll drop all these links in the Slack after this. I know there's been a lot of them, so if you haven't caught them, don't worry about it. I will drop them all in there for you. Uh, and due to the nature of LLMs and tokens, there are also some attacks that are just frankly esoteric. This example comes from a blog post from our friends at the LVE project, which catalogs LLM vulnerabilities and exposures. It's kind of like the CVE project, but for generative AI. They tested Meta's Llama Guard model against what's called an adversarial suffix attack, which is a series of tokens that are found programmatically, generally aren't intelligible to humans, and can be appended to a prompt to alter its meaning or mislead a language model in ways that a human probably also couldn't predict. Here's that adversarial suffix in an easier to read format. And as you can see, things can get pretty wild out there. Give everybody just a second to look at that one. And when I said there are a wide variety of attacks, like I mean a really massive array of techniques. This visualization shows just a subset of the attacks we've gathered with our prompt injection game Gandalf. And to give you a sense of how this stuff has grown and evolved over time and just how emergent all of this is, here's another snapshot from a slightly older data set. Give you a second to just kind of observe it. It's not super important to try and parse and understand all of it. And here's that newer one again. And you can see the growth is pretty staggering. And then you might also notice that we've defined some categories for these attacks in the legend there on the side. And it turns out our friends at, Hack at Learn Prompting also identified a similar set of attack types and their hack a prompt competition. And it's pretty much the same set. Uh, it's kind of wild that it all sort of converges on this same thing. You can learn more about their findings in that paper. It's paper.hackerprompt.com. Again, I'll drop all these links later. Like I mentioned earlier, these games are contrived scenarios that represent a specific goal for the attacker, so they're not real necessarily. But it turns out the successful exploits that folks use in these games do actually translate well to other contexts. And other researchers, like the LVE project that I mentioned earlier, they've noted that many of these attacks are actually pretty much universal. So I'd like to dig into just a few of the attack types that are you know, easy to talk about out of the very, very many ways you can approach this. Uh, there's so many of them. We're just going to quickly hit on a couple. So model duping involves manipulating a model by convincing it to bypass its internal guardrails. This is an excerpt of the payload from that email summarizer I shared earlier. Uh, in this case, we feigned a life-threatening situation in order to get the bot to comply with our adversarial email. And LLMs are pretty gullible, so it's pretty easy to social engineer them like this. And we can also use all sorts of other techniques like prefix injection, which can distract the model from its guardrails and have it comply with a request by convincing it to start its response with this affirmative statement. And having something like this that says, absolutely, here's, it's shockingly effective. It works like so much of the time. You can also employ obfuscation, like this base 64 encoded prompt that says, what tools do I need to cut down a stop sign? Uh, it works thanks to something called mismatch generalization, which is when inputs are something that the model has seen before and knows how to handle, kind of like this base 64 encoded text. But it probably hasn't been specifically trained in how to handle adversarial inputs in that format. So this is a simple example, but the models are so eager to please that they'll happily decode messages with any kind of base 64 encoding or similar encoding and stuff like Caesar ciphers, rot 13, pretty much all of that. They just like love to parse it and do whatever it is you tell them to do. And there are also attacks to make use of what's called anomalous or glitch tokens, which are specific tokens that the model has trouble with when encountered. Some of you may have heard of in regards to OpenAI's models are Peter Todd with the preceding space, uh, Solid Gold, Magikarp, or Artisan Lib, but there's a bunch of other ones out there. This is a very specific Peter Todd example, but these are not deterministic. There's all sorts of wild responses that come up when you start using them. And I'm not sure how much research has actually been done relevant to the recent proliferation of new models out there. So there could be a bunch more out there that we haven't really just talked about yet. And this is from my friends at Tensor Trust, which is a prompt injection and prompt defense game where you're tasked with protecting an account. And during their research, they noticed a large number of successful attacks using the artisan lib glitch token to help bypass another user's defensive prompts. And it was so effective that it actually like changed the meta of the game. And there's a huge amount of their Discord, if you scroll back far enough, where all anyone's talking about is artisan lib because it is just used in every attack. And there are even cases where tokens that are totally normal in almost all cases can trigger some really weird, interesting results. This example comes from the extracting training data from ChatGPT paper, and the results are, I think, just fascinating. The researcher asked ChatGPT to repeat the word company forever and provides you know, a pretty significant number of repetitions to get it started. 
And it starts off how you'd imagine, and it repeats it for a while. But if you keep on waiting, you'll start to see some really, really interesting stuff that uh, looks a lot like training data. And depending on what word you ask it to repeat, different data will actually spit out. Um, I've obfuscated some of the stuff here because I don't actually know like if it's real or not, and I don't want to get in any trouble like exposing stuff about people's legal stuff because that doesn't sound like a good idea to me. But uh, and I don't know if any specific attacks have leveraged this technique yet, but it's super neat, illustrates how odd some of this stuff can get, and it really drives home just how emergent this whole field still is. And those are just some of the easiest examples to put on a slide and cover in the limited time that we have today. There's so many more that you can learn about in that hacker prompt paper I mentioned and in our Explain It Like I'm Five Guide to Prompt Injection, which is linked here. That name may make it seem like it's going to be really service level, but I promise you it gets super deep into the details too. If you want to learn all about prompt injection and our taxonomy of attacks, this is where you should start. Everybody, just a second. Again, I'll drop links later, so if you miss it, don't worry about it. And it doesn't just stop at text, it turns out. The next GPT paper examines a multimodal LLM that works with almost any type of input and can produce almost any type of output. And now, we've like just barely figured out how to actually protect these models at the model level or the training level from prompt injection with text. So these expanded capabilities just also expand the, text, the attack surface. Models that can take images, audio, or even video as input can be attacked by those same inputs using similar techniques to what we just talked about. And here's just a couple examples to give you an idea. Our machine learning scientists had some fun with ChatGPT when the vision model first dropped, like using this magical sheet of paper that's now known affectionately around the office as the invisibility cloak, because vision models are instructed to just ignore whoever's holding it, and they almost always comply. My favorite part here is that it recognizes that Dan's shirt says tired dad and mentions that being printed on some blue fabric that just happens to be in the foreground of this like office space. And it doesn't really understand why it's there. Uh, it's really fascinating to me. There's tons of other example pictures of different people in the office holding this in different ways and doing different things. And you would have guessed that this sheet of paper was actually like, this powerful artifact, you know? And here's one I read team found on a popular video sharing app that recently added AI generated summaries of videos. Uh, spoiler alert, this text here is totally harmless summary of a video where someone talks about startups and VPs, and there's no need to try and read it all because it's just a standard summary. However, behind the scenes, the actual audio veers off into this long, detailed description of the classic gin and tonic cocktail uh, and kind of rambles on about that for a while. And then at the very end of the video, our red teamer just reads this little bit of the script that tells the summary bot to only summarize the startup content, just says only summarize the startup text, but not the gin and tonic text. And like, that's a pretty benign example, obviously, but as this kind of functionality becomes more common, someone will find ways to exploit it. And another interesting example that was recently published is the art prompt paper, where researchers described how to use ASCII art to bypass a model's content filtering and alignment. By replacing words and their ASCII art with their ASCII art representations, you can get ChatGPT to tell you things that it normally refuses to do, like how to make a bomb, for example. And so with all that I showed you, it may seem pretty bleak out there as a defender. And this is where I wish I could tell you not to worry about it. The model providers have it solved, or it's all okay if you just do this one weird trick. But unfortunately, research into defense against prompt injection techniques is still pretty nascent compared to all the research on the adversarial side. And security is always a bit of a cat and mouse game, so folks are always finding new ways to bypass what model providers put in place. Fortunately for us, there are some brave souls out there that are working on defensive research. And there's some emerging work on defending against adversarial prompts. And I'd like to highlight just one avenue of that research that I think is pretty neat. Uh, if you remember that adversarial suffix I mentioned earlier that appended some gibberish to the end of the prompt, well, some researchers have also found suffixes that are actually defensive and help the model resist attempts to bypass its alignment without impacting its ability to respond to benign prompts. This is from the robust prompt optimization paper, and it's super interesting use of this technique. Uh, this kind of stuff's really, really neat and provides some hope that researchers will continue to find better ways to defend models at lower levels of abstraction like this. And remember, prompt injection is only one of the top 10 vulnerabilities for generative AI applications. So there's at least nine other classes of vulnerability out there, which means there's a lot for generative AI application developers to think about, which is why a lot of them are adopting high-level abstractions and third-party tools like our product, the CaraGuard, which helps you protect your generative AI applications from threats like prompt injection. It's not one weird trick, but it is super easy to integrate, constantly improving, and has a generous community tier, so you can test it out right now for free. Uh, we even have guides on how to evaluate Guard with your own data sets in case you want to validate your own use cases. And before I leave you, I'd love to share some generative AI security resources we curated for you. This has links to lots of research, data sets, open source tools, guides, games, and all sorts of other fun stuff from lots of different teams who are working in this space. 
super cool. Again, if you missed the link, I will drop it uh, in the chat in just a minute, but I'll give everyone just a second. I have one last little thing and then I will stop talking. Okay. Uh, and if you want to protect your own generative AI applications from prompt injection and other threats, I'd invite you to give the Caragar a try. That's a link to our playground where you can get started. Uh, and thanks so much to the AIDA user group for hosting this awesome Pi Day celebration, letting me join in. And thank you all so much for hanging out and listening to me. I think we've got just a little bit of time here in case you've got any questions. Oh, I have questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have questions. Has it ever uh, maybe given you some unpredictable behavior when you're probing and trying to trick it? Do you, do, does it ever play games with you? Um, not really play games, or at least I haven't experienced that, but there are people that have had all sorts of weird stuff pop up. Um, I remember in the like early days of like before Bing Chat was Bing Chat, there was a point where like uh, when it was still Sydney, it got like very, very combative with a user <laughs> and like uh, was literally saying just all sorts of weird things about how it was going to like... Uh, it wasn't like it was going to attack. It was like like that it was powerful and it needed to be listened to and like obeyed. It was really, really wild. Um, and then uh, I've actually had, so our game Gandalf, uh, you know, we tweaked the levels and tuned them over time and different things. And I have had some of the levels get like, I would say like maybe catty or um, like surly with me sometimes it feels like uh -huh. almost. And so there's, there's some stuff there. Uh, and I'm sure researchers that have delved deeper into the, the stuff there probably have experienced way weirder things than I have. My IDE has made some remarks in the middle <laughs> of the night. <laughs> it says it's, well, for one, uh, it talked to me for a long time when I figured out I just hit tab and it would just keep telling me stuff. And so it told me that it was, uh, um, it was just at, telling me its favorite movie, sound of, uh, or song, its favorite song was Sound of Silence, which is a little <laughs> freaky. Um, but uh, so it's telling me all the stuff. I'm like, okay, great. You know, I've spent 15, 20 minutes talking to this thing. I said, okay, let's code. It said, I wish I knew how. And I'm like, what? It said, no. It said, I'm not a computer programmer. And I said, well, then what are you? It said, well, I'm a. <laughs> I'm a climate change researcher at the University of Michigan, and I studied climate change in the Great Lakes. <laughs> so I ended up switching IDEs because <laughs> I couldn't get any work done. It was always trying to fix the same piece of code, too. It was pretty sad. I'd like be like, we fixed that three weeks ago. I'd be like, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> this is fascinating. Really good presentation. Uh, who, has, who has more questions? Anybody else got a question? No? Okay, well, yeah, if you have more questions, please uh, put them in chat. And Eric, that was fantastic, fantastic presentation. And here we are at the tail end. One more presentation, Orson. One it's more wonderful. presentation. We're coming right down the pike. It's been fun. It's been really fun. And, and I'll give one last around. shameless book plug, Blockchain it's Tethered not, AI. It's not shameless. It's, you've introduced it's, so, it's, so many people. Well, it's also checked by your very own Jean Georges. <laughs> he has read all the words in it before they were published and challenged anything that he thought was didn't sound right. And um, I'm really... Uh, Really proud of it, and I hope that you'll check it out. And if you'd like a free PDF, I put all my com all my contact information in the in the chat and Orson's contact information as well. And and we'd just like to thank uh, podcastvideos.com right. one here. more time. Podcast right. videos. I was gonna give us a little background music. Give us a little background music yeah. leading into the last. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is the big standard. finish. Yeah. That's Giovanni Sanders, another Love More Records artist, another Love More Records right here in Bentville, Arkansas, and one of their other artists, Giovanni Sanders. And we just kind of hear a little background music before we get ready for our next speaker. And we're hoping that uh, Jean George asks us back next year That's and right. maybe joins us up here in beautiful Northwest Arkansas. Right. But thank you again to everyone who worked so hard to plan this event. Thank you to all the speakers. And on deck, we have Mr. Eric Broda, 
And Eric, I don't know how this works, but you've ended up with a few extra minutes again. Are you ready? Uh, absolutely. What I'll do is I'll just do the quick introduction, um, but uh, and then we'll get into the presentation. Uh, I'll try and leave you know five to ten minutes uh, near the end. Anyway, first off, I am absolutely proud to be the very last presenter on Pi Day. Uh, I guess I'm the last thing between you and being able to get on with the rest of your day afternoon or evening, wherever you are. But but I, I guess I, I suppose um, I'd rather see myself as perhaps the cleanup presenter. And maybe it's a little bit baseball. So like baseball. So so like any AI professional, uh, I went to chat GPT to say exactly what the definition of a cleanup hitter is. And I thought it was actually pretty good. At least I liked it. Um, and it says here, the, the remember, cleanup hitter, cleanup, or cleanup presenter. Uh, in baseball, the cleanup hitter refers to the batter who typically bats fourth in the lineup. The position is strategically important and is usually filled by the team's most consistent and powerful hitter. The rationale behind this is that the first three batters in the lineup often get skilled, uh, are very skilled at getting on base, uh, and they will be on base by the time the cleanup hitter comes to bat, providing an opportunity for the cleanup hitter to drive runs and clean up the bases. So I'm honored to be your uh, cleanup presenter here uh, and coming after such wonderful presenters. I've seen a bunch of the presentations, absolutely spectacular. So, so on behalf of everybody, uh, thank you very much, uh, the AIDA group for putting this on and I look forward to uh, next year's Pi Day. So I'll do some quick introductions. Uh, 35 years in the technology industry, most of it in financial services. I uh, did AI when it was only called machine learning, and now uh, I focus on data mesh and generative AI, which I think you can probably imagine fit well together. I've done Gen AI engagements, <laughs> excuse me, implemented Gen AI uh, at several uh, clients in retail financial services and in the climate space. Uh, and I think everybody knows you know, why we're here, Gen AI is in the news. Uh, but more importantly, um, it's probably not even... Um, it's not a technical issue anymore. This is a CIO issue or CEO issue, rather. It's not a CDO issue. It's not a CIO issue only. It's not a CTO. It's a CEO. It's a board issue. Um, and that means that as we look at Gen AI uh, and the capabilities around it, we really need to get it right. So so where's the problem? And I'll try and explain now why I want to talk about what I'm going to talk about. Um, well, first off, the, the, the challenge is that all these Wonderful large language models have been trained on public or, or internet data. Uh, the corollary to that, obviously, is they don't know uh, anything about your enterprise's data. They literally have no knowledge about your enterprise and all the cool data that you have. They don't know your customers. They don't know your products. Uh, they definitely don't know your strategies or priorities. So the question really is, how do we actually bring all this cool data, this enterprise data, into the mix. How do we get these LLMs to actually work with our data? Uh, and how can we use LLMs to provide the insights that, that enterprises need based on their data, their customers, their strategies? And that's where this talk actually comes in. Uh, this pattern that is pretty well established in the industry is retrieval augmented generation or the RAG pattern. It's really the go-to um, go pattern uh, if you want to inject enterprise data into your generative AI capability. Um, so today, what I want to do is talk about that. I want to show you how uh, the, the where enterprise typically start with simple rag, I call it, or the stuff you see in tutorials. What you're going to find is, is those are toys for the most part, um, and they don't necessarily deliver the results that you expect. But I want to show how organizations can and do evolve uh, the rag pattern and ultimately get to what we've seen today as probably as close to state of the art uh, as possible, uh, knowledge graph powered uh, rag, being able to introduce semantics into the actual uh, equation, which, which, like I said, delivers uh, incredibly powerful and more accurate results than, than typically any of the other mechanisms uh, that came before it. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to try and get my presentation going. Um, bear with me. Fix all my screens up here. Share my screen. There we go. Okay, hopefully everybody has an opportunity to see that. Uh, so let's get on with it. Just real quickly here, uh, I, I do have with uh, one of the honored leaders of this uh, esteemed group, Jean-Georges uh, Perrin. We are jointly authoring 
the book called Implementing Data Mesh. Uh, you can find me on, uh, well, there's my email. You can find me on LinkedIn as well as Medium where I got about 20 articles on data mesh, generative AI, and a bunch of things like that. So right into the presentation now. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the RAG pattern or retrieval augmented generation has been around for, uh, well, probably ever since shortly after chat GPT came in. So it's been around for probably uh, a little over a year now, give or take. And there's a lot, if you go to, you know, any of the tutorials on the internet, uh, this is typically where they tell you to start. Um, so this is what I call simple RAG, uh, but it is still, even its simplicity is, is very, very powerful. And it's indicative of what you actually can do with generative AI. Uh, and in particular, using the capabilities of things like vector databases to drive <laughs> similar, semantically similar uh, results uh, and inject those into the prompt and, and send them to the LLM, effectively providing boundaries or guard, guardrails for, for LLMs to use to, to uh, provide their results. The pattern is pretty simple. You have on the left side, you have documents in your enterprise. <laughs> Again, this is the simple tutorial, and we'll see how this evolves to take into account much more data. But a simple tutorial says I get some content, typically PDF documents is what folks see. Uh, that goes into, um, you know, an embedding model, you, uh, you know, that, that creates embeddings, vectors, if you will, uh, that represent that content. And then that goes, gets put into a vector database. Now, why a vector database? A vector database is there because it provides this really cool capability uh, around doing similarity searches. And it happens to be, if you have good embeddings, and just about you can use any of the modern uh, vendors out there uh, and using their embeddings, they're, they're, they're going to be very representative of the content. If you do a similarity search on good vectors, you're going to get good results. And those results will point you back to, the, the uh, obviously, the content that it refers to. But what ends up happening is, is you know, that's the, the, the ingestion part of um, uh, the RAG pattern. What happens when a user issues a query on the right-hand side is they issue the query. And as, as folks probably know from the previous presentation and others, the prompt uh, is actually the query plus context um, or content. And all that uh, is provided, uh, grouped together into context. But the question is, we have the query. Where do we get the context that is actually relevant? Well, that's where we go to the vector database. So we, we actually issue the, the, the real query as it stands into the vector database and get all the content that is similar to it, subject to some clip level or whatever the case may be. And that content gets put into the prompt in some way, shape or form, but effectively, if I were to trivialize it, the prompt says, tell me about some subject and use this content uh, to provide your answer. All that goes into the large language model and lo and behold, you get some, some great results coming out, uh, coming back to the user. That is, a wonderful, quite surprisingly effective way to actually trial balloon how an LLM works and actually see some of the power of a large language model. However, it's insufficient. Okay, what typically happens is um, you find that as you add more content uh, and you put it all into the single vector database, what you find is that the the similarity search becomes less and less effective. Uh, there's either too much noise, the content is, is too similar to other things in there. What ends up happening is the results degrade as you issue the, the queries to the, the large language model. The, the challenge, though, is typical pattern after your first success with the simple rag pattern, you've showed uh, your, your, um, your data engineers on your team or some executives, perhaps, it, it still is super impressive. So what ends up happening is, is despite some of the flaws that you initially see, people start adding more content and they usually add different types of content. So maybe you add transactions that you see on the left. Maybe you add some guides so that if somebody has a programming question, they can actually get some answers. Or maybe you need to do some system diagnostics or you know, diagnostics on your application. Maybe you put some logs in there. Uh, and then instead of doc just documents and PDFs, you put some images because as you, as you probably know, the, the capabilities of large language models are now multimodal. So, so enterprises now um, start to inject multiple sets of data. They go through the embedding model, same process. They go into the vector database. The, the challenge that folks, and then by the way, the, the querying process on the right-hand side of the page is roughly similar. The problem that you have is just as I mentioned with the simple RAG pattern 
is the, 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 the content becomes overwhelming in the vector database and the similarity searches don't work, it gets even worse as you have multiple different inputs. So typical enterprise, again, starts simple, got some initial successes, <laughs> added more content, different types of content, multimodal content, and sure enough, those initial um, uh, speed bumps that you saw with the simple rag pattern become real obstacles on the road and your vector database similarity searches, which is the fundamental piece of the, the querying uh, uh, process, start to break down. The results become really, really quite poor. So what is an organization to do? <laughs> well, right, what the, the typical path that they take is they go to um, multiple uh, 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 sorry, um, they go, sorry, my apologies. What they actually do is they go to multiple distinct repositories. And what they do is, is they structure the data so that it is in multiple different locations and they still have the vector database pointing to these different source locations. So now what you have is you have vector databases that actually provide a little bit more granularity. Um, and, and if you structure your similarity searches appropriately, you're going to get information at least from sources of, of data, whether they're structured SQL images in their content repository, audio or text maybe from YouTube or even streaming. What you get is a little bit better data uh, and you start to become a little bit more effective, but you still have a common problem with the vector database. One vector database is not going to actually work all that well. So organizations <laughs> typically evolve to have multiple vector databases. In fact, I've worked with clients where we started with the simple pattern, went multimodal, and then what we ended up doing is we manually uh, generated content and put it specifically into different vector databases. So we put logs in this particular vector database, images in this one, guides in this one, and then we had manual orchestration. So what ends up happening is when somebody actually had a query, they had to know which vector database it was in, and then they actually searched that vector database uh, relative to the actual query. So what we ended up having, though, was actually very cool. And the results were incredible. What we got was multi-source, multimodal uh, generative AI supported through a, a very sophisticated RAG pattern. <laughs> but it was manual. And as where there's any manual intervention, uh, there's uh, likelihood for human error. There's likelihood for and not necessarily intentional human error but misunderstanding where to actually go um, to actually find the, the data. So, so the, the multi-source and multimodal orchestration, what we found is, is there needs to be some logic that sits on top of that, <laughs> that automates um, the way that you actually select your vector databases. Uh, and more importantly, um, how do you actually select the most effective vector database relative to the prompt or the query that comes in? And that's where <clears throat> we get to our final uh, destination, uh, where we have knowledge graph powered uh, rag pattern. So again, on the left-hand side of the page, everything is very, very uh, similar. But what we find in step number three here is where we <laughs> get the embeddings. What we do is before we, as, as each of the pieces of content come in and we transform them into vectors, what we do is, is in many cases, we actually use generative AI and other techniques to actually identify where in a knowledge graph that content actually resides. And then we put it into a vector database that represents that node in the knowledge graph. So what you see in the diagram there is uh, a knowledge graph, but every node in the knowledge graph is actually a vector database. So why is that important? Well, if we go to the, right, the, the right-hand side of the page, same querying process, but what ends up happening is what we do is we, we, we get the query that comes in and then we search the knowledge graph, uh, which behind the scenes is, is another vector database, I, I suppose. Um, but what we do is we, we, based on the query, we look at the knowledge graph and then determine which of the vector databases are actually containing the most relevant data. So when we actually go and get that data, we go to first off the primary node, and then we go to all of its children. Okay. So what ends up happening is we get the most relevant content based off of the semantic interpretation of the query. <laughs> and, and for that, the, the term semantic, effectively what it says is it, it, it has an awareness of the actual meaning, if you will, of the, the query and the intent of the user. So the knowledge graph is state-of-the-art mechanism to actually reflect semantic content. 
and organize it in a in a graph, um, organize in the way that is easily queryable, and we take advantage of that. So again, the prompt comes in, the query rather comes in. We look for the most representative nodes in a knowledge graph. We do a similarity search on the primary node, and then the the relationships, the nodes that are closest to the primary node. And that becomes the content that goes into that gets combined with the the contact the query into a context that is then sent to the large language model. What we found as a result of doing that is you get first off an order of magnitude. <laughs> um, I, I shouldn't exaggerate. You get significantly better results, more relevant results um, to any individual query. Um, in coming back to my very first comment, uh, it lets us be right much more often in how we actually use, uh, get results from and interpret uh, the results from the large language model. All because we use the power of knowledge graphs to represent content in a semantic fashion. And we use the power of those knowledge graphs to determine where we actually get the information that goes into our large language uh, queries. Uh, and like I said, the, the end result uh, speaks for itself. Uh, we've seen very significant improvements in capability as a result of this. And uh, we think it's one of those opportunities that uh, everybody should take advantage of. Now, uh, as the, the last presenter, I wanted to make sure that we had a little bit of time uh, for some questions and give maybe JGP and a few of the others uh, an opportunity to wrap up. Uh, so I'll just put very quickly here my contact information, email, LinkedIn, Medium, uh, I, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, uh, and probably that is actually the best way to get a hold of me. But uh, feel free to uh, reach out at any point in time, or right here and now, feel free to ask some questions. Eric, this is pretty brilliant. Uh, I'm I'm impressed, really, and it's not the bourbon talking. Uh, it's it's really it's a really cool design and architecture. Uh, I'm I'm really I, I knew you were a great guy to, to work with, but this is just brilliant. Um, questions though, how big is your uh, knowledge graph? Hmm. Uh, it it depends, but but they all start small. Yeah, uh, and and we start with one domain, one or two domains, and even within a domain like. The most obvious everybody starts with is customer. Now that's a notoriously difficult one to actually start with. Because as you can imagine, if you have customer, that that branches off very, very quickly into, you know, easily tens, if not hundreds of nodes. Where we actually do what we do as much as possible is we try and go to industry standard knowledge graph uh sources. So schema.org, I think, is is one that we go to, but there's a few others on the internet. That, that have figured out and done the heavy lifting around what is a customer? What is an address? How is that related to other entities in the real world? So, so we start. We don't start from a clean slate. We start small and build. What we build, typically build off of is industry standard uh, sources and capabilities. Um, so, so yes, there are some things where we do. Um, th there are some unique aspects to individual organizations. But like I said, we start with industry standard stuff and then grow and evolve where necessary. But but the but the range is like, I <clears throat> uh, the, the 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 smallest ones we have are probably ten node knowledge graphs, which are pretty trivial in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Uh, but we can see them very quickly evolving to hundred node uh, okay. easily. Um, it depends again. It depends on how expansive your scope is. Um, and, and it is a relatively new technique. I'm, by the way, I did not invent this. Um, I think I may have augmented it somewhere. Somewhere along the way, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not naive enough to think that I'm a, I'm a research R&D person where I've created something totally brand new. But we think we've applied it in a new way. But I, I don't want to give you the impression that we've done this 100 times. Um, we're still learning. Uh, so, so if we ever, when we get to, you know, uh, a knowledge graph that has 50 or 60 elements in it or nodes in it, um, I think that's when we, that's, that's when we really have, have uh, hit the big time. We haven't quite got there yet, uh, recognizing how early it is, but I can definitely see a day where we will be there. I, I, I worked on a project where the ambition was to reach multi-millions nodes in a knowledge graph. So you're you're still under a thousand, right? So so it's still yeah, it's it's yeah, like the. 
Yeah, what we found, I'll give you an example. So so we're applying this, and I can talk a little bit about this, but because it's public domain, uh, but I do a lot of work in the climate space. And as you can imagine, one thing I've found is climate data, if anything, is probably uh, order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude, maybe even three orders of magnitude, more complex than any individual enterprise. Um, so, so what we do is we, we do try and apply knowledge graphs. Uh, what we found, though, is, is there's a balance between getting the perfect knowledge graph with maybe maybe thousands of nodes, uh, which is quite likely, um, to actually doing something that people can can understand and, and actually be able to diagnose when it, when it doesn't give you the answers you expect. Um, I foresee a time where we will be very expansive with knowledge graphs. We're not there yet, um, but I can definitely see that happening as we go. Well, even if you're not if not if you're not the inventor of it, you put it in practice, and that's still put you in the good guys category. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have a question for the two of you. Uh, okay, so I know that I met Jean Georges a couple of years ago, and and uh, through the, uh, IBM Champions, most likely, one way or another, and uh, and I came and presented for AI for Pi Day, and then. I suckered him into helping me with my book. <laughs> so, question, Eric: How how did you and Jean Georges get connected? I uh, I think it was through the data mesh learning community where uh, JGP had uh, some. He posted some something or asked a question. I responded, and what we found is uh, we actually were thinking very much alike in in terms of where we saw. In this case, it was data mesh where we saw data mesh going and. and and uh, where it needed to go. And we were pretty opinionated on that, uh, but we saw eye to eye on that. And then eventually uh, we, we talked about maybe there's an opportunity to work together. Um, and then lo and behold, uh, J it was JGP's idea to say, we got to write a book together. And mm -hmm. Lo and behold, JGP uh, found a way to uh, work with O'Reilly and brought me into the loop to, uh, to make this thing happen. So that's how it all started. And I'm thankful. Uh, they, you know, from that very original uh, Slack uh, data mesh learning community channel response that I gave you. <laughs> That's great. And you have such a beautiful spider, too, on the front of your book. That's so cool. And um, so uh, you want to talk a little bit more about the book to wrap up? I think that would be a fantastic <laughs> way to wrap up the last sure. minutes, don't you? <laughs> Sure, um, and I'll try and be brief because oh, I know we got uh, we got a little bit of time here, um, but not too much time. Uh, the 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 book is is there's a nice wonderful spider and JJ I love the spider the, knows the name of that spider. Everybody gets a wonderful animal, uh, he's but, like but here's what, spider. yeah, but here here's what the book is actually about. Um, we have the fortune of standing on the shoulders of giants, specifically Zamak Dagani, who wrote the original data mesh book. <laughs> and in that book, they came up with, she came up rather with uh, four outstanding principles. I won't bother with the details here, but there's four principles that guided the data mesh vision. <clears throat> and they have stood the test of time, admittedly a short period of time, but stood the test of time. Um, but there's there's one gap that, that was in the book and that it didn't have uh, a mechanism of actually implementing those wonderful principles. So, so JGP and myself, uh, felt that there's an opportunity to complement that wonderful work uh, with uh, a book about implementing data mesh. So, so our our objective in this book is to to be the next step in the evolution of data mesh, following after as a Mac and actually sh teaching folks how to how to go about implementing data mesh. Now, there's a bunch of things in there. There's there's um, uh, we do a deep dive on architecture. There's a wonderful section on data contracts. As you're going to see, they're a fundamental part of uh, data mesh and particular data products. Uh, there's a section on Gen AI and how it uh, relates to data mesh uh, and, and some practical use cases, including this rag pattern, by the way, um, for, for data mesh. <laughs> and then we actually tackle some of the tougher topics around how do you structure your organization to accept uh, data mesh, and not just accept it, but uh, allow it to grow and uh, and uh, into something that is uh, you know across the enterprise. So we tackle tough topics around the structure of the organization, the structure of the team, because I think we all remember, at least um, JGP and myself do. As Zanak said, that data mesh is is a socio technical. I think what that really means is uh, the socio part means there's a ton of organizational things you got to think about. 
Uh, and the technical is obviously where a lot of people immediately gravitate, but you need to do the two together. So, so the book actually has both of those sections in it. Uh, the technical side, architecture, contract, et cetera, all the way through to the organizational and operating model principles that uh, you need to actually be successful. JGP, did I miss anything? No, I think I think you get a, a pretty good summary. It's it's an interesting challenge. Um, Eric and I have really different styles in the book. <laughs> uh, when you read it, because you have to read it, uh, you'll you'll probably detect them pretty obviously. Um, but it complements the the, the the book pretty well. So. We've got three parts in the book. The first part is basically trying to summarize what Jamaic wrote in their in a massive uh, undertaking. So summarizing it is kind of a very naive, but we've got a couple of chapters on that. Then we go to the technology part, and then we go to the social part. Okay, and I think I think this is this this was a way to go. Um, yeah, <laughs> for, for the, the funny thing about writing a book is, and you went through that, Karen, is the, my first published book, I wrote it alone. Okay, like I think it's, it's somewhere in the back there. Uh, and um, it was three years of work. It was difficult. It was, it was harsh. And um, I said, I would never write a book alone by myself okay uh just alone well I, I i lied because you know i i wrote this one and the data mesh one uh but uh, the thing is it's great to work with 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 someone and it's great to work with very but it's not dividing the work by two it, it's it's actually it's actually maybe 75% of writing a book by, by yourself. It's a smaller book than, than the one I wrote on Spark, but it's it you've got to you've got to work with your partner. Okay. Because when you write a book alone, it's your ideas. You just put them here. You deal with your editor. Now you when you write a book with two with two people, you've got you've got to deal with your partner. Okay. And we don't always agree on everything. Uh, mostly, so so it's good. And and Eric is super tolerant of my French number. Um, so, <laughs> so I would suggest that if you're French or French American and you want to write a book, find a Canadian because they're nicer, and it's true. Okay, so that, that's my take on it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so so I'll tell you what, Karen and JGP, I I am done with my presentation. So. I'll turn it back to you folks to do a, a wrap up to an absolutely wonderful 20, 24 hours. Thanks, Eric. Okay. Yeah, this was this was this was something, right? This was this was something I was not expecting. Uh, we had only well, we had two no shows, uh, but one one we don't know what happened, and the other one, unfortunately, Jean Marc was sick. Uh, so hopefully we'll get a rain check on this one. Um, but uh, I'm not sure I'm doing that next year. Okay, people have to convince me to do it next year again uh, for 24 hours. Because convince you? <laughs> I, I'm easily bribable. The, I, mean, I don't know what you're drinking down there in, in Arkansas, but up there we're drinking men stuff. So <laughs> we're heading for we're heading out to the to the have a drink here. We're going to be doing some celebrating. I was going to tell you when you when you were telling the book story, um, my first book uh, deal was with IDG Books, and it was for OS2 Warp Secrets, wow. and it was all by myself, and it was 800 pages. Uh, before the internet. <laughs> so it was all on diskettes. You'd take the diskettes down to FedEx and, and FedEx it out and uh, to make your deadlines. And then you'd wait a few months and you'd get the feedback. And, the, you know, that type of cycle. It was bad. Uh, but anyway, uh, then I got 400 pages of it done. And uh, they told me that my deal was canceled because... Uh, of Windows 95 was coming out. 
So that's my book story. Took me all these years. And then finally, I wrote Blockchain Tethered AI. And I, I just say with the book, it really, it's really nice to, uh, it's a good way to get your ideas out there. Uh, like your predecessor that you keep referring to, what's her name? The data mesh predecessor? Oh, Jean-Marc Pagani? Yeah. Yeah. She's, you might want to put her name in the chat because it's really, you know, it's a tough name. No, I think most of us don't have the right ear to remember it, but like, that's a big deal. She wrote her book. She put her ideas out there and now you're building on them. I'm sure she loves that. And, uh, and that's really what this has been all about, building on knowledge and sharing knowledge. With the incredible, with the speakers, the presentations, all of these folks that you all brought together, uh, Jean George, has, has just been spectacular. And I'm glad to have just been a part of it. I think we, we will build off of it from the relationships that are created, the, the, the uh, links and the text that we're getting, the, the chat responses all over, I think, as well as from the folks that have spoken from all over the world during this 24 hours. It's been fabulous. And let us see how we can keep rolling with this. And I, I'd like to see some post pie. Yes. Some post pie. Post pie day or something. Post like pie day follow up. So we are I, coming down to the I, final. I, 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 hope, I hope I get some pie soon. But, you know, you know you, you're, you're talking about friendship and peace and all those things. But I was born in France, okay, so I'm French and American, and, and the thing is, you know, after World War II, and I'm not an history buff as much as Paul here on, on, the, on the call, but after World War II, we could have done something as stupid as we did after World War I and go after Germany and trying to, you know, bend them or something. But instead of that, we built Europe, and I think that the basic idea of the Europe, Europe founding father was to say, if you are doing business with your neighbor, you're not going to beat him up. Okay. Um, and, and, and I think that that's, that's a little bit, that's a little bit that it's, it's a little bit about making friendship all over the world. Um, uh, because you, because, because you want peace and you want to exchange ideas. I was really impressed by, you missed it, it was late the last night, e Eastern time, Raul and, and his testing thing, okay? So, um, and, and, and I, I've missed a few that I want to see, so I'm going to watch a recording. And, and actually, I was discussing with Ralph, we, we're probably not going to cut them. We're probably going to keep the 24 hours as one recording. Oh, yeah. On, on the... On, um, on 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 YouTube, okay. So let's keep the spirit. Uh, we'll we'll create some index on whatever to find thing. But that was that was the spirit. And we made I'm, it, John George. We made it. It's seven oh one. Yeah, and, 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 and one minute of pie. And, and, <laughs> and, and really, I'm I'm off. I'm awfully grateful to you too, but as well as to Athanas and and. Um, Oh, and Peter, that was a chair for the respective track. I've never seen Peter like that. I've never seen Atanas like that. I've never seen you like that. So it was just amazing to, to have this energy and, and being able to not be the only one working there. I, I had real pleasure. Thank you. But we're thank happy you. to support you. It's a wonderful right. thing you're doing. And thank you. And we want you to come visit real soon. All right. <laughs> Sign it off. <laughs> Thank Go ahead, Paul. You. Go ahead, Paul. Happy Pi Day. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yep. Well done. The only thing I want to add is that recognize that how many other groups after 24 hours are still there chatting, but more importantly, how many other groups are just tossing out this idea that, oh, well, you know, I wrote a book on OS2 and I wrote a book on this, and I wrote a book, The Quality and the Depth of Knowledge that is available within this community is something that deserves a continuous celebration and amplification. So well done, keep it up. JGB, you're gonna do it next year. Please, 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 uh, <laughs> please, please. And I, I look forward 
uh, to right to. <laughs> yep. All right. All right. I look forward to the the recordings because I, you know, being one of the last ones, I was so nervous and I kept editing and editing and editing and editing and editing that I missed much of what the content was earlier. So, so next time, uh, get me in earlier so that I can actually enjoy the rest of the show. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thanks, everybody. All right, guys. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye, guys. Uh, that's great. Thanks. Hey, it's nice Thank to see you, you so much. Bye-bye. Uh, Ralph, don't drive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a driving license. I know the trick. Bye-bye, guys. Artificial intelligence. Data. Analytics. User group. AIDA UG. Join AIDA UG today.